Chapter 1. To Battle Janine's ears perked at the sound of a howl. A wide grin spread across her lips. At last, storming out from her tent, the warlord was greeted with the orderly chaos of her pack assembling itself for war. The shamans were walking between snarling wolfkins, saying prayers. The technicians from the ranks of normies slapped the overly eager wolfkins behind their backs, making them stand still while they mounted power armor on their bodies. Her wolf hags howled in response to Alpha's howl, demanding the members of their packs to assemble at once, and the same picture was repeated everywhere in the siege camp. War. The wolf tribe was called to the war. Janine walked to the center of her camp, ignoring the bared throats of her wolfkins. She spread her arms wide, and three males, her own sons and the pride and joy of her litters, rushed to encase her in the power armor. Marco was her youngest, still a cub of three years old. She picked him from the pits as her adjutant after a girl nearly choked him to death. Seeing his thin black form, with ribs pushing against his fur coat, she felt a tingle of pity. Out of his litter, he was the only cub who has survived to this day. Two beautiful girls were stillborn. One more died from a claw hitting her in the eye during a struggle to get to the food in the pits, and another male had his neck snapped. Bad litter, weak one, and it's all Janine's fault. Her soulmate has asked her repeatedly to relax and rest, but she has soldiered on, marching from battle to battle, eager to prove her recent appointment to the rank of a warlord. Gruesome wounds on Marco's body had long since healed, leaving just scarred flesh with no fur on his neck, around his shoulders, and on his knees. Janine knew his knees would sometimes hurt. The boy was too close to being named a crippled for her like her she slightly bent her legs, a slight gesture of mercy for her cub. The two others looked like twins. Black hides with spotted brown marks, long regal snouts, and muscles dancing beneath the hides. Both bear their share of scars, but where Bogdan was a good-natured boy whose soulmate had already given life to two whole litters of four surviving cubs total. Ignacy worried Janine. Her sons lifted the heavy plates of the power armor. Piece by piece, they brought them to her oversized body, connecting cables of the protective armor with the implant sockets across her body. She breathed out slightly, feeling how Marco made a misstep and connected one cable too slowly, resulting in a jolt of pain spreading from her knee. Janine only smiled to him, allowing the boy to keep going. These armor plates were too heavy for him yet, but she'll never give him up to be a crippled. Her fault, her responsibility. After the plates came sleeves, much heavier parts of the power armor that protected her limbs. All three of her sons lifted each piece, locking it on her arms and legs, and the warlord smiled, feeling the fiber muscles move in tandem with her own, empowering her even further. An energy generator on her back came to life at her command activating the power armor systems. The energy shields were activated just fine, Agnesi whispered happily. Warlord, the technicians have shown me how to calibrate our shields properly and adjust energy flows. These magnificent tools can absorb even Moab's explosion. This wasn't your duty. She turned to him in a burst of movement, pressing a claw against his lower jaw. The siege camp looked wildly different. The positions of the wolf tribe were made in a seemingly chaotic order. Tents were placed based on the ground each warlord claimed for herself. A thin circle of minefields surrounding their position and regular soldiers of the state behind them. There weren't any kitchens or medic tents. Wolfkins were fed in the crawler and will now endure the rest of the siege without new nourishment or medical aid. Their cousins, the Ice Fang Order, looked utterly different. Their camp was assembled in an orderly fashion with uh, elite soldiers guarding the outer perimeter. Flags upon flags, marking the location of each sword saint, proudly flew on the harsh wind, while the knights themselves were busy digging trenches, preparing in vain for a positional warfare. Like always, first had offered to share food and medicine with his kin, and like always, his off- The regulars were busy digging ground in the wolf tribe camp, placing energy generators to shield the camp from any shelling. Janine assigned some wolfkins to help with this noble task, but Ignacy sure as Abyss wasn't assigned to it. The scout told me we are finished searching through the eastern lands. Ignacy strained his neck, trying to evade the pushing claw that threatened to slice his neck without retreating. 
Techno Queen has laid her lands bare. There is nothing to devour for the locals. So, with free time on my paws, you decide to meddle with technology rather than looking for a soulmate. Janine sighed. The boy spoke the truce. Ravager had to assign several warlords and sword saints just to provide food for the locals after their leader tried to starve out the invaders by taking away everything eatable. Nisi, the shamans made their will clear. You speak truth, warlord. Bogdan bared his neck for speaking out of turn. In times of need, each tribe member must seek a way to make herself or himself useful. Ravager's own words spurred Ignacy into action, inspiring us all with his noble example. Um, Janine struck Bogdan lovingly against the cheek for the insolence. More as an encouraging pat than a hit meant to leave a uh, bruise. In truth, she didn't feel anger toward Ignacy for failing to produce an offspring. The boy was good-looking and healthy. Several warriors fawned all over him, showing their claws to try to attract him for mating. Even if Ignacy chooses to stay single, she'll disapprove, of course, but will support his decision. No, it was his insistent meddling with forbidden matters that was bothering the warlord. Janine remembered, oh, how she remembered her firstborn, and his desperate yelping when all his trust in mechanical devices had finally failed him and left him for death. Her pa clenched. She'll speak with Ignacy one day. Her son stepped away, dropping to one knee, and she lightly bit their necks, both in admonishment for Marco's failure and for their boldness in speaking out of turn. Bowing in thanks, they jumped to the other males to suit up before the battle, leaving only Marco at her side. Sorry, the little one whispered, touching the wound on his neck. Janine wanted to grab him, press Marco against her chest plate, and promise him that everything would be all right, to hug and care for him, and protect him from everything and everyone. But this wasn't meant to be. In the wolf tribe, the males are subservient to the females. Should anyone see her cuddling Marco, his life would turn into the abyss. Be better next time, Janine said calmly, straightening up and scratching him behind the air. Warlord, wolf hag Anissa bared her neck, coming closer and carrying her axe, rifle and helmet on her paws. Her daughter had already geared up for battle, with her shard gun locked to her back. Anissa's helmet was open, showing an eye patch over her right eye, a result of a scuffle between her and another girl in the pits. A network of scars covered the woman's entire scalp, disappearing beneath the gorget. Standing on one knee, the wolf hag presented Janine with the weapon. You failed. Janine swung her teller in the air, sending a wind wave across her camp. Nodding in thanks, she accepted the high-powered laser rifle next. Yes, Mother Anissa scratched Marcos behind his ear before reaching into a pocket and placing a medical patch over the bite mark. Janine's growl made her daughter bare her neck in submission. Like her mother, Anissa's sole remaining eye burned with yellow light, a sign of Ravager's favor. Unfortunately, the girl wasn't strong enough to one day usurp Janine's position. The shamans checked Anissa and confirmed that she was nearing her prime. Where Janine's arms looked like tree trunks, Anissa's own limbs were much more slender and thick. Not having time for a proper punishment, Janine simply smacked her daughter across the forehead with two fingers, sending Anissa's head back and leaving a bloody bruise. Tough. Easily tougher and stronger than any other wolf hags in Janine's pack, but also reckless. She warned Anissa not to be cordial with her brothers in front of everyone, not unless she can protect them at all times. Marco has enough problems as it is. Why can't you be more like your sister? Janine wondered, stomping the butt of her axe into the ground with enough force to create a crevice. Impatient one came closer, the only one of her daughters so far to become a shaman. Every single inch of her power armor got covered in words of prayer scratched onto the surfaces by the shaman's claws. Bone talismans hung loosely from the shoulders, and the prayer book was sealed with bronze chains around her waist. Taws and Nyssa, impatient one's snout, was somewhat shorter but far sturdier. The last time the two fought, the shaman choked her younger sister into submission, but Anissa too nearly tore one of her sister's breasts in their brutal struggle. For this reason, Janine pushed the stubborn girl toward the shaman path, a logical end for someone incapable of being a warlord. The girl had potential, and Janine would be damned if she let her stay a simple wolf hag. Unfortunately, 
Anissa has been failing recently, earning scars but failing to prove her devotion. Bowing her neck, Janine allowed impatient one to paint a ritual mask on her face with the insectoid blood. Shamans were the spiritual and civil rulers of the tribe, the ones who maintained the traditions and interpreted the will of the Blessed Mother. In Janine's youth, the state was still in its infancy, weak and frail. Shamans had to ensure some strict rationing, which led to some crippled and cubs dying, but the tribe endured and grew stronger out of it. Blessed be, impatient, one intoned, bowing to Janine before looking at Marco. The warlord could have sworn that she saw the corner of her lips move up as she blessed the little one, patting him on the shoulder before moving on. They'll spoil him. Janine contemplated, putting on her heavy helmet and seeing how her lenses turned crimson, a HUD projected itself on her retinas, notifying the warlord about the health and numbers of her pack, along with a system that linked the cameras of all armor in the camp, allowing the warlord to see through the lenses of other soldiers. The preparation was finished, nearly 600 black forms were assembled before Janine. Ideally, each warlord had at least two paws, made of five wolf hags each, under her command. Each wolf hag had her own two paws made of scouts, and each scout had her own two paws made of warriors and males. But the war and heavy losses took their toll on Janine's pack, leaving her short on soldiers. They left friends and relatives in the wake of each conquest and each battle, slowly bleeding out. This was the price of a better world. Raising her axe, Janine turned and marched her soldiers toward the city, following a single, towering figure of the Blessed Mother. For once, the Wolfkins fell in line, feeling the almost divine presence of the one who gave birth to the entire tribe, the progenitor, the first and only to reach the unimaginable heights of might. Even knowing the full truth of their creation, Janine could not help but feel something stirring in her soul at Ravager's passing. Ravager's fur was so dark that even daylight struggled to leave its embrace, and during the night, she looked like the void carrying twin brightest stars of yellow colors for eyes. The Blessed Mother carried no weapons or armor, no talismans or communication devices. The two strongest members of the Wolf Tribe and their relatives, the Ice Fang Order, Warlord Alpha and Sword Saint Fur Sunblade, joined her as she stood on all fours. Their white furred cousins looked like the spitting image of the Wolf Tribe's Wolfkins, with the same long snouts, the same thick fur coat that covered their bodies, only their fur was white. And where the wolf tribe grew stronger in combat, their cousins had to train long and hard to reach their level of mastery. Males and females stood equal in the ice fang order, much to the wolf tribe's annoyance. The claws and fangs of their blood kin were also of lesser quality, barely enough to render flesh and bone. They were a different, unwelcome mass that clung to the Blessed Mother like parasites. In peacetime, this led to bloodshed. In times of war, all were brothers and sisters in the field. This region was named Waste by the locals, and how apt the name was. Toxic sludge gathered in numerous crevices across the lands and spilled from miles-long steel pipes coming from the capital. During the day, the toxic waste would dry up, changing form to a toxic cloud that was spread across the lands by massive storm winds, clotting the surface and eradicating anything in their path. Normies, normal men and women working in the reclamation army, had to wear gas masks just to prevent their lungs from receiving a chemical burn. When the storm descended, people hid in their vehicles, avoiding the irradiated air that could easily do. Locals, from what Janine saw, were a miserable bunch, surviving in spite of all odds, rather than thriving. They grew food in underground caverns and farms, fighting nonstop against the invasion of insectoids, only to have most of their harvest taken by the Techno Queen. Their greatest dream was to be drafted into the capital's army and get a modicum of stability in their lives. Behind the capital's thick metal walls was another world altogether. The soldiers within were given hazmat gear and steel armor, protecting them from most dangers, as well as steel minions to protect them. Outside of the capital's walls, life was cheap. The villages and hamlets existed to feed the capital, not the other way around. Locals died from radiation became victims of ravaging insectoids or cannibalistic tribes of the malformed, choked on the toxic fumes coming from the pipes in the ground, or simply sacrificed themselves, begging their alien and cruel gods for delivery. 
When a village could not meet its tithe, it suffered decimation. When the villagers tried to run, the Techno Queen's steel minions would hunt them down. Janine no longer felt any surprise at the scope of the Techno Queen's operation. In the New World, some people were born with either enhanced physical abilities, the state called them new breeds, or with a special power, or all three. The Bitch Queen that governed these lands had the power of assembling complicated mechanical devices almost on instinct, knowing how to program the most complicated commands for her minions, making them fully automatic. The Dynas wanted this power for the state, or failing that, he wanted to end the reign of this power and restore these lands to humanity. And what the big boss wants, he gets. Commander Ravager and Commander Devourer were tasked with carrying out the reclamation effort. As usual, Ravager soon left the second army behind, forcing her third army to march straight at the enemy's capital. Commander, the frontal assault will result in catastrophic losses for our forces. First, the magnificent-looking Wolfkin in white and gold power armor bowed his head respectfully. The silent, male, Janine told him, coming closer. She dropped to her knees, baring her neck to the silent Ravager. How dare you speak to his excellency? Like that dirty wildling, Petruda Mountomp, a sword saint of the mountaintop household, stepped forward, stopped only by sword saint Camellia Wintersong. Feeling no rage or demand for submission from Ravager, Janine stood up, moving deliberately slowly. Casting a glance at the rival, she noticed her almost cub-like thin arms and legs, despite the white power armor that covered the Ice Fang's body. Protrudus paw gripped the shaft of a thin spear, and the sword saint looked at the warlord with barely held back disgust. Protrudus' power armor looked similar to that of her fellow sword saints, not oversized, full of smooth curves and features meant to throw off an incoming blow with a well-made, elegant dodge. Gold and yellow paint, signs of her household, adorned both her breastplate and her helmet. A long silken cape flowed from her shoulders, dirtying itself at the ground. I want to drop her. Janine's mouth watered at the thought of bringing honor to the tribe by pushing this arrogant, white-furred cousin face down. She wanted to face her. No, she needed to fight her. The sheer, utter wrongness between both tribes drove them to rage. So similar, yet so different. She saw it in the sword saint's face too. Bertruda hated her too. For the past few days, her knights have bothered Janine's warriors. Just like her, the sword saint was new to her role. Her mentor died in the past. Bertruda was a youngster too. She hasn't even reached 50 years old yet, and is yet to have her second cub. Each of them wanted to prove themselves at the expense of the other. But in the battle's wake, restraint was in order. And as a warlord, she must set an example. The male started it first. Janine took off her helmet, locking eyes with Bertruda. Alpha's howl was clear. The city is to fall before sunrise. Show respect to your superiors and stay quiet. Dearest kin, no one holds you in higher regard than I do. Bertruda smiled, bowing slightly, and spreading the side of her yellow cloak with an arm. And I believe you to be a rude, stinky barbarian who insults her allies when they are pointing out obvious flaws in our strategy. Takes one to know one. Janine replied, breaking eye contact. Hey, hey, what's the matter? Starting a rumble without us. Warlord Marty Shikaina shouted, coming from the camp, accompanied by Lacerated One and Dragona. Janine only smiled, grasping the paw of her best friend. She and Martishkina were born in the same month, attended the same pits, and bonded over the blood of all those who tried to steal their food. Assigned to the same pack, two of them rivaled desperately, leaving a whole tapestry of scars on each other's bodies, until one day they simply threw a bone and decided who would be reassigned. Janine lost, and in a few decades, both became warlords, keeping the relationships friendly between the two packs where Janine bulged with might and suffered from minor body disfiguration, leaving her legs slightly shorter than usual. Martishkina rightfully earned the lustful gaze of every male in the tribe. Her gleaming black fur, a long cape made from the wool of various predators hunted down by the warlord, twin orbs of bright, pure amber for eyes, and finally, a pair of heavily modified revolvers at her belt. Martishkina looked amazing and loved showing it. Dragona was calm and collected, so unlike most of the wolf tribe, Janine had never seen her dominating another member of her pack or raising her voice. 
Some wicked tongues even said that Dragonic couldn't feel anything. She was of the first generation, one of the few still living Wolfkins who saw how the dynast took the oath of fealty from Ravager. Six short knives adorned her legs, and a single laser rifle was locked behind her back. Lacerated one, the supreme shaman, was a being of horror unmatched even by Alpha. Dressed in archaic power armor, a bulky design from the first days of the Reclamation Army, the shaman bled all over her body. Streaks of crimson were running from underneath the joints of her power armor. Her lips were peeled away by her own claws, and fresh wounds on her head were kept open by the cruel claws. The toxic, acrid air caused the shaman no discomfort despite her naked wounds. Alpha nodded to her sisters, a figure nearly matching Ravager in height. Her white and rough skin created the impression that her features were cut off from the stone rather than being a result of her birth. Alpha's arms and legs ended up with the longest claws in the entire tribe, each spanning a length from an elbow to a three-fingered paw. Even if she wanted to, Alpha could not physically retract her claws. There was no space in her arms to conceal these murder weapons. Everyone is in place. Blessed Mother. Alpha growled, showing two sets of dangerous fangs within her maw. One to grip and tear, and another to chew upon the unhappy fool who tried to stop her coming. Ravager breathed in, almost as if awakening from the slumber. She turned around, sniffing the air with force enough to make capes move toward her nose. She blinked once, covering the world in darkness, before basking at Namber once again and spoke. Where your worries are noted, Sword Saint first. The corners of her mouth twitched to mimic a smile. But bleeding for this state is our due. For too long the people here had suffered under the rule of the strong. For too long, justice had been denied to the weak. The Ice Fang are to keep rear guard. You are to follow us the moment we swarm the outer defenses. Blessed Mother, we meant no disrespect, and neither are we cowards. Bertruda fell to one knee, bowing her head in submission. I despise Barbarian Janine, but my heart will bleed should she or her warriors fall in vain. Please allow my troops to accompany the front forces. I am not your mother, Sword Saint. I am no one's mother. A hint of steel appeared in Ravager's voice. You must look after your own kind. Our duty is to pave the way for a better tomorrow. It will fall to the survivors like you to build a world worth living in. I bear none of you ill will, yet my decision is final. Ravager walked forward leaving her soldiers behind, and Janine howled, ordering her pack to get ready. She heard hundreds of paws stomping across the rocky ground assembling behind her, first nodded to her before leaving. Janine ignored the mail, earning a hateful look from Bertruda. This isn't over, the sword saint hissed, passing by her. Don't you dare die out there, barbarian. You owe me a dance after the victory. I am a bad dancer might accidentally crush you a leg or two. The warlord grabbed the passing woman by the shoulder, feeling the movement of metal beneath her cape. Even our endurance has limits. I'll be much obliged if you kept our wounded safe. Of course we will, barbarian. Bertruda broke free. Three two are mating or something. Mardishina joked coming closer. What? No. How could you even imply? More like preliminary caresses. Marty... Janine frowned before breaking into a smirk. Not that an ice girl could ever hope to endure my weight on her bones anyway. We'll see about that, Bershuda hissed into her face. You and me after the battle. No, this is not what you think it is, Warlord Mardishkina. I demand you drop the stupid grin. I didn't say a thing. The other warlord bowed, mirroring the sword saint movement with a cape. But my heart sings in joy for both of you. Bertruda groaned in a mix of pain and embarrassment and turned away with such speed that part of her cape whipped the laughing warlords against their snouts. She's way too easy to rile up. Dragana noticed. Tell me about that. A stomp on the ground ate the rest of Janine's words. Ravager had stopped 50 meters from the towering walls, basking in the lights of projectors that turned the guards on the wall into dark shapes. With a single stomp, the Blessed Mother has bulged the ground in with such force that two slabs of stone rose by her side. Ravager looked up, ignoring cannon after cannon that moved to aim at her. A body was strung before the gates, suspended with chains. The man's skin was torn off his body, leaving just gleaming meat 
and blood flowing down the gates made of bronze and steel, stylized after human eyes with eyelids made of steel. Several dozens of cameras on the main gates moved, looking almost gleefully at Ravager. We gave you an offer of peaceful reunification, Ravager said, loud enough to be heard all the way from the main gates. Her feminine voice bore neither hate nor rage, just the deep exhaustion of a person who was doing the same thing over and over again. Your leader spat in her faces and killed our envoy. She will be judged. But you don't have to suffer or die. Surrender now, cast down the weapons, and only the guilty will be punished. There is no glory in death. Live. For your friends and families to make the right choice. You have nothing to fear from us yet. Flashes of gunfire were all the response that she got. The defenders' figures became lit with crimson and yellow. Several hundred laser beams and numerous bullets were unleashed in unison. Their fury joined with the defensive installation that lobbed shell after shell into rabbit. Missiles flew up from the massive defensive towers behind the main wall, falling on the Blessed Mother. A mushroom of smoke and fire rose from the ground, throwing some defenders off their feet. The shockwave splashed the dead body against the city's wall, leaving not even a bloody smear. Every single bit of the envoy's remains evaporated in the dancing, flaming fury. Virginine calmly weathered the shockwaves against her snout. She ignored the hellish sounds of explosions booming from before the gates and put Marty Shkina's helmet on her head, allowing her fellow warlord to do the same with her. A single beam of darkness shot from the crawler. A massive super vehicle that served both as Ravager's mobile throne and mobile factory, a place to commit repairs on the broken power armor and resupply regular troops. The Wolfkins let out a cheer, seeing how ammunition in one tower exploded, creating a fiery blast above a section of the wall. Another shot followed immediately, piercing a hole through another turret and killing its operation. Warlord Zero has claimed the first blood on this night. The flames and explosions subsided, and with a fearful whisper, the defenders saw Ravager, standing still in the middle of a newly made crater, with streaks of molten metal entangled in her fur. A few drops of blood from her nose marked all the damage the defenders had achieved against the Blessed Mother. Ravager wiped her nose, licking her own blood. You have everything to fear from us now. Those who want to live drop your weapons. Those in search of a pointless death try to bar my passing. She roared. A single line of destruction passed from her toward the gates, created by the sound of her roar, bulging the metal in and setting off the minefield that encircled the capital. Savage dove low and the wolf tribe roared, charging forward in the maddening fury, each pack following their own warlord. Behind them, the crawler's main guns fired. Two heavy, armor-piercing shells hit the top of the wall, sending cartwheeling forms of the defenders down. And Ravage lunged forward, leaving a gaping hole in the place where the mighty gates once stood. The reclamation has begun. Only woe awaited any fool who tried to stop the reclaimers. Chapter 2 The Fall of the Techno Queen Part 1 Janine charged after a Ravager, adding her howl of rage to the howls of her sisters and brothers. Her short legs stomped across the stone ground, leaving torn footprints in her wake. While her pack followed her, the warlord reached for her laser rifle, picking up a target on a wall. The Wolfkins preferred to use shard guns, simple weapons for close to mid-range encounters that were capable of unleashing armor-piercing shards at the foe. At long range, however, the accuracy suffered, leading to scouts and some wolf hags using other ranged weapons. Janine's eyes found a trembling guard armed with a rocket launcher. She fired the overheated energy beam straight into the projectile, exploding it along with the unlucky guards and her fellows. Marty Sheena fired once, tearing a guard in two. The warlord laughed, spun her revolvers, and fired once more, killing not only the single guards but also the people behind them. Flame balls licked the side of the wall, exploding in a deadly bath made of searing plasma and evaporating those who failed to jump, along with detonating their ammunition. Stopping firing her plasma dischargers, Alpha crashed into the wall, creating a gap for her own forces. Virginine stormed through the main gates, smashing their remains aside with the Talateller. Her loyal axe made the air scream from pain, bisecting two guards who tried to stop her entrance. Bullets and energy beams from the defender's weapons hit the warlord's armor, failing to penetrate the meter-thick armor. Laughing like an evil spirit, 
Janine came upon the enemy combatants, cleaving a path through them. An explosion behind her made her stumble. A defensive tower fired its missiles at the gates, widening the gaps and killing several Wolfkins. Before the warlord could throw her axe at the tower, Ravager was already on it, uprooting the entire tower along with a small section of the wall. The commander raised the ruins over her head, ignoring pleas for mercy from the tower's operators. Janine saw Ravager's maddened eyes and understood immediately that the progenitor had gone too far again. The Blessed Mother went berserk. Any soul incurring her wrath would only meet a mindless and efficient demise. Ravager cast down the tower on the guards below, making the ground tremble, and moved across the wall, her claws striking out and collecting the lives of those before her. Gore and crimson soaked her fur, failing to change its color, allowing the progenitor to fight her own battles. Janine sliced another guard before her and kicked a woman off her feet, putting the sabaton on the guard's body. She gave her just a second to decide. In her panic, the guard fired her weapon in vain, and this was enough for the warlord. Janine popped her like overripe fruit and moved on, slashing and firing, her pack storming behind her. The capital city looked just as lifeless as the land on the other side of the wall. Whole toxic rivers flowed next to walkways. Janine saw how one guard fell there after being shot in the shoulder. The man shouted, thrashing like mad, and Ignacy stopped his advance extending a paw to the screaming man. Ignacy pulled out the man, only to find out that his gray hazmat suit had melted, leaving the leather and steel of his armor merged with the man's lower part. Impatient, one appeared next to Ignacy, slapping him hard enough to send him across the street before charging at the guards. The Wolfkins kept their advance, leaving the twitching and screaming man behind them. Whether he'll live or perish will depend on the medics following behind. For now, Janine was glad that her daughter restrained herself and did not use her claws on her brother. Like waves of a dark sea, the Wolfkin started spreading across the city, breaking through the makeshift barricades, refusing to give their foes even a second to fall back and reform their ranks. Led by scouts, Wolfkins climbed on top of gray buildings, ignoring the hiding civilians within, and painted the rooftops red with the blood of their foes. The Wolfkins did not advance in silence. Each of their movements was accompanied by the whine of servo motors and the scratching of steel edges against each other. The state's mass-produced power armor was anything but subtle. Accompanied by the wailing howls and barking sounds of their shard guns, the Wolf tribe produced a truly nightmarish cacophony for ears that teared hard at the enemy spirit. Janine's eyes narrowed at the sight of Bogdan sparing a screaming guard on the rooftop after a young cub below begged to spare her daddy. Her stupid son kicked the man down, probably breaking a leg of the guard but otherwise leaving him alive. After checking the situation, Janine calmed down a bit. The scout in charge of Ignacy's and Bogdan's got a bullet to her belly, leaving her injured back on the street. No wonder her pack is fooling around. But the fact that Ignacy spent the barest minimum of time to help the wounded scout and charge back into battle, accompanied by the remaining warriors and his brother, deserved praise. Flames erupted from the two streets to their west, announcing Ashbringer's advance. Through the cameras in her helmet, Deneen saw Alpha closing in on one fortress within the city. The Techno Queen had ruled through fear, and trying to send soldiers motivated by it against a horror like Alpha was most unwise. Whips of unseen terror struck in all directions from Alpha, making guards drop their weapons and fall down, whimpering helplessly. The strongest warlord simply crushed those few who had found courage in them to stand against her, believing them to be unworthy of sullying her claws. Ashbringer, cut on your fire. Dragona's voice said over the communication, and Janine switched channels, seeing the warlord standing calmly in the siege camp, overseeing the advance of all packs. There are civilians within buildings, and if you set aflame pipes with oil, there will be naught but dust. I am not that incompetent. Ashbringer snapped back. A searing burst from her flamethrowers left twelve scorched remains in her path. Ripping out the heads of the two soldiers with a backhanded swing, Janine felt cold. Ravager. The Blessed Mother stopped the decimation of the enemy forces on the wall and turned around looking calmly at the Ashbringer. She did not leap to attack, nor did she growl. All anger and madness simply washed away from the commander, who held a screaming figure of an enemy officer in a purple cape with one paw. 
and this calmness freaked out Janine more than any rage. I obey. Ashbringer quickly fell on one knee, baring her neck in submission and ignoring the enemy fire. Ravager turned her gaze to the screaming officer and stopped for a moment, noticing the surrounding forces around her. The Blessed Mother turned to the man, looking less than a cub compared to her size, in her paw. Her paw twitched, causing the man to choke on his own screams. Ravager's pupils dilated and returned to normal. Her breath switched between heavy and quick intakes of air, arresting her madness. Ravager raised the officer to her lips, leaving a marking of a prisoner before throwing him to the soldiers, accepting the surrender. Her calmness did not last for long. She leaped from this section of the wall, crossing the entire city with one gracious somersault. With the force of a bomb, Ravager landed on the opposite wall, partly crushing it under herself, and moved on snuffing out any life in her path by slashing, stomping, or simply gulping down foes fast enough that none had any time to even offer a surrender. The wolf tribe did not attack mindlessly. Each vector of their assault was meant to take out one of the enemy's most precious holdings, Following the strategy of tearing off the throat and suffocating made by Ravager meant to lessen losses from both sides with an overwhelmed show of force. With morale crumbling, enemy leaders dead, and armories secured, even the most fanatical opponents would struggle to find the heart to continue pointless resistance. Drajinak commanded their advance with casual ease, connecting with the scouts and wolf hags when she saw them advancing too fast, bringing them back in line with a simple word. Through connecting her vision with scouts, the warlord constantly updated enemies' positions, marking the most charismatic officers among the enemy to be eliminated. Her impersonal voice quenched the bloodthirst of the most eager packs, ensuring the security of surrendering foes. Her keen mind oversaw the suppression of fire from artillery and the crawler, limiting the casualties among the civilians. Under her leadership, the advancing front was never exposed, spreading equally to capture the valuable targets. Dragona calmly reigned in other warlords in battle, enjoying the full support of Ravager. Prior to the invasion, Dragena and a few soldiers from Alpha Pack, the ones whom Alpha groomed to be the tribe's superior infiltrators one day, prowled the countryside, capturing a few of the Techno Queen's officers. From them, the state learned about the general shape of the capital and the location of factories, underground bunkers, and defense installations. No matter the fear, the soldiers have failed to reveal the location of their lead. Dragoness spared the lives of those who cooperated and forbade any torture, assuring the commander that the Techno Queen distrusted her own officers. And Janine loved this element of uncertainty. She and her pack were tasked with capturing the looming tower to the west of the city. This tower handled communications, and there was little chance of the enemy's leader being there but the excitement of a possible glory moved the warlord like nothing else. The enemy leaders were always being taken down by either Ravager, Zero, or Alpha. What if she's the first to join their ranks? Janine, the queen killer, the ruler feller. She imagined Mardishkina felt the same, judging by how pushy she and her troops advanced on the armory. Their opponents were a scrawny lot. Dressed in gray hazmat suits and wearing a light exoskeleton beneath, these people were easy prey. In the narrow, choking streets of the capital, filled with suffocating smoke that clotted the skies, the primary danger from them was their surprisingly advanced weapons. Their armor-piercing projectiles cracked the power armor of the lesser ranks with several bursts. High-powered lasers were strong enough to melt their way down to the softer flesh beneath, and explosions were hard to avoid in this maze. Bogdan was sent ragdolling across the street after a guided missile landed on the ground next to him, killing one male and taking a warrior's leg. The guard who fired the projectile started to reload his weapon, and in this moment, the shaman jumped forward, using the side of a building as a springboard to leap down on the attackers, where Janine advanced methodically, cleaning off the streets assigned to her pack. Impatient one turned into a whirlwind of dashing violence. No shamans ever used any ranged weapons or blades. Their claws and fangs were everything they ever needed. And now her jaws caught the screaming man, biting him in two and hungrily devouring the remains while she sprinted around the guards, bisecting anyone around her and creating chaos and a road littered with dead across her erratic advance. Janine turned the worry of her son into strength 
cleaving a guard before her in two halves and propelling a gust of wind forward with enough force to knock several others down. Wolfkins around her howled, filling the air with songs of rage, and fired their own shard guns, leaving just bloody tatters in place of men and women who tried to oppose them. Ignacy helped Bogdan get back on his feet, and together, both male shot down guards who tried to fire into their sister's back. For enough, Janine commanded, stopping the shaman from butchering a guard who fell to her knees. Their foes were broken, and Dragonaut ordered Janine Pack to halt their advance. All around their advance, they started throwing the weapons down, allowing the wolfkins to push them back, where the ice boys would tie them up. Out of curiosity, Ignacy pulled a cowl from a guard's head, revealing a face covered in chemical burns with a shell-shocked expression in her wide eyes. The woman coughed, unable to handle the pollution in the city she lived in, prompting Anissa to pull back the cowl and give Ignacy a smack behind his head. They can't even live in their own city, Anissa spat on the ground. Technically they could before, S. Wolf Hag. Ignacy quickly corrected himself under Anissa's eye. According to what we know, just 21 years ago, people lived here normally with no need for gas masks. Then, the Techno Queen came to power, and the wasters truly lived up to their name. Life expectancy plummeted to oblivion. He pointed at the trembling guard, reading information off the woman's tag around her neck. Um, just take her, for example, in her early 20s but looks in her 40s, her hairline receding already, and she spills blood with each cough. If you ask me, in 10 years, this entire region would have had its population halved at least. Neared. Bogdan kicked his brother in the ass. Who cares what might have happened? Who cares about ancient history? We're here, so all will be okay. Rather than wasting your time on theorizing, embrace the practical. Wrapping one paw over his brother's shoulders, he pointed up at a warrior. Look at that beauty. It's such posture. A thick waist, gorgeous fur and lengthy white claws shine through this smog, almost accidentally unleashed. The girl clearly has hots for you, brother. Come on, go talk to her, and then make many little ones. Bogdan Anissa half groaned, half growled, commanding the troops to assemble the defensive positions. Does anything other than mating ever worry you? Of course. My cubs, my soul mate, my family. Then, if you want to keep seeing them, Get to your position before I gore you for the disobedience or before an enemy kills you. Impatient one landed next to her brothers and sisters, sending Anissa onto the ground with an elbow hit. Discipline. Maintain discipline, wolf hag. Males are too dumb to know what's best for them, but what is your excuse? Make them work. They can have fun after the battle is won. Leaving Anissa in charge of the pack, Janine stepped forward, looking at the looming tower. She spied the satellite arrays on its sides, along with cables going into the building, supplying it with energy. The whole thing was no less than 300 meters tall, give or take a few dozen meters. The surface around the tower was flat, with toxic waste flowing underneath gratings, creating the image of a moat filled with water. Dragana, why are we stopping our advance? Janet asked, putting the laser rifle behind her back and taking the axe in both arms. She could feel the streets trembling, albeit slightly, and not all of it came from explosions around the city. Releasing the claws on her feet, Janine gave a signal for her troops to get ready. Because this is an obvious trap, sister, Dragona replied calmly, sending an image of the city to Janine's HUD. Observe. We have nearly claimed it, yet we have yet to meet any steel servants or minions. And there is something else too. Ravage blessed mother, Lacerated one growled over communication. Ravager, undeterred, Dragina ignored the shaman's indignation. The supreme shaman and her troops were busy moving the civilians out of the city on the Blessed Mother's orders. She can feel it too. Notice the pattern of her movements. She both satiates her bloodlust on the walls and is looking for something. Uh, Janine had to admit that she was right, accompanied by the shaman's Ravager always charged toward the enemy leader's neck, leaving the warlords to gather stragglers in her wake. She did so in part to lessen the losses among enemy forces. Once engaged, anyone carrying a weapon became prey in the Blessed Mother's eyes. In considering that some new breeds had claws or blades for arms, Janine's former warlord, Terrific, once had her lung pierced while saving a cub from being eaten by Ravager. The commander 
knew the extent of her madness, so her current behavior felt weird to the packs. Why is she prolonging the slaughter? What are they missing? Part of the answer came upon her in moments. Figures broke free from within the toxic rivers, crashing through both stone and metal gratings. They resembled madly twitching insects. Their elongated bodies were held by three many jointed legs, six more limbs pointed in all directions from the top of their bodies, four limbs ended up with palm-sized needles, and two of the remaining limbs had crude manipulators. White lenses serving the robots for arms locked at the wolfkins, and with a clack sound, their backs opened, revealing two sets of metallic wings. Steel minions. The standing army of the Techno Queen, merciless hordes who decimated all her rivals. Janine met the first one of them, catching the metal bug on the butt of her axe and spearing it with it. The creature twitched, bleeding oil and broken gears. Its arms struck once across her armor, leaving scratches. Dangerous. The warlord broke through the remains with one swing of her axe, bringing its blade to the approaching horde and allowing it to drink full and deep. The steel minions did not differentiate between allies and foes. One of them opened the back of a surrendered guard before leaping on a nearby wolfkin. Bogdan had to block an incoming strike, saving one of his former foes. He exposed his neck to an attack by doing this, but his brother's calm shot saved his life. They work well together. Janine decided, advancing forward. The incoming swarm was met with well-timed shots, downing foes by the dozens before they could bring their full might on the wolfkins. A few robots who broke through the gunfire have carved a toll on the attack, matching males in strength. The bladed limbs of the steel minions got buried in the chest plates, finding their way to the hearts within with chirurgical accuracy. Each strike of these creatures aimed for efficiency. When unable to confirm a kill with the first attack, Steel minions aim for joints and rubber neck armor hidden behind thinner protection of gordits. Anissa and the warlord both caught on to the enemy's intention of thinning them out instantly. Janine took position five steps ahead of her pack, turning in a whirlwind of steel and restrained rage, smashing aside the swarm. Anissa ordered males to take position behind females, a potential heresy and most unorthodox tactic, but one Janine was in full agreement on. Warriors, scouts, and wolf hags in her pack had far greater chances of survival. Seeing how one of the steel minions stood right back up, Nyssa locked her weapon behind her back and lunged forward, slashing with her own claws. Impatient one came right after, and this brought a smile to Janine's lips. Seeing her two little girls fighting back to back with a ferocity that would have made even lacerated one proud. Oh, what a glorious future they have. Anissa easily beat aside claws aimed for her lenses, slicing through the legs of a steel minion with a low kick before finishing it with an elbow strike that bulged the small head all the way into a chest. Impatient one simply thrust with her paw, leaving a gaping hole in a steel minion who flew above them before biting the head of another, finally something worthy to kill. Roared Warlord ailed over communication. Through a shared video feed, Janine saw how Elite's troops also came under attack and the warlord swung her gigantic scythe, harvesting four machines with a single slash. Technically, these are just machines, warlord. You can destroy them, but they don't have any life to begin with, Agnesi said. Someone never met Artificer, I take it. Alpha spat, standing unbothered by any danger in a sea of steel minions and allowing her pack to freely shoot them off her. Janine, keep your males focused on the fight. Eagle laughed happily. They make me look... Hey, when a male is right, then he is right. Explosions rocketed ground before the pack of Warlord Igrate, sending hundreds of steel forms back. The Warlord herself, a horrible mess of claws coming through the opening in her mouth, came forward, catching a robot with her paw and crushing it. Uh, I love myself some good well-set ambush, especially when we turn it against the enemy. Keep on using grenade launchers, boys. If even a single one of these tinkin bugs gets to you, no booze tomorrow. Girls join the fun. Don't be shy. Your booze is also at stake, you know. Oh, so she is allowed the indiscriminate use of explosives and I am not allowed some flame. Kusak shit. Ashbringer snarled, melting a line of steel minions before herself with streams of fire. Hold your positions, sisters, Dragona's voice cut through the chatter. Eled Predig, the losses in your packs are unacceptably high. 
take an example from Igrate and Janine and keep the males at a safe distance. It is the male's sacred duty to sacrifice themselves for the tribe. Lacerated one, join the In times of need, Supreme One, we can win here without losing a soldier, Dragona replied dispassionately. Mardishkaina, you are way ahead. Pull back. We haven't yet met any steel serva. The ground exploded beneath Janine, sending the warlord back. Something big, easily bigger than a battle tank, was rising from the depths below the street, covered in toxic waste. Its crimson-colored body was a gruesome mix between bronze and steel. Standing on four mighty limbs the size of Janine's torso, the beast of steel lunged up, placing its hooves on the street. The warlord barely had after she landed before the giant head rammed her with mighty horns, casting Janine into the rose of her wolfkins. Twin lenses, each burning purple, locked on the warlord. And from stylized nostrils came a surge of overheated air that turned Janine's armor red with heat and led to a warrior on her left screaming as the woman simply cooked alive within her power armor. Feeling the stone beneath her melting, the warlord hit with both arms, sending nearby soldiers flying back. Burns won't kill them. In her youth as a scout, Janine once had her entire left leg engulfed in chemical flames with this. She walked it off just fine in a few months. But overheated air might rupture the lungs of her soldiers. And this was far more dangerous. Finally, she had a better look at her attacker. Back when she was a cub, her dad once showed her a colored book containing images of extinct animals and what stood now before her down to the muscles and a tail that crushed one house with a careless swing, was undeniably a bull. A steel bull made artistically and bigger than several houses. The brass skin covered every inch of its body, leaving just joints on the legs exposed, showing the workings of massive metal muscles moving among the gears the size of a human. From its steel lips came a thundering roar of such intensity that it smashed one steel minion against the ground, killed a guard, and left cracks in Janine's lenses. The steel bull moved forward, bringing its hoof to Janine. Sliding into the molten ground, the warlord reacted a second too late, and the mini-ton limb came down on her, pressing Janine into the stone ground. Tough. Janine groaned, noticing dents and cracks in her armor from the initial hit of its horns. The wolfkins opened fire, but their armor-piercing projectiles left only scratches against the steel skin. Aim at the joints. Anissa gave the command. The pack fired to no avail. A bubble of energy came to life, shielding the exposed areas. The bull's head moved, looking down on the insects that dared to challenge it. A piercing light got born in the beast's left eye, and upon seeing it, impatient one grabbed several soldiers, dragging them to the side. And Anissa stumbled. The attack came fast, a pure beam of light, leaving the beast's eye. Yet Anissa failed to notice Ignisi to her left, failed to see him in time because of her missing eye. The wolf hag reacted a moment too late, and this moment was all it needed for her brother to suffer. The beam ate away Ignisi's right arm, evaporating it all the way to the shoulder, moving past the boy and slicing through two warriors and a male standing behind him, killing them instantly. No. Janine felt rage boiling down inside her, Rage she last felt during her ranking match for a warlord's title. This tin can, it dared to make a crippled out of her boy. The world stopped. Janine felt her body go numb and felt the weight trying to crush her from above disappear. Reddish dots started filling her vision. Sister, she froze, hearing the voice of the dead woman. To her left, missed the frozen in time wolfkins. A figure moved. Tall as Janine, the newcomer had her head hanging to the left. A piece of bone pierced the broken neck, sticking out with dried blood and muscle. Lifeless amber eyes found Janine, and the corners of torn and ragged lips moved, showing way too many tiny fangs inside the mouth. Janine remembered her, remembered the dent she left on the woman's head, the dent that leaked out the brain matter even now. The woman had the visage of a starvation victim. Her body was unnaturally thin, with her ribcage threatening to tear its way free from the embrace of flesh. Her many jointed limbs, Far too long for a normal wolfkin beckoned Janine. Restraint. Warlord Terrific gurgled, and the world came back to life. Wolfkins were fighting against the robots, filling them with holes and dodging and coming slashes. And the ghost of Janine's former leader was nowhere to be seen. Janine gulped, banishing the fantasies. 
There was no terrific here. The honored warlord had been killed years ago because of Janine's idiotic mistake. She pushed the bull's hoof up, hearing her power armor screaming from effort. The bull above her shuddered. One of its eyes exploded, and a new roar came from its lips. The machine staggered back while fountains of oil poured from the broken eye, along with something thin. Janine used this moment to roll from under it, looking through the eyes of her soldiers. Bertruda and her troops were behind them. The sword saint had cast her very spear into the beast's eye. Seeing the bull's second eye come to life, shining with barely contained energy aimed at the ice fangs, the warlord jumped up, facing the incoming beam with a slice of her axe. The teleteller was not an ordinary axe. Forged in a bygone era, Janine never ever had to sharpen it. It never dented or broke. No matter what it faced, it only bounced when a material before it was too strong. And tonight, the steel servant was tested by the Talateller and was found wanting. Janine turned her armor into defensive mode, her helmet fully closed around the head, leaving no exposed space for the jaws. Her paws and legs got encased at once, and the armor vibrated, enduring the incoming energy as Janine blocked the beam meant for her rival. The armor system screamed, warning Janine that her armor was overheating rapidly. One after another, the internal cooling systems went offline, unable to handle the beam of energy that started cooking Janine's own skin. Still, she persevered, refusing to even allow a thought of defeat. Palateller cleaved its way through energy and crushed into the steel bull's eye with enough force to create a shockwave. Held by Janine's two arms, it shattered the eye socket and bulged the ruined weapon installed in it, deeper into the body with the sound of a train going off rails. The steel servant's body shook, trying to adapt to having its intricate machine work come crashing into each other. The gears came off the alignment, and pipes that carried oil exploded. With a wailing half-roar, half-whisper, the bull's front legs gave in, and Janine landed on its head. Mercilessly, she brought her weapon first on its forehead, crashing whatever process still left intact beneath the metal skin. Then she walked on, opening the bull's back with another cleave and allowing a torrent of flame to burst from the opening, engulfing her in a hellfire. Jumping off the ruined machine, she kicked it, sending it on the remaining steel minions and picked up Bertruda's spear, still pretty shiny, despite the oil covering it. Thanks, Bertruda. Janine waved the weapon above her and threw it to the sword saint who gracefully caught it. You ain't a total bitch, after all. I despise every single thing about you, came a screeching answer. What are our orders, Dragona? Janine asked overly cheerfully, stopping herself from checking on her. The pack relied on the warlord. No matter the situation, she had no right to give in to emotions or worry. A warlord always has to show that she has a plan or has a general idea of what to do. No one made Janine reach her rank, and now she had a duty to uphold it. Manter, fake bravery, all of this was part of an image. Activating her barely working lens, Janine saw how Marty came under attack by another steel servant, one that looked like an oversized scorpion. Its pincers failed to catch the warlord. A stream of acid from its sting melted three wolfkins alive before Martishkina took it apart with the shots of her powered revolvers. Ashbringer came from the chest of a gorilla-like robot before her like a living star, melting her way through the massive body while wreathed in a white flame. A flying steel servant came from inside the city diving into Dragon and the Crawler. The warlord looked at the approaching beast. Before the beast could reach her, a figure jumped in the air covering dozens of meters in a single leap. First Sunblade, the uncrowned leader of the Ice Fang Order, struck forward with his trusted plasma blade. His first thrust opened the steel head. The following cuts took away its wings, downing the foe before it could reach the siege camp. The coordination officers reported that the signal to the steel servants came from within the tower. Dragina replied, taking her paws off the knives. Janine, you are the closest to it. Capture or kill at your discretion. Yes. Janine rode and rushed forward, beating aside any steel minion trying to stand before her. Anissa, impatient one, and Anissa's scouts all joined her at her command. Truth be told, the wolf hag would be best suited to stay behind. She was the third strongest in the pack, but Janine remembered how emotionally compromised she got during the death of her firstborn, to the point of nearly ruining her mission. No doubt, 
Anissa too feels shame and anguish about allowing her brother to get injured. It'll pass. The boy was sturdy enough to endure this flesh wound, and in time they'll all have a laugh about this battle. But now she must pile task upon task on Anissa. Her daughter has to stay focused on the task. With no time to dwell on sadness or fear that her mother might not trust her anymore. Chapter 3 The Fall of the Techno Queen Part 2 Janine reached the massive steel gates leading inside the tower in under a minute. The tale teller gifted the steel a kiss, bending tons of steel within, and Janine pushed herself inside, greeted by the automatic fire of the defenders. It rained against her armor like pebbles, barely making the warlord even register the fifty guards assembled before her. She grabbed one, cursing at hearing the howling screams, and quickly clenched the fist, killing the woman. Damn it. Her armor was still hot. Restraint. Restraint. You moron, these people did nothing to your son. No torture. The Talateller cleaved through the heads of three other guards. The butt of her axe came down on the fourth before the shaman joined the fray. Her jaws opened, impatient one bit away at guard's head, taking the headless body and theatrically chewing on it, allowing rivers of crimson to fall on the terrified guards. Shaman? Janine sighed, stomping a foe before her into the ground. Her daughter's claws cut the soldiers who had pointed their rifles at her, and impatient one casually threw the severed heads into her mouth. Cannibalism is forbidden. The Blessed Mother is doing it. And if Ravager would jump into plasma again, would you follow her example, shaman? Maybe. Depends on if the Blessed Mother orders me to do it or not. I fucking hate you sometimes, Yennefer. Janine smirked weakly. She, too, had a taste for human flesh. In a sort of way, this was ingrained into her very psyche from the first days when she was first put in pits and had a taste of the other cubs back in her days. The fights would often stop with a cub dying. It was simply the nature of things. You ended a life. You ate it, allowing the deceased tribe member to live through you. These practices always horrified the ice boys and girls who kept their own cubs away from the tribe. Normies of the state and the dynast himself viewed eating deceased enemies as something abhorrent. Fools. It's not like the wolf tribe eats prisoners. Meat is always meat. But orders were orders no matter how stupid they were. If the big guy and the blessed mother wanted them to stop eating human flesh, they will stop eating human flesh. No more. Janine's blade stopped at the shaman's gorget, and impatient one allowed a corpse to fall from her claws hungrily looking at the remaining guards. The foes surrendered, less than thirty strong, after Anissa and her soldiers broke in. Janine said nothing to either of her daughters, coming directly to a man with the markings of an officer, deciding against grabbing him. Janine pushed her snout closer, enjoying the fear in his eyes at the sight of her fangs. Lead us to the Techno Queen, little man. Only if you promise to show show mercy to my troops. The guard replied, clanking his teeth in horror. Granted, on my word, if it is within my power, I will ensure the safety of your... The terrified guards escorted the wolfkins toward a massive industrial lift clearly meant to house a steel servant. Walking around corridors made of steel, Janine caught herself at the thought that even here, in the supposed palace of their enemy, the air felt acrid, slightly tearing at her throat. She saw laborers or servants, men and women, in white hazmat suits with steel collars around their necks. When asked, the guard explained that these were the engineers. Should any of them try to leave the tower, the device on their necks would go off, ensuring that none would share the secrets of this place. I'd tore my head off straight away, or would screw with production. Janine decided, sending a message to Dragona. Normies have teams meant for disarming the slave collars shouldn't be a problem. They kept on walking, and Janine noticed dozens of cameras spread across the place, looking like human eyes. Stepping inside the massive elevator, they were met with even more eye cameras. The guard officer pressed a button and the elevator moved up. Janine expected a trap. She expected the elevator to fall, to explode, or for poison and acid to come from the walls. She fully expected to be met with rows after rows of steel minions above and to have to cleave her way straight through them. But nothing of the sort has happened. The elevator carried them to the middle of the tower. 
Janine looked out of the open lift shaft, seeing hundreds of steel minions buzzing around on the other floors. She saw steel servants in a half-assembled state. Humans were busy crafting overcomplicated limbs and parts, even during the fall of their city. None of the workers here even dared to look at the wolfkins. They were too terrified of the robots observing their every step. Once the elevator arrived at the control floor, the terrified captain of the guard led them to another set of steel doors. There were no traps, no sudden ambush, and no attack. The doors opened, and the group stepped inside a chamber of steel inhaling pristine, recycled air. Their target was inside, sitting on the opposite side of a massive chamber. Her throne is one of simple steel, placed on a dais, with a series of softly humming databanks and servers located to her left and right. Steel tiles made in the shape of a rhombus covered the floor in an orderly manner. The ceiling's decorations comprised a golden disc and two brown half discs. The Techno Queen herself looked like a young woman dressed in a light exosuit to her neck with a purple cape coming from her shoulders. A golden crown with a red ruby in the center held her short brown hair in place while her mocking eyes looked at the intruders. My queen, the captain fell to his knees. I am sorry, but... Stop posturing, boars, the woman replied, looking over the wolfkins as if they were curious insects. You think you could have brought them here without my knowledge? If they are here, it is because I allowed it. Techno Queen Janin said, stepping forward and bringing the head of her axe against the floor, sending a tremor across the room in a silent threat. Your city has fallen. Your kingdom is in shambles. You have no choice but to surrender. Well, you sure got two out of three correct. The woman cut her off yawning. This place is a wreck, true. I have little use for its continuous existence. My queen? Boris raised his head. Yes, you heard it right, Boris. Have you looked outside? The woman pressed something on her throne and a video screen appeared behind her back, showing the toxic surroundings of the capital. Who in their right mind would have wanted to rule over shit with a side of shit? But you did this. The guards struggled to find words. My queen, you yourself unleashed the poison on our lands. Of course I did, you moron. The image on the screen behind the woman changed to show the ruined remains of the steel servants and a few more servants still engaged in battle with the warlords. With a smug smile, the techno queen looked at Janine. This, all of this place was nothing more than a testing facility for me to get a grip on my power. Instinctively, I know how to assemble even the most complex machinery, but what good is a talent or power is if you don't polish it? Am I right? She stood up. The designs that showed promises are being saved even now. The pathetic ones are being discarded. Not counting your freakish mommy, you and your ilk are some of the strongest abnormals in the known world. And here I am, creating with bootleg technology and subpar resources, machines that can make you sweat a little. And I've done all of this in under 20 years. Just imagine what I can make with proper funding and personnel. Any country will gladly take me in. How about it, Warlord Janine? I didn't say my name, Janine cut her off coldly. No, you did not, mutant. The woman, looking like a cub against the massive warlord, smiled carelessly. I own everything here, doggy. Man, woman, child, all are mine to spend as I see fit. So here is my offer. Face up against my latest invention. Should you win, I... You are not in the position to make demands. Janine gripped the talateller with both paws. Am I, though? Foolish doggy, haven't you been listening to a word I spoke? Haven't you been using your eyes even a tiny bit? The woman theatrically took a breath. Fine, I'll spell it out for you more and try to act funny and every person in my factories goes boom. You've seen steel minions on the way here, right? Well, guess what I have in the other factories and towers? Disobey me and they, along with steel, will be unleashed against your rabble claiming new lives. Oh, sure, they'll lose. I'm not delusional, but it will be a hollow victory. No. Dead soldiers, dead city. On the other hand, should you win, I'll gladly surrender. This techno queen raised a finger over a button on her throne. So, which one of the two choices do you prefer? There is a third possibility. I can kill you before your finger moves an inch. Janine warned her, and the techno queen only laughed back. You can certainly try, she said icily. This complex is fully automated. Go on, swing your axe. 
and find out how fast your reactions and speed are in comparison to the defensive mechanisms made by yours truly. Feel free to flip that coin, but I assure you, all it would bring to you is disappointment. The people die, your soldiers suffer. I'll stay alive, and you'll still dance under my tune. Janine pondered for a moment, buying time to allow her wounds to close. In truth, there wasn't much of a choice here. What good is land if there are no people? True, the reclamation army eradicated those who stayed in their path. But aside from their earliest days, when gruesome and unforgivable mistakes were made, they never committed any genocide, never eradicated any culture or nation fully. Cruel cultures like that of Aureus were made to tone down their violence, but otherwise were left alone. The Dynas made his will clear. All are to be integrated into the state and not wiped out. One nation, one world, countless cultures and people, and no threat of another extinction, such was the goal of the Reclamation Army. Thus, it was her duty to save the locals. Janine grimaced, faking anguish at her decision and feeding the ego of the Techno Queen. The Wolf Tribe's members were not a Regenerator-type new breed, at least not fully. Their strength lay in getting stronger with each battle against a new and stronger foe, until one day they reached their peak, like Janine had reached hers. As they grow in power, so too does their healing, allowing them to shrug off some injuries and recover stamina rapidly in mid-combat. Feeling the burns on her knees and legs dissolving, Janine grinned widely, opening her jaws slightly. Agreed. She barely had time to finish the sentence before an attack came from above. A golden disc fell from the ceiling, changing into a humanoid form the size of a warlord. Back-jointed legs kicked, sending Janine rolling across the surface to avoid a arms, ending up with straight blades struck at the warlord, aiming for her neck. She parried the hit, taking both blades on the shaft of Talateller. Immediately, the robotic foe struck with his leg, grasping the warlord around the knee, with force enough to dent her armor. The machine tried to jerk her to the side before Janine tried to headbutt it. The machine jumped back, using her knee as a springboard. It came back on her, making a fint with the right arm and striking with the left. Janine saw through this obvious ploy and sidestepped the incoming thrust, stepping on the blade and bringing the Talateller to the machine's left shoulder, shattering its pauldron, making the blade beneath her leg. No, it broke the blade. Janine jumped back, acting on instinct, and evaded two more blade arms that came from within the golden chest. The machine purposely twisted its own limb to break the blade and gain freedom, evading the full brunt of her might, all the while enduring the warlord's hit in order to make a trade with her. Not bad for a tin can, Janine said to the golden-colored robot. They came at each other, and Janine allowed herself to be on the defensive, examining the movements of her foe, Ignoring the sparks that flew in all directions each time Janine's axe came down on the blades, the machine was fast, easily keeping up with her. Its sturdiness was not up to par, and Janine could see the large marks left by her axe and gears working within. The constant hail of attacks reminded Janine of the amateurish swordsman from the Ice Fang Order. For fun, she and he came against each other, with Janine using a club and the Ice Boy wielding two swords. For the entire fight, he used nothing else but thrusts aiming to make her bleed with the point of his blades and ending up having his swords broken. And the machine used the same movements. It had a rudimentary knowledge of feints and deceptions, and its use of legs was quite unusual. The moment the machine caught Janine's axe with two swords, it would always go for a kick, aiming at the cracks in her armor. But this pattern left it predictable, and Janine allowed her axe to fall into a trap kicking forth with the claws of her own left leg and sending the machine rolling against the metal floor. It jumped right back on, leaking sparks from a crack on its wrist, a tingle of pain shot through the warlord's leg after a step. Looking down, she saw that the toe's claw had been shattered. How about we increase the fun? The techno queen snapped her fingers. Two other discs fell from the ceiling, changing mid-flight into the same humanoid-shaped figures albeit of a smaller size and different color. Aside from the size, all three looked like twins. Same lean limbs, lacking rough curves aside from pauldrons, same four limbs with blades at the end. Their heads were small and round, and four lenses were constantly trailing each movement of the warlord. The machines didn't come on her at once, forming a triangle around her. 
Janine noticed that the steel-covered machines moved slower. They jumped toward the warlord and aimed for her sides to create an opening for a golden one. So, to use your warlord, Janine took a breath. Moving around the room, blocking the thrust coming at her from all sides, these machines pushed her to the limit, forcing the warlord to put her all into the calm concentration of a deadly dance as she was blocking and deflecting the incoming attacks. Agreed. Wolfhag, Shaman, Janine roared and charged at the Golden One. The time for balance has come and gone. Her daughters came upon the Steel Ones, leaving Janine against the Golden. The machine twitched, registering a shift in their dance a second too late. The butt of Janine's axe came into the machine's head, denting two out of four lenses. She grabbed the robot, charged along with it into a wall, and splattered its form against the wall. Immediately, the warlord retreated, evading the three thrusts aimed at her lungs. She struck with her axe, landing a crisscross attack and hacking deep into the steel body. The first slash left the machine trembling. The second opened it from shoulder to waist, allowing two parts to fall to the ground in streams of smoke and spill out fibers of artificial muscles. Her daughters feigned weakness, coming back to back, before dodging to the side and changing their opponents mid-fight. Impatient one buried her claws into the shoulders of her opponent, biting away its head before stomping on the twitching remains. Anissa caught the incoming thrusts in a lock, breaking two of the machine's limbs and grabbing its legs in a lock with her own. Using the foe's own torn limbs, the wolf hag speared the robot's body with them. Bravo. The Techno Queen clapped, standing up and running down the stairs of her throne like a girl. Bravo. What a magnificent performance. It seems even Tungsten Aoi has failed to make a difference. TH and I had such hopes for it. She took a small portable terminal from underneath her cape and started furiously typing. You don't seem to be mad about your loss, Ginny noted, looking at the blade of her axe and coming closer to the woman. With the broken lens of her helmet, she sent the woman's exact location to zero and alpha. Why should I be? No matter how sound a theory is, empirical methods are needed for any real advancement to happen. Science, even unnatural science like my own, feeds off practical results. These machines almost match you in speed. In time, I'll make the ones that can... Anine struck. Her axe moved up, tearing through the air with an ear-piercing sound. The sheer movement of her upward strike sent shockwaves that cartwheeled the guards against the walls. No matter, they'll have a few broken bones, but they'll survive. This one, however, too dangerous. Such pristine talent and not a hint of humanity behind it. The blade stopped a meter before the lean neck, meeting some unseen wall that made the Talateller tremble in the warlord's arms. I already said, so I'm not delusional. The Techno Queen said offhandedly, still typing something on her terminal, I've accounted for every eventuality, fool. A wave of force sent Janine back. She felt a strike against her organs, gulped down, choking on her own drool. A piercing pain grasped her chest when the blood within her body shifted its direction for a moment, going in reverse. Gravity. Janine's eyes widened. Her daughters threw acid grenades that created a dome around the woman, with the droplets of deadly acid harmlessly sliding down the bent gravity around her. And with the realization came fear. The wolf tribe, for all their savagery, were pack-based people. In times when even a warlord could not hunt a foe on her own, they always sought help. Janine was unsure that she could kill the bitch in time, so she linked her vision with that of her allies, allowing them to strike with pinpoint accuracy. Fear changed to horror. Horror changed into pure terror, coloring some of Janine's fur white as Warlord Alpha's fear wave passed through her. Alpha, the strongest warlord, had a secondary power. Many people felt uneasiness or fear coming closer to her and dismissed this as simply a byproduct of her horrid visage. In truth, Alpha passively emanated fear, potent enough to cause a cardiac arrest even in the bravest of humans. Unlike most powers, hers was a passive one, the one that was always active, through constant iron self-control. Alpha learned how to keep most of the fear locked within her body, releasing it partially like a whip. And now she released it like a bullet, and the mere touch of it caused Janine to release her bowels. The Techno Queen only laughed, pressing her hand to her mouth as another beam came from behind Janine, a black energy beam released by Warlord Zero's rifle. 
The stream of energy harmlessly dissipated against the gravity shield, leaving the woman unharmed. The most productive distraction, the woman pointed at her crown. What? You expected me not to be prepared for the obvious danger of mental power. Nah, doggy, I won't die so easily, nor will I ever be a slave to someone's will. With this, the techno queen pointed at the massive servers next to her throne. I have all the data needed to perfect my creations and all the proof for any warlord to beg me to join them. I say this test polygon served its purpose. Time to level the place and make it level queen? The guard captain asks, limping closer to the queen. Oh, please, Boris. Did any of you really think that I would allow anyone in the region to live after what you bastards did to my parents? But, Queen, it happened over 50 years ago. There is no person alive who even saw that horrific sacrifice. And this should matter why the techno Queen tilted her head in confusion. I made a promise to make you all pay, and what better way than to squeeze all who live on these lands dry in service to me. Um, speaking of service, uh, I think I remember you sending your son to me. Um, some two years ago, in fact, where she pressed two fingers to her lips. What have you done? The guard tore off his cowl and helmet, looking at his queen with the pale face. Watch and see, loyal boars. It's time to test one more of my inventions while we are at it. The woman smiled and the steel walls around the chamber shifted, revealing horror. Johnny saw many things in her life. She saw cubs in her tribe die from hunger. She saw entire villages devoured by malformed. Janine had seen torture in the slaver camps, where cruel masters were making an example of the most troubling slaves for the rest to see. She remembered how Warlord Terrific worked her magic, brutally torturing a few guards by tearing away their bones with her elongated fingers to break the morale of an entire settlement. But never before had she seen anything close to this place of madness. People, living people, littered the wall, held by razor-sharp harnesses that never allowed their wounds to close. The limbs of all of them were missing. Some had peeled off skin, showing needles coming into their lungs. Others gurgled weakly, twitching as strange fluids came down their throats. All the people here had their eyes and ears removed, and all of them were either gagged or had their vocal cords removed showing the naked insides of their throats. They were bleeding. The blood gathered in a small round space near the wall, and the force field had kept the horrifying smell of excrement and blood away from the chamber itself. Or like what you see, doggies? The woman asked cheerfully. You, uh, the captain choked, falling on his knees and looking at one figure on the wall. A normie cub lacking both arms and legs, his eyes removed, but blood still coming from the eye sockets. What? What is the meaning of this? You have promised us that our children will be riders. And you believed me. Boris, you're such an idiot. I'd pity you, but... The techno queen laughed, placing a hand to her mouth as the captain shouted in wordless rage. The man jumped to his feet. His hand found a pistol on his belt. Still screaming, shouting his pain and grief to the world, he pointed at the queen, and she only smiled. The man fell on his knees his body being crashed by the gravity pull. Crouching, he tried to crawl to the woman before the pull splattered boars against the floor. He screamed, this time from physical pain. His eyes popped, liquidated by his own bones that were in turn becoming bone dust. The techno queen kept smiling, looking at how her former captain was turning into a pool of blood at her feet. Virginian groaned, struggling to stand on her legs. She experienced the unseen hooks and scalpels ripping away her skin and she also felt the sharp needles piercing her lungs, filling them with searing hot acid that kept burning with no relief or stop. Her brain was on fire, a vibration stimulated pain centers in her body, the arms twitched, feeling the limbs long lost as sharp edges of the harness. I'm feeling their pain. Janine had to force herself to believe that her eyes still existed. The pain of every person on the walls in this chamber came down on them, threatening to choke the life out of the wolfkins and leaving the terrified guards alone. Anissa and impatient, one grabbed their sides, tearing at their own armors in an attempt to stop the itch in their lungs, while the scout simply howled in pain. How dare you? Janine looked at the woman, taking a step to the throne on her wobbly legs. Oh, please, everyone is always on about the people when it is their turn. The techno queen frowned her nose. Where was all this lot? 
when my parents were dragged out and burned at a stake to satiate some deity's wrath. Huh. No fucker ever saved them. I saved myself, and now that I am the one in control, I am suddenly supposed to be the first to stop. Screw that. These bastards will pay for what their ancestors did. The Techno Queen looked at the surrounding horde. Do you like my wondrous invention? The idea for it came to my head as I pleaded, begged all the gods in the universe to let me take the pain of my family as they were burning at the stake. But the universe fell silent, so it fell to me to remedy this mistake. This device is all around us. It transmits every single emotion these sacks of flesh feel straight into your little brain. And not only that, but this device also records every feeling of pain artificially inflated with special drugs and can unleash all of this at a moment's notice. Janine took another step, feeling it to be the hardest step in her life. Her missing no, real, her real arm struggled to hold the teller. She wet herself, feeling a rising pain in her bowels. Biting her tongue, Janine tried to focus on this real pain, only to find it indistinguishable from the pain coming from the people on the wall. Against her will, the warlord started crying like a cub, still walking to end this bitch. One step, and another, just thirty or so and she can wipe the smirk off that smile. A step, another one, Janine steeled herself, forcing her body to advance. She took another step forward, sensing something strange and stumbled, falling on one knee. Before Janine's very eyes, her armor rusted. She felt blood coming from every single orifice in her body as the veins in her paws and neck started popping. Or this type of weapon. The woman said, Pure 100% oxygen is coming straight to you, contained around your body with a simple shield. I came to this idea after hearing the saying, Healer, heal yourself. We can't live without oxygen. Well, not unless you heavily modify your body, but in large enough quantities, pure oxygen is deadly even for you. Do you feel your limbs becoming paralyzed? Good. The woman walked back to her throne, spreading her cape around the seat. Now then, onto a main dish. Ravager, you cowardly, useless whore. I challenge you, come forth, or you'll find your CL. The tower shuddered. A new corridor appeared, where once stood the elevator, an entire section of the tower behind Janine disappeared, and tons upon tons of rock and steel started falling on the ground. The ground beneath Janine bulged, pushed out by a simple, casual step of a being that had entered this room. Janine slid away from an area filled with pure oxygen ending next to the massive legs. The Techno Queen challenged Ravager, and the Blessed Mother responded. The Dominator of Dominators stepped inside the room, lips twitching, showing fangs from time to time, drool running down her jaw. Her amber pupils kept dilating and shrinking, struggling to focus on her target. Passing by Anissa, she released her claws, an impatient one groaned, leaping forward and dragging her sister away from the fury that was Ravager. Finally, the Techno Queen said, clapping once. Famous Ravager. You know, you and I are quite similar, like you. I too have suffered... I have no time listening to your sob life stories, tyrant, Ravager spat, anger washing away from her snout. A moment ago, a wild beast stood in the room. Now, as she lowered herself on four legs, the Blessed Mother looked far scared. Ravager wiped the drool from her chin, breathing out the air. Steam, partially crimson from the blood of the fallen, came from her mouth, hiding her eyes for a moment. The pain left Janine and the others at the simple gesture from the woman on the throne. Ravager trembled violently as she experienced the sufferings of hundreds of people, amplified by the machine to the greatest extent. Janine cast her axe at the foe with all her might. It flew through the entire hall, ricocheting off the shield around the throne and making an arc falling at Ravager's paws. A single tap with a claw made Janine stand at attention, showing her neck for daring to interfere with Ravager's hunt. Pot calls out cattle. The Techno Queen smiled thinly. If I am the tyrant, then the same can be said about your own master, Doggy. Verdinus is a benevolent dictator who brings prosperity where there was none. You are a tyrant who sucks the life out of everything to satiate her vanity and leaves ruins in her wake. You are not the same. Ravager responded calmly, shaking off the suffering like water from the fur. The Blessed Mother walked forward, stopping once and inhaling air loudly. 
The Techno Queen's smile turned into a grimace of hatred after Ravager walked through the cocoon of pure oxygen unimpeded. A snap of fingers made the metal below Ravager bulge when the gravity generator sent wave after wave of reverse gravity into the commander's body. The blood flow reversed, breath refused to leave lips, and hundreds of tons weighed down the gigantic body. Ravager kept looking at her foe, taking two more steps and exhaling hardly, working her lips she spoke. This is the problem with people like you. You had a hard life. So sad. But you never ask yourself a simple question, what if not ye? What if I won't be mindlessly bringing revenge on innocent people like a bitch? What if my fucking overly complicated plan will be undone by a simple act of raw might because I have failed to calculate something? What if there will be nothing to catch me when I fall because I am a monster? Lecturing me. Aren't you beast? The techno queen laughed. Well, maybe so, but unlike your precious dynast and you, I will be remembered, doggy. The screen behind her came to life, showing the city, and the woman raised her finger. Have you ever considered why, knowing of your arrival in your army, I stayed here instead of running? It's because I wanted you here. I have planted a plasma bomb here, powerful enough to eradicate this miserable excuse of a city, along with everything for miles. Only I survive protected by the shield. And once the dust is settled, I'll pack up my things. She lovingly caressed the data banks near her powers, but a means to an end, you stinking dog. And my current end is killing you. After that, who knows, maybe I'll enlist in Dinah service and take over from within. Janine wanted to rash ahead to break her paws on the invincible shield around the woman. She howled, a wordless stream of shame for her failure to preserve the lives of her packs and the civilians whom they were supposed to save. Her trumping back, she grabbed Impatient One and Anissa, preparing to say what she always felt in her heart and address her scouts, apologizing for. Ravager inhaled the air. The Techno Queen changed in face, looking at her throne. Her finger pressed the button again and again, more nervously with every touch. Grabbing her terminal, the woman scrolled to something with the trembling fingers. What is happening? Where is... In the mesosphere, Ravager replied, walking toward the throne. I sensed that something was amiss. Why would anyone need so much toxic waste in the capital city? Trusting my intuition, I prowled around and found your bomb, sending it way above before replying to your call. W. Wait. The Techno Queen's eyes became round upon seeing how Ravager pushed her snout through the impregnable shield. Her motion overloaded several generators within the throne. The ruler became white with horror upon the realization that her shield had just gone offline and Ravager's drool was falling on her clothes. You said you wanted to be remembered. You will be. As a footnote in the history books, a fool whose vanity and wounded pride caused countless deaths, a sad joke to serve as a lesson. Dynast will be known forevermore. We can make a deal, the woman pleaded. I can make you into a ruler. Why serve Dynast? With me at your side, your name will ring in every corner of the world. Millions will pray to you as if you were a god. We can... couldn't care less. Ravager's jaws closed on the Techno Queen's head. The woman thrashed madly, trying to pry open the jaws with her feeble arms before her body went mad like a headless Cusack. Ravager stood up on two legs, gulping down the head and shoulders, leaving the remains to topple down the stairs, spreading crimson rivers along the stairs. The Blessed Mother turned around, the mad look once more in her eyes. Looking at the guards, she growled, hungrily dropping drool on the floor. Janine remembered what Alpha and Lacerated One once told her about the Blessed Mother, about the reason she rarely takes on the cities alone. The bloodlust could overtake her, and unless stopped, the entire settlement could be desolated like a lizard coop. Ravager walked toward the people, speeding up with every step, and Janine threw herself at the Blessed Mother, wrapping her arms around her waist and feeling her legs slide helplessly. Ravager felt unstoppable, like a natural disaster in the action, one that would never be satiated unless it claimed enough sacrifices. It is over, Janine gasped for error feeling Ravager's index claw scratching against her ribs. When did she... It is over. We won. They surrendered. Market. The wolfkin came to a halt, looking at the warlord with dilated pupils. Yes. 
Yes, blessed mother, we won. I am no one's mother. Ravager pulled her claw out in a torrent of blood. Janine felt how the blood ran down her waist, mixing with sweat and excrement on her legs, before coming out through openings on her feet. Lowering herself on a knee, Ravager licked Janine's wound, bringing immediate succor, and stormed back to the throne. Shaman, secure the prisoners. Wolfhag, tell first to send in medic teams ASAP, and tell Dragagana to get till Ingo and Dynast on a three-way call. Not paying any attention to the corpse, Ravager walked to the throne, finding the Techno Queen's terminal, comically biting her tongue from her efforts. Ravager clumsily typed something on the terminal with her oversized fingers, and the wailing of the victims on the wall stopped. For a second, Janine thought that the commander had administered euthanasia before she noticed that the ruined bodies were still breathing and still bleeding. But for now, their sufferings have ended as sleep has overtaken them. Done, Ravager said, putting away the terminal. She looked at the corpse, murmuring to herself, No, discipline, discipline, ravy. Setting an example, it is over. Even if they clone her without a brain, she'll be an entirely different person. Her commander Janine dared to speak. What just happened? Eh? Ravager looked at her, scratching behind her ear. Just guess the password and how this thing works. Simple, really. Anyone could do it. But you can't read. Questions for later. Janine decided, holding one paw over her wound, Perhaps there was something about shaman's tales. Just standing here in Ravager's presence, she felt divinity, an almost unnatural heavenly bliss that demanded worship and adoration. For struggling, the warlord says, Commander, I have some tokens. It's not much, but perhaps we can pay for augmetics to at least for cubs. She looked at the people on the wall. No. Ravager shook her head, sitting on the throne. The metal bent beneath her attempts to fit in, slowly turning into a flat surface. Thought about it already. Way too many parts need to be replaced. Engineers won't do. We need the help of White Coat's doctors. She growled with pure hatred, clenching her paws to the point that blood poured between her fingers. Taking a few breaths, Ravager massaged her temples. I have someone in Eterna who owes me a lot. An angel of sorts. But I doubt even she could fund enough cloning parts and Eterna is rather stingy with whom they help. Ravager smiled and patted the databanks. Therefore, we'll make Dynas Fund the help in exchange for the bitch's knowledge. But Janine looked at the data banks, picking up her axe. She looked at the hanging cripples and remembered the death and destruction that had been caused to this region. Commander, is it wise? To obtain this knowledge, she pointed at the walls with her axe. This woman destroyed an entire region, tortured countless innocents. We're supposed to heal the world. In what way can her wicked research help with that? At ease, Ravager interrupted her, folding her paws. Janine, right? Knowledge is a grimace of pain came upon her snout disappearing just knowledge. It is neither bad nor good. It is the way you gain this knowledge can be bad. She went the wrong way about it and paid the price. But the deed is done. I have a choice. Either destroy it and let the victims either die or live a hellish existence. In the future, someone else will rediscover it. Or I can give it away, giving them a new chance at life and maybe helping Mr. Ingo bring about some breakthroughs in the robotics field. Ultimately, it is my choice to make, but I understand your concerns. The corners of her lips sank. I will obey, Janine said, putting her axe on her shoulder and feeling how her bleeding slowly stopped. If you forgive me my words, calm ravager, she quickly corrected herself after a glance. I believe you are making a mistake. Show mercy to these people. End their sufferings and destroy this cache of evil. You're a sweet girl, Janine. But life is hard and unfair. And to make it easier for the weak, we have to compromise. It is our duty. Now leave me be. I am sleepy. And my head hurts. Please don't wake me ever, Ag. Ravager trailed off, breathing hard. Blinking once, she focused on Janine. Tell them to wake me up when Dynast answers. Oh. Saying that, Ravager closed her eyes and snorted, falling asleep like a cub surrounded by countless tortured and maimed people locked on the walls. Chapter 4? Solve one problem, get another? The wolfkin's body thrashed, and Janine mercilessly kicked the woman in the chest. 
beating the air out of her and sending the scout to the floor. She felt the smaller body twitching and contorting beneath her mighty paw as she was pushing the woman into the stone ground. And not all of this was because of her kick, as Marty Janine said, feeling her foot moving. We don't have much time. I know, Marty Shkina, the only warlord out of the four present who still wore her full gear, lowered herself on one knee and took the scout's head into her paws, singing a bedtime song for cubs. The first rays of sunlight came from the thick clouds above, allowing the warlord's shadow to fall on the scout. The smaller wolfkin looked at the warlord, looking almost like a minuscule copy. Janine could see their similarity despite the scout's profuse sweating and contorting features. Where Marishina's amber eyes burned like lamps, the wolfkin's eyes had a smoldering light in them, ready to burn in full strength if only they were provided the fuel. And that light shone brighter and brighter by the minute. Marty Shkina ignored the danger, forcing the other woman to look at her and keep singing. For someone as huge as her, her voice sounded really gentle and soft. Usually the cheerful song meant to inspire a cub about days to come now sounded solemn, more like one last sad tune to encourage a mortally wounded comrade. Which Janine decided, feeling how the scout's arms were prying her toe up. Wasn't that much off the mark. The wolfkin was getting bigger and bigger. A moan of pain left her lips when the spine shattered, protruding itself to accommodate a new, gigantic body. Burgess fur started falling off the body, and the woman cried again, looking at the ruination of her body. <laughs> what is the meaning of this? Janine heard the voice of lacerated one behind herself, and the steps of Marco, an impatient one. What do you think it looks like? Janine asked calmly. Lacerate one tried to charge Janine to throw her off the future divine beast. Eld and Pradeg slammed their weapons before the supreme shaman in a silent threat. Eld, a wolfkin of the second generation, had half of her snout missing, showing her nostrils channel and fangs in an ever-ugly smirk. Her mighty paws gripped the cruel scythe, barring the shaman's passing. Many wolfkins in the tribe called Eeld weird, but none dared say it to her face. In a war, she would come down on her foes like a raging fury, harvesting the lives of everyone before her, ending up soaked wet with blood and guts, her bombastic laughter reaching everything across the battlefield. In peace, she took great care to remove parasites and dirt from her fur, dressing herself in silk and doing her best to learn music, trying her paw at the harp. The tribe viewed this behavior as a weakness, but the last shaman who dared to chastise the warlord ended up having her legs broken before Eld plucked the woman's fangs, one after another, and wore them as a necklace for a year before Zero convinced her to make peace with shamans. Eld dragged the shaman to the doctor and paid to return what she took. Out of all the warlords, her eyes were the dimmest, barely producing any light. Predeg, a sister of the first generation, once had a gorgeous mane around her neck, a sign of some mutation. This mane had now turned gray, and countless wrinkles decorated the warlord's snout. Willingly, she defied Ravager's order of taking rejuvenation shots, meant to always keep warlords in the prime of their youth. Wolfkins of the first generation were weird. They had only one soulmate, and took their deaths excruciatingly hard. Legends tell that Predig went berserk after a marauder killed her soulmate, ordering her pack to stand back and ending 10,000 enemies in a single night on her own. If there was any grain of truth to it, Janine had no idea, but while Predang's movements lost their former grace, her precision remained unmatched. With her immense double-bladed curved sword, she once cleaved a slaver who had a gun pressed to a normie cub's head in two without harming the cub. Those who witnessed this feat swore they had seen the blur slashing through both the cub and the foe, but only one fell apart. Her loyalty to the cause had earned her the right to die of old age. Her eyes shone like suns, matching Ravager's eyes in intensity despite her age. Like Gagrit, Zero, Alpha, Lacerated One, and Dragina, Predaig was privy to being on Ravager's personal council, and these two always had good relationships with Janine and Marishkina, accepting them as sisters right after Alpha. Their packs took after them, always supporting each other and sharing supplies in times of need. I am sorry, the scout whined, struggling to keep her sanity. I failed. Shisha Martish Kaina licked away the tears, showing her neck to the scout in a gesture of ultimate trust. You have made no mistake. 
You, as ever, were splendid today, Scout. I am proud of you. I don't want to lose myself, the Scout growled. Please, M. Warlord, in the old way. Of course, we will go to the other side together. Marty Shkaina reached for the revolver. Idiocy. Lacerated one stomped on the ground. She is to ascend, not to lose herself. Stop it. Don't deprive our tribe of a sacred champion. It's not for you to decide, Sister Jenny told her, putting a paw on Marty's shoulder and wishing deeply to have the ability to take away all the pain and sorrow. The scout made one last violent twitch with her body. The sound of popping muscles and tendons in her body came off like a series of gunshots. Her eyes slowly started becoming filled with bloodthirst and aggression, and she threw her head up, showing two sets of fangs growing within her jaws. Martishina pushed the barrel into the scout's mouth and fired once. The woman's top of the head simply disappeared, followed by the appearance of a large crater on the ground. Thrashing one more time, the woman went limp and Janine removed her leg, looking at the headless body. Before her eyes, the paws of a dead woman clenched, releasing the gruesome claws. Blood stopped pouring from the ruined lower jaws. Thin vessels, like worms, poured out of the ruined flesh, followed by broken bones. New brain matter began forming before their very eyes, preparing to recreate the brain. Two out of eight. Marty Sheena closed her eyes for a moment, taking a breath to calm herself at the sight of a reanimated body. Janny, what you think? Am I cursed? This is no curse, moron. Lacerated, one lowered herself on a knee, folding her paws in divine reverence. You are blessed. On your knees, everyone. Welcome our new... No, Marty. It's... It just happens. Janine ignored Lacerated One, putting both paws on Marty Shkaina's shoulders and ignoring her own wounds. If you want to, I can... No, go on ahead. I need some time. The warlord's jaws snapped, biting the newly formed brain. She tore and bit, devouring the body faster than it could regenerate itself, licking the blood off the toxic surface and feasting on the remains of her skin. Danin let her be. Soon enough, even the skinwalker's regeneration would have to stop. She walked past the shocked, lacerated one, sparing her an encouraging pat. It must have been hard for her. In the past, many willingly embraced madness before fully realizing what it entailed. Nowadays, even the most devout refused to become beasts. The reclaimers were conquerors. But they also aimed to build a world worth living for, not another mad thunderdome. Marco made a step back, looking horrified at the bloody scene. A snap of Janine's fingers sent him standing at attention, and the cub reached for a small terminal on his waist. Ma'am, I mean warlord, she looked at him, calming him with a glance. Marco shouldn't be here, true. But at the same time, the Wolfkins were agitated after the battle. Some female could have dominated him just for fun back in the camp. Our, I mean yours, the pack lost 24 soldiers, 18 brothers, and 6 sisters. And 35 are injured, but all of them will survive, Marco saluted her. Don't salute. Impatient one hit him across the head, a mix between a pat and a light slap. If you don't have headgear, you must straighten up. If you have one, then you can salute. I, I forgot, sorry Sai. Impatient, one growl made Marco silent. The shaman sighed and reached into a pocket of her armor, taking out a black beret. Here, she put it on his head. Now you can salute. And I am not your sister. I am a shaman. We have no family, save for the tribe. Remember it once and for all. So we are a family in the end? This means it is okay if I call you sister then. You little smartest punk. Impatient one grabbed Marco by the nape raising him up in the air and snapping her jaws next to his ear. Too many losses. Janine pondered what this meant for her pack. The fresh recruits will go to the stronger warlords first. She'll be lucky if she gets at least one or two females with the next branch, and even if she gets them, they still need to be trained and raised properly to not be a waste. The situation was getting worse by the day. Each warlord should have around eight shamans to safeguard her, and help with spiritual and moral problems with the pack. Now, after years of wars, Janine was left with only impatient one, and her daughter was still a Young shamans were supposed to spend time in the tribe, learning from their elders and maturing, becoming colder and more distant from their families, stealing their hearts, and helping with life-givings to never forget 
that their existence is meant to serve the tribe. Impatient one helped Janine with the recent litter, so she passed some tests at least. But she was far from being a true shaman. Mardishina had no shamans left. All of them perished in one battle or another. Other warlords had one or two at best. And not only did they have trouble with priests, but also with lesser personnel. Janine herself had barely any true wolf hags left. Instead of steel-eyed women, she now relied on Greenhorn scouts, promoted by merit after their superiors had been killed rather than by right of dominance. This created a lack of experience in the pack. Even in the best of days, the Wolfkins were afraid of doctors because of Ravager and distrustful of technology. The wolf hags had to bully lesser ranks into accepting all the above, freeing the load off warlords. With so many veterans gone, new wolf hags shared stupid superstitions about losing their souls to power armor. And the few remaining shamans had little time left to explain how to avert their fears with soothing talks. This led to Janine snapping and biting her way through the ranks, something that Anissa and others should have done themselves by now. Anissa and Impatient One helped. Sure, but the girls could not be everywhere and some wounds were too severe, and Janine refused to have any more dead on her watch. Fear be damned. Thankfully, her boys were smart enough to visit the medics, but one of her scouts wished to die from an easily treatable injury. Risen 9 tore off half of her snout for this insolence and kicked the scout to the medics, tearing the skin off the back of another warrior, and thus finally restoring order in her pack. Janine wanted to show her own wound to the medics when Marty called for her help. Shaman, why did the warlords kill the sister? Marco asked, oblivious to the fangs before his... Impatient one put him down, giving him a light kick for speed that nearly sent him rolling. The shaman slowed herself, following the warlord to the main square. You remember the skinwalker's visit a year ago? Yep. Warlord sliced her arms after she ate three cubs and the beast ran away. Yeah. Janine stopped, knowing fully what would happen. Marco never finished speaking. A clawed paw hit him across the left chin, slicing through it. The punishment did not end here. Impatient one's paw closed around Marco's head, sending him face down into the stone ground. With enough force to curselessly, the shaman rammed her brother against the stone before lifting him once more, holding his barrette with one paw and growling into the bloodied snout. Janine had to force herself from cratering her daughter's head into the street. Marco's sufferings were not impatient one's fault. Janine was the one who failed him. To save his life, she took him out of the pit. But had she taught him about the tribe's way proper? No, she coddled him again and again, and his brothers and sisters did the same. The moment will come when he'll be on his own in some pack. And what will happen to him then? Never. Never dare address me by this name, Marco. The cub shuddered throwing a worried glance at Janine. The warlord calmly waited, forcing the fear for her son's safety down. Any other male acting so frivolously with any shaman would already have his neck broken. For his sake, Marco has to understand his place in the tribe. Questions are fine. Tears is fine. Even doubts are fine, Marco, but never ever use a name that a shaman discarded to address her. It's true that some names are repeated in our tribe. So saying this name when addressing someone else is totally fine. But when we become shamans, we abandon our names, for our goal is to serve the tribe and not our blood. I am Impatient One, and I am not your sister anymore. The Impatient One grabbed her snout, preventing her jaws from biting the small neck. Calming down, she set her brother on the ground. Her lesson is over. As for your question, sometimes a sister can ascend. Ascend? Marco asked, touching his sliced chin. Blood had already started coloring his fangs dark. The bleeding did not last. Even if he was a male, Marco was a full wolfkin. Blood dried up across the wound's edges, stopping the bleed. Impatient, one sliced away the blood and pressed the ruined chin together, showing Marco what he was supposed to do in this situation. Yes. Ascend. Impatient, one pressed a claw to her lower jaw and thought, You would be better off asking one of the shamans in charge of raising cubs than me, but in short, spirit of rage is coveting us all. When we fight too hard and win too much, the gaze is drawn to us. It is no shame. No one knows what exactly might attract the spirit. But after meeting it, the sister feels something wrong in her body, almost like a premonition of the coming horror getting stronger with each fight. Impatient one picked up a stone and placed it in Marco's paws. 
placing her own paws above him and squeezing it tighter and tighter, giving the boy just enough time to hear the cracks before breaking it. Eventually, a sister breaks like this stone, and something new, beautiful, and terrible comes out. A skinwalker, Jinine said, breaking her silence. A skinwalker is a being that is born from a fallen sister. It can become a copy of you in both body and mind just by eating a scrap of your flesh. It is utterly mad and unpredictable and worse. It kills civilians. No one in their sane mind wants to become it, Marco. And don't look so scared. A male can never become a skinwalker. Is there anything else to report? Um, Chuck is really furious about the state of your power armor, Warlord. I speak with him myself. Janine sighed, hearing the sound of legs rushing toward them. Yes, Warlord. Come, Marco. Let's visit a doctor and have your nose fixed. And watch out not to bleed over the terminal. Things are expensive. The impatient one seated the boy on her shoulder and jumped, disappearing on the nearby roof. Interesting. Screeched a voice from a nearby street. So your misbegotten kind can understand the value of precious gear and the hardships it takes to replace it. A terrifying creature descended from above a nearby building with the loud tapping of 15 pairs of legs, covered by thick segmented cheats and plates the size of a male wolfkin's legs. Chief Quartermaster Chuck came from the malformed, a notorious group of people known for cannibalizing people and for horrible and unpredictable mutations that differentiated them one from another. Even among them, Chuck ended up being special. His body reached six meters in length, covered by hair-like antennae, that served as his ears by tracking shifts in the air and it decoding the sounds. His sunken, four-compound eyes looked at Janine with no readable expression. The toxic oddness. The fangs underneath his maw clanked with annoyance, looking almost indistinguishable from an insect. The chief quartermaster started coiling around Janine, barely reaching her ankles in height. To her knowledge, Chuck was never involved in any hunts on humans. When Wolfens dominated his tribe, the Malform pondered if they should dispose of their strange offspring or not. All kids from that tribe ended up being sent to an orphanage. And after finishing school, Chuck found and reconciled with his mother and joined the military, quickly getting a uh, liking for maintaining logistics chains. After a decade of exemplary service, he ended up being promoted to the rank of chief quartermaster for the entire wolf tribe, much to the anguish of both himself and Wolfkins. The armor that was so graciously given to you, Warlord Janine, cost more than three battle tanks. Chuck raised the upper part of his body in the air, stopping unmoving before her eye level. And do you know in which condition you return the poor thing? Thrashed. Janine shrugged. Tout the word. Thrashed. Chuck leaned straight to her face, nervously clanking with toxic on ass. Some normies and even some new breeds felt nervous upon speaking with Wolfkins but not the logistic officer, be it a warrior, a male, or even a warlord. He demanded, often getting in their faces, respect for the precious things provided by the state. A few scouts and one wolf hag even challenged him for the supposed insubordination. His coils introduced them to a world of pain. One hundred man-hours just to fix it. You think I have time to spare personnel for it? Our factories are overwhelmed. We have literally hundreds of tons of equipment in need of repair. The work crews suffer from a lack of sleep. He stopped listening to some report from um, a communicator device installed on antenna. A long sigh left his jaw. And one of my workers just broke a leg carrying supplies from the local factory. I understand your frustration, Chuck. Janine told him honestly they could not stay here in order to save their lives. The entire population of this city and the nearby villagers were to be relocated deeper into the core lands while terraforming machines attempted to repair the harm the Techno Queen had caused. In a generation or less, the people would be able to come back. Do you? The Malform blinked, focusing on her face. Despite his compound eyes, his eyesight was poor. I don't think you do, Janine. My workers, admittedly with some help from Ignacy and other males, performed a pure miracle by fixing our equipment prior to this battle. Understand, if we only have the resources of a single crawler, to maintain equipment and ammo production for an entire army, 50,000 people. This can't go on. Our army is slowly grinding to a halt under the weight of our own demands. 
I had to confiscate rebreathers from the local factories, acting like a freaking raider. Speak with the commander. We must stop and recuperate, lest half of the Wolfkins have to use half-broken power armor in the next battle, leading to more deaths. Make her see reason. We must make camp, receive new supplies, replenish our stocks of medicaments, set up production, get proper food. She won't listen. Janine said, stopping his rising body with a paw. Ravager refused to listen to anyone, forcing her armor to be constantly on the move, felling whole countries in weeks. Janine herself was too low on the totem pole of command, and wasn't even a first-generation Wolfkin or a second-generation Wolfkin. She belonged to the eighth generation, strong enough to become a warlord, but not strong enough to earn Ravager's ear. Maybe we can stay and argue all day, but this won't help anything. How can I help you? I need more arms. Since we are abandoning the city, we have to take everything of value at once before Ravager whips the army into another march. I can't send normal soldiers into the factories. These places are literal helpets of toxic hazards. The Ice Fang Order is busy with the refugees, and the worker teams are tired to the point of making mistakes. Wolfkins are sturdy enough to gather the supplies without having their lungs burn out. But right now I can't get any help because your people are gathered on the main square for a mourning ceremony that refuses to end. I'll solve the problem, Janine promised him. Chuck made a bow to her, rushing to climb on top of the building and shouting orders into the communicator. The warlord touched a bandage on her wound, feeling a few wet spots. Nothing to worry about. Ravager's mercy has healed the immediate damage, and the rest will soon follow. Her spreading her shoulders, she went to the mourning ceremony. All around her, the city was filled with life. Soldiers were breaking into the houses and dragging the people out. A few locals lashed out, but what is a knife against a metal suit of armor? Her soldiers simply ignored the outburst, disarming people, putting rebreathers into their mouths, and harrying them out of the gates like a herd of Cusacks. Crying children, despaired wives, shocked husbands, and wounded. The tribe was through, breaking their spirits. And here and there, Janine saw some former guards helping with evacuation. Agents of the Investigation Bureau, who followed the Third Army like ominous shadows, rounded up some of the former officers along with the Major and hanged them. Only those whose guilt was proven with both documents and witness statements have suffered from this faith. Unfortunately, with the full investigation, some of the former oppressors, who willingly helped the Techno Queen throttle the life out of people, would escape the righteous punishment but such is life. If they turned a new leaf, Janine was willing to let bygones be bygones. If not, agents will root them out. Not everything went smoothly. Some soldiers tried to partake in local women or men claiming them to be spoils of war. These were mostly greenhorns, fools who joined recently. Dragona gave the order to hang them. Some tried to steal the locals' belongings. These fools suffered 50 lashes in the open, toxic air, and were given the task of preserving the items they had stolen, sending them to the refugee camps at the first opportunity. Should any of the items go missing, so too would the hand of the one responsible for them. Janine viewed it as an overly lenient punishment. She would have skinned any of her own soldiers for even a thought of disobeying the laws of war, and had they acted on their impulse, she would have drowned them in the toxic waste. Order is best upheld through a combination of fear, example and respect. People were scared and desperate and understandably so. No matter how harsh, home is home, but staying here wasn't an option. The very air had become contaminated with poison, causing cancer to appear at a young age. Most of the people here would die rather soon either way, but their offspring will survive, carrying the legacy and traditions into a hopefully brighter future. China stepped aside, allowing a family to be escorted past her. One of the cubs cried, dropping a wooden soldier toy, while his mother dragged him away. Janine picked up the toy, gave it back to the cub, and sent a calming bow to the terrified mother before stepping away and allowing the soldiers to move on. It was hard speaking with normies. Wolfkins communicated through a mix of smells, shifts in posture, and words. Normies barely used smells and mostly shifted their bodies when they were anxious or fearful. While young Wolfkins loved toying with cubs of the other tribes, Janine herself tried to distance herself as far as possible from the normies, 
helping when she could but otherwise treating them as outsiders, an unknown factor in her life. The Ice Fang Order, for all their arrogance, had a far easier time working with outsiders. For this reason, the Blessed Mother gave them the task of escorting the city's population to safety. Spirits, show mercy to these souls. Janine murmured, pressing her paws together and passing through the stream of people escorted out of the city. Half of her mind refused to believe that these young malnourished, but otherwise sturdy-looking people would die from the poison that soaked every stone in this place. Wolfkins could shrug off radiation and most poisons rather easily. Why can't normies do the same? If Alpha is to be believed, they created the wolf tribe. How come their immune system is so miserably weak? The tyrant fell. Why can't they be happy now? She came up on the farewell ceremony taking place in the middle of the city. Despite the morning lights coming from the thick clouds around the city, the square was shrouded in darkness by the communication tower. Shamans had gathered the dead wolfkins, stripping them of all armor and bringing them here on the orders of Lacerated One. Shamans tore down several buildings, creating crude slabs of stone to place the deceased upon and wrapping them in a cloth soaked in flammable liquid. Traces of this liquid led to a dais made of stone, hollowed a bit in the middle to keep a small pool containing the flammable liquid. Wolfkins from all packs were present here, to the south of this square, each pack honoring and mourning the fallen in their own way. Alpha's pack and Dragon's pack stood unmoved like statues holding one paw over their hearts. Agrite's pack and Predeg's pack both took their place around the edges. Their soldiers looked hungrily at the corpses, unsure why they didn't honor the fallen by feasting on their remains. Janine's own pack and Martishkina's pack stood side by side, cracking jokes and offering words of encouragement to those who lost soulmates. Just like most warlords have their own differences in character, their own packs have their own quirks. From blood, we come with scream and rage. A shaman started intoning prayer, walking around the dead. By honing our skills, we are leaving our marks upon this violent era. And in the end, we return back to nothing, knowing that we gave our all for the tribe. From blood, we are born with a shout. In death, we disappear in silence, watching over those who will come after us. The shaman looked around, waiting patiently for Alpha's arrival. As per tradition, either Ravager or Alpha finished the ceremony by setting the flames and liberating the souls from their mortal shells. But the Supreme Warlord has yet to appear. The shaman gave a quick nod before starting the prayer new, calling on a warlord to step forward and do what is right. Civilian rulers and war leaders united in body and soul to say their last farewells, unity even in these somber moments. Such was the way of the tribe. Together they stand. Divided they fall. Janine moved through the ranks, coming to the dais. Stepping on it, she raised her axe to the skies, letting out a single howl to honor all who failed on this night. And behind her, the wolfkins joined their voices with hers, unleashing hundreds of howls, all merging into one containing pain, rage, despair, and cheerfulness. Janine stepped into the pool and brought the axe down, creating a spark that sent off a chain reaction, unleashing flames all around her. Her jacket, pants, and bandages caught fire. The bare flesh of her wounds tingled, and she felt the unpleasant touch of flames licking her body. Janine spread her arms, feeling flame against her eyes, sensing the warmth on her fur. The flame spread from the center, engulfing the dead and filling the air with the smell of burned flesh. For several minutes, Janine allowed herself to become unmoved and enjoy the heat of the flames, allowing her mind to waver in memories of those whom she lost tonight. Howling furiously, she remembered the first mistakes of her warriors and their first victories, allowing these memories to forever burn into her soul as their bodies were slowly reduced to the bones, which would later be used for rituals. Finally, she raised the axe once more to silence everyone. There is no shame in dying, for this moment will come to us all one day. Janine said the ritual word steadily, allowing herself genuine grief. So many talents, so many potential warlords and shamans died in the past wars. You have given us your all, and that is all we could have ever asked from you, be at peace at the start of your new journey. One day, we all will meet again. One day we will meet again. The tribe repeated after her, and with it came fear. Alpha stepped onto the dais, fully naked. A statue of white coming through the wall of fire, with only her eyes, 
and the crimson top knot of her hair, giving her the feeling of a living being. She came upon Janine, her body covered only with dozens of bow necklaces and talismans, all beating against each other in unison. Do you wish to usurp my position? Alpha asked with barely restrained rage, her work hidden from the others by the crackling of flames. No, Janine replied honestly, not after the loss that I brought upon the tribe. Alpha's gaze burrowed into Janine's eyes, demanding an explanation. The Blessed Mother is asleep and we must use the time of peace wisely, Alpha. The ceremony must end. Our forces are needed elsewhere. Herself, ever the coward, Janine. Let yourself fly already. Alpha's snout closed on her. Janine threw her head up and twin sets of fangs came upon her neck. Alpha was not gentle. Her fangs pierced the skin narrowly evading arteries and scratched against bone. With a casual motion of her head, Alpha lifted Janine off the ground, holding her like a chew toy. Releasing a scent of submission, Janine went limp, submitting fully to the punishment. It didn't last long. With a violent motion, Alpha has sent Janine carwheeling off the dais, throwing off the dais. Janine let out a laugh, feeling the blood running from her neck as she stood up. The strongest warlord showed mercy. Usually she dominated with her oversized claws. Feeling relief, the warlord stood up eager to check on her sons. Finally, the immediate duties were... The farewell ceremony is over. Alpha roared, looking at Janine with annoyance. All packs, go and help the engineer corps. Janine snapped an order, guessing the hint. Follow Chak's command to the letter... The packs bowed to them before turning to the gigantic centipede figure of the chief quartermaster, who jumped off a building and immediately started assigning Wolfkins to replace his teams in the various factories and armories. And don't dare to mess around, or your guts are mine, added Alpha, noticing the disappointing size of some Wolfkins. Jumping off the days, she came to Jane. Ravager suffers from the worst headache yet, and is not fully with us. Zero tried to calm her down, and I ended up offering her terms to the dynast and Tilingo. Alpha looked at the tower. Thankfully, your howl pierced the madness shroud and I could slip away. Or does this mean we will leave soon? Abyss, if I know. Right now, the dynast whinges about the strain on the resources to save the cripples, and Ingo is his usual self. Let's turn them into cyborgs. Fool. Alpha spat gesturing for her pack to bring her a large leather military coat, colored in crimson. Not everyone. Warlord Janine. They both turned to look at the young knight from the Ice Fang Order coming to them. A yellow cape flowed from the man's shoulder and with no hesitation, he fell on one knee before them. Sourcing Petruda demands your presence to settle the matter of the rivalry. His crimson eyes looked at the horrible wound on Janine's body. If you wish, lady, I can try and... Don't bother, cousin, Janine growled. A stream mixed with dried blood left her mouth, clouding her snout from pure rage, sending a fresh surge of adrenaline through her tired limbs. Her son suffered, and this whore dares to distract her with an insignificant duel. So much for the Ice Boy's enlightenment. Fine, she'll oblige the CDSC. The knight felt her rage, bowing his head in acceptance. She only gave him a knock on the pauldron, forcing herself to set an example. Alpha, can I borrow your coat? Want to challenge me? No, it's just... Janine pointed at her body. I am a bit naked and you know how our cousins are. Alpha let out a brutish laugh before throwing her oversized coat at Janine. She walked past the fellow warlord, intentionally showering her aside with a shoulder to provide an example of hierarchy for the lesser ranks. Go get her, bull slayer. I expect nothing short of victory. Alpha's keen eye stopped at Janine's face, and a claw sliced against the lesser warlord's jaw, drawing blood. Make sure not to create any irreplaceable losses. We can't afford to lose a sword saint or a warlord. Chapter 5. Can't Tolerate Each Other She came to the Ice Fang's camp, surrounded by an honor guard of their knights. Every tent was cared for by initiates, young wolfkins in training to become foot soldiers and later squires and knights. They kept the place clean polished the power armor, cooked food, and followed their assigned lodge, writing down his or her deeds to later hand them over to sages. Even here, in this dump of a city, the camp was orderly, with a secure perimeter around it and patrols assigned to their duties. 
The camp itself was separated into several sections, with first Sunblade claiming the very center of the camp for himself and his royal troops. Janine had walked straight to this place, the axe on her shoulder and the oversized coat on her body. Two sages, the order analog of shaman, stepped forward. Both of them were encased in an elegant-looking power armor, whites in color, with red lines running down on the outer sides of their arms and legs. Impressive-looking gun halberds rested in maglocks behind their backs, along with tower shields. Halt. One sage spoke in a gentle and melodic voice. The male took off his helmet, showing a scarless snout. Honored lady, please state the reason for your... Janine caught him by the torso with her paw, raising the surprised sage in the air and hearing the whine of his armor beneath her fingers. The other sage's halberd has immediately ended up in her paw. The gun halberd's barrel, located above the curved blade, aiming at Janine's arm. Nearby knights responded in kind, taking out their swords and spears and surrounding the warlord, shielding the initiates with their bodies. She ignored all the commotion, pulling the sage closer to her snout. I came here on the demands of Sword Saint Bertrada. Her pupils dilated in response to the anger boiling down with her, and she felt a trickle of blood pouring from the wound. A male dares to bar her passing, dares to question her. Everything within her screamed for a blood price for such arrogance. She wanted, nay, needed to bite his neck to tear off that insubordination face and remind the male of his place in the hierarchy. It took all her self-control to calm down and only snap her fangs before his nose. My soldiers are bloodied and hurt after the fight, and the sword saint's father keeps me away from them. Lead me to her, shiny boy, before I accidentally break this camp. We release the hold, allowing the sage to land. My apologies, lady. The impudent little male dared to bow to her. But I do not have the honor of serving the illustrious Lady Bertruda, my liege and master of first sunblade, the greatest among our living kin. Please follow me, if you will. So much for Ravager being your blessed mother, huh? Janine rolled her eyes, following the sage across the richly adorned tents. On her way, she saw some knights training their initiates, battling with them with wooden weapons and pointing out flaws in their forms or overseeing the use at a shooting range. Judging by their size and looks, most young cubs were around 10 to 15 years old at best. Then again, Janine always had trouble deducing the age of the Ice Boys. For all their similarity with the Wolf Tribe, at the age of seven, a Wolfkin of the tribe would have already killed their first insectoid, knew how to take apart and assemble a shard gun, got their share of scars, and would have joined a military pack for the first time. Their counterparts from the Order would still be hidden away behind the safety of the walls, groomed and taught by sages, never seeing any actual danger. This happened because of one core difference between the two groups of wolfkins. Cubs of the wolf tribe grew fast, maturing to become smart enough to talk in mere months. Instincts to dominate and kill came to them along with a mother's milk. And cubs of the Ice Fang order grew up at the same speed as normies, staying frail and weak for years before catching up to their cousins. While this difference was a cause for much disgust from one tribe to another, Janine sometimes envied this difference. All her cubs grew up way too fast. She barely had time to hold them in her paws before they, seemingly overnight, jumped and were herded to the pits. Passing by one of the training arenas, Janine grimaced, hearing the words of encouragement given by a trainer to a cub who lost a sparring match in just free moves. Her opponent didn't even do anything impressive. He started with a straight overhead thrust aimed at the cub's forehead, blocked the incoming thrust with a guard of his wooden sword, and finally turned his thrust into a mere one-handed swing that touched the cub's nose. In her tribe, the fight would have never been stopped at such an early stage, for no enemy in the wild would stop if you merely cut him. Trainings were always bloody in the wolf tribe. Two, three, or more would crash into each other, biting and slashing, tearing at the skin with no end. No fight would stop until either the winner showed mercy or the shaman stepped up. You need to dominate. The initial wounds meant nothing. A losing party could prowl at the edge of a struggle, waiting until a winning side bleeds long enough to weaken or until someone gets distracted before charging in and trying to claw the win from the jaws of victory. Even males tried this, only to get slapped by the females. Janine failed to see how the Ice Fang's coddling could produce effective fighters. Lady, are you Warlord Alpha? 
The cub who won the fight turned to look at her before making a low bow. Without exposing his neck, he and his partner were dressed in similar-looking skin-tight bodysuits known as Under Armour sometimes, meant to be worn underneath actual power armor. Each Under Armour had countless zippers on it, meant to be opened when one is putting on the armor to allow cables of the armor to connect with the body's implants and allow the armor to monitor the body's condition. Stupid. This is Warlord Janine, the second cub said quickly, repeating the bow. Greetings, honored cousin, but she wears the marks of the Alpha Pack. And the scent. The boy sniffed the air and frowned. It's... See? I saw her in the news. This is Warlord Janine, I tell you. Name's Janine. Greetings, little ones. Janine stumbled for a second, unsure how to address them. Judging by the tags on their shoulders, they were ten years old, seeing a supposed adult act so childish puzzle. Have you come to pay your respects to the Sword Saints Warlord? The male cub asked, earning a worried look from the sage and the trainer. Something like that, yes. Have fun with your trainings. Janine smirked cheerfully, gave them a quick nod, and walked away, laughing boastfully. The sage led her to the tent of First Sun Blade, a true marvel of artistry, adorned with the finest finery, proud purple and gold flags beat on the wind. The ground within the tent was covered by soft rugs and rich carpets. A few stands placed within carried the remains of arms, picked from the foes that first deemed worthy and regalia of long-defeated tyrants and kingdoms. The sword saints sat on richly upholstered chairs inside, six out of the ones present in the camp, with the rest leaving to escort the refugees. Noticing Janine, first came out of the tent, accompanied by his peers. He alone wore white robes with yellow embroidery in the form of swords. A purple sash wrapped the robes around his waist, and a song of golden rings woven in his long hair accompanied each soft step. For all the claims of the wolf tribe that their cousins were pussies and fragile fools, she had to admit one thing. First was bigger than her. His arms and legs bulged with rope-like muscles beneath the skin, and unlike her, he had no genetic defect. Blessed by the twins' blood, no scar ever stayed on the pink skin beneath his magnificent white fur. No burn could damage his body beyond recovery. He, like Alpha and Zero, was prime in strength, charisma, and vitality. Protruda came behind him, still fully clad in her armor, aside from the helmet. Her long hair was tied in a tight knot on the tip of her scalp. Fuming with barely hidden rage, she looked at Janine, and the warlord gladly matched her gaze. Good, she may despise this thin idiot, but the rage in her is real. Janine wanted her fangs to fill Bertruda's neck, and Bertruda wanted to see Janine's bleeding. Sisters in spirit. A shame that Bertruda chose this moment. Otherwise, Janine might have spared her ribs. Camellia Wintersong came next, dressed in a doublet and leather pants, with a simple blue scarf around her neck and a glass of wine in her paw. All signs of battle had already disappeared from the icy woman. A welcome smile danced on her lips, unmatched by the calculated looks in her crimson eyes. A special salve and three onyx pins straightened her long saber hair, creating a gleaming top knot above her head. No armor? What, did your junk get broken or something? Bertruda bared her fangs, letting out a low growl. Camellia blinked once and put a paw on the woman's pauldron, stopping her from advancing. Do you not have an entourage or honor guards? Where the fellow warlords are you this scared of losing? Well, if so, then at least you aren't delusional about your chances. If, planet forbid, I'd been you, I'd have come alone too, unwilling to allow anyone to see my future humiliation. I came to honor you with my presence, and this is how you greet me. Ha! I have no need for either armor or cheer team to see you bite the dust. Ice girl. Janine smiled broadly, putting the teller's head on the ground and folding paws on its butt. Although I might just start calling you a flame girl. That's some nice anger in your eyes. I like it. Bertruda, step to me and let me taste what passes for rage among your cold kind. I'll make you feel the displeasure you caused my kind, barbarian, but I will not give you an excuse for blaming your inevitable defeat on the lack of gear. No, my skills will forever be burned into your very brain along with the Order's martial superiority. Guard Bertruda shouted, calling her people to her. Spreading her arms, she allowed them to start removing the power armor from her, piece by piece. 
please kind of mind. There is no need for such uh, heated words. First raised his paws, stepping between two women. We just came from the hard-won battle, and I assure you, Lady Bertruda, that the words of Lady Janine caused me no discomfort. Won't you two make peace for the future's sake? I am sorry, Grandmaster. Bertruda answered, left standing only in a yellow underarmor that left her paws and feet open. One of her sages brought Bertruda's spear, and the sword saint grabbed it, pointing its tips at Janine. The indignity caused by this miserable sand dweller is far too much for me to overcome or forgive. I will see her on the ground and hear her bones snapping. On this I give my oath as a sword saint. Be fool, Janine smiled back, relaxing her posture a bit. Why give up your pride so easily? Sages, first side, calling a row of tall warriors closer. Prepare to treat the wounds of both noble warriors. Lady Bertruda, Lady Janine, would you follow me to the arena so you could settle your D.I.? We will do it here. Enough chit-chat. Let the blades talk. Janine roared, charging forth and bringing down her axe with one arm. Bertruda met the incoming attack with a straight thrust of her spear, taking blade on blade. The clash of their weapons sent a shockwave across the camp, making first tent shudder for a moment. The fierce airwave pushed back several knights, first himself, and the other sword saints jumped in front of initiates who served refreshments to their masters, and Janine found herself pushed back, unable to bend Bertruda's golden-coated spear. The alloy hidden beneath the golden surface matched Talateller's durability perfectly. Muscles in both white-furred arms bulged, nearly tearing through the tight underarmor, and it sent Janine back. The wound in her body opened, sending a stream of blood down her leg, the healed cuts on her neck, hidden by the collar of Alpha's coat. Once more started seeping blood when her own muscles ruptured the dried-up blood. Bertruda advanced, nimble as a dancer. The flurry of her thrust made Janine lift the blade of her axe, using it like a shield. A smug smile danced on the sword saint's lips as she moved around the warlord her footwork carrying her like a feather while she tried to find an opening in Janine's defense. Janine beamed, forgetting the worry about her son, the weight of deaths, the lack of supplies, and all the injuries that she had to deal with tonight. The woman was strong. Bertruda had a nasty temper, but by the spirits, does she have such worthwhile skills to back it up? Unlike the stupid machine before or the helpless guards, here was the opponent who could make Janine bleed and this made her blood boil in anticipation, driving her into her pure condition. Fight. She could not stay on the defense, bleeding like a Cossack. Janine came upon the sword saint, taking a thrust on her axe, before taking it in both paws and bringing the blade down in a lightning-fast movement, forcing Bertruda to take the incoming attack on the shaft of her spear. The sword saint's feet got buried in the ground. Her paws trembled from the massive impact, and a few drops of blood showed from underneath her fingers. Janine let out a roar of pure rage into the woman's face, propelling the air hard enough to imitate a hit from a wolf hag across the pretty snout of her opponent. Seeing Bertruda's eyes narrow, Janine kicked with her right leg, aiming to disembowel the foe with her claws while their weapons were locked in a brutal struggle. Bertruda's lips formed an O and a spit, flying at the speed of a bullet, landed at Janine's left eye forcing a blink. Like a piece of cloth, the sword saint weaved away from the direction of the kick, the fabric of her underarmor lightly touching the flesh of Janine's toes. The warlord brought the butt of her axe to the left, acting a moment too late and earning herself a hit against her left leg with the lower end of Bertruda's spear, sending reverberating pain all across the leg and causing the limb to shiver. Janine didn't try to resist the impact, allowing it to center into a spin and utilizing the momentum to leave a bloody, shallow cut below Bertruda's breasts. No longer scarless, cousin. The thought barely lasted a second before Bertruda spun her spear in her paws, dancing back to a safe distance and made a thrust aimed at Janine's shoulder. The warlord has blocked the incoming strike only for the sword saint to send the tip of her spear forward above the axe's blade, grasping the shaft with both paws. Bertruda pushed the axe down, causing a grimace of pain to appear on Janine's face as the wound in her side came aflame, pushing a whole surge of blood out, not stopping her attack. Bertruda pushed the spear black across the axe's edge, sending out a host of sparks and allowing her blade to tear across Janine's shoulder, 
and leave behind a lacerated wound. Even Bertruda hissed, panting heavily and stepping back out of reach of Janine's axe. But not for long, Dust Dweller. Learn your place and bow to your back. Janine barely had time to block the first strike, for Bertruda created an entire wall made of thrusts before herself. The Talatella ringed in Janine's paws, with standing strike after strike from the sharp strike. The sparks created from each encounter created a small dome of flares around both. Bertruda didn't just let all her thrusts connect. Amidst the countless afterimages created in the air by the spear's movements, the majority were feints, meant to fool Janine into making a false block and open up for a true attack. The sword saint went all out, pushing her body to its limits. Her own under armor started cracking around her shoulders and tights, revealing the fur beneath. Sweat ran down her head, wetting the fur. And Janine endured, acting more on instinct and getting to know her opponent better. In all her life, she has never been the fastest, and her strength, however impressive it was, could only take her so far. She had built her entire style around defense. Each time the warlord could not overcome the enemy head-on, she would outlast them, taking advantage of their irritation or loss of stamina to deliver a fatal blow. For ten minutes, they fought neither allowing the other to gain ground, and both being too stubborn to step back to regain their breath. Her shouted something, but his words were deafened by the sound of steel crashing against each other. The wound in Janine's side had made the warlord experience fever. Ravager's claws cut way too deep and too strongly, leaving even the tip of her lung damaged messing with Janine's breathing, and Bertruda took advantage of it, slipping one thrust past Janine's defense and coloring her side red. The side of her coat got torn, along with the skin above her ribs. Superb combat sense. Janine smiled, feeling blood appear on her lips. I'd be honored to see you in the tribe, Flame Girl, but I too have a duty to win. Dominate. Janine let go of holding back her rage, allowing its fire to supplant her weakened and strained body to set her lungs aflame as she inhaled air, along with blood, and to send a surge of adrenaline through her body. She treated Bertruda like a challenger, as someone whose life she needed to preserve for the future's sake. No more. She'll treat her like a warlord, matching cruelty and brutality blow for blow. The warlord advanced, earning a slashed ear as she dodged a thrust that would have left a hole between her eyes. Before the spear could move back, she beat it aside with the axe, using just her right arm, and lunged at the retreating Bertruda. The claws on her left paw struck at the sword saint's shoulder, tearing away meat. Striking with her knee, Janine felt pain as her opponent shielded herself with the shaft of her spear, trying to let the kick's momentum carry her to safety. Bertruda groaned in pain, feeling the claws closing on her shoulder, their sharp hooks grabbing the edges of her bones to hold the sword saint in place. Opening her jaws, Janine moved to bite away the opponent's eyes, blinding her in restraint. Sister, said a gurgling voice, struggling for each breath of air. She saw her. Terrific. The ruined and dead warlord stood behind the circle of warriors, hunching down and glancing at Janine with a dim amber eye through the edge between the vambraces of two sages. All the fire had been gone from the eye. The fur around the eye had long since started to fall out, and necrosis around the eye socket threatened to allow the eye to fall out on the ground. And still, this was her dead and yet existing. Nine's worst crime against the tribe. She stole such an asset, valuable beyond all worth, someone who could have saved hundreds of lives all because she let the rage go into her head. Never again. Janine closed her jaws, headbutting Bertruda with enough force to shatter her nose. Still pushing the spear's tip away with the Talateller, Janine let go of the wounded shoulder, wrapping her arm around the sword saint, and lifted her in the air, tightly pressing the woman to her chest ensuring that Bertruda couldn't use her weapon at such close range. Without a hint of mercy, she had cast her down, coming crashing like a comet, breaking the ground beneath them with the sword saint's back, and adding even more pressure by slamming her own body from above. The slam was powerful enough to beat the air out of Bertruda's lungs and push the shaft of her own spear into her body, leaving a long line of bulging flesh. Standing up, Janine prepared to repeat the attack, in a grappling match, her superior physical strength came out on top against her opponent's might. Bertruda got way too overconfident. Aiming to finish off Janine with the previous attack, 
and forgot just how hardy the wolfkins of the wolf tribe were. The crimson eyes of the Ice Fang Order could see the tiniest particles in the air, slowing down even bullets passing, which allowed them to weave and move around the incoming fire with ease, dodging even the most mortal attacks. But this gift came at a cost of lower stamina, and now the Sword Saint had expended most of her limits, and Janine had not a single intention of letting her catch her breath. No, she'll slam her again and again until the fool loses her consciousness. A groan left Janine's lips. Bertruda reached out for the tip of her spear with both paws, and it came off, connected to the shaft with just a chain. Using it like a dagger, she buried the weapon in Janine's arm, kicking the warlord. A stroke of bad luck or well-placed attack had sent this kick into the wound left by Ravager, coloring the entire world, red and sending Janine into a pain-inducing rage. She let go of her axe entirely, grabbing Bertrudez by the ankle and feeling her claws piercing through the skin and scratching against the bone. Without a hint of mercy, she lifted the sword saint above herself, almost as if preparing to throw her. Instead of a throw, she used Bertruda like a whip, hitting against the air, arresting her movements at the last moment, and creating a crack in the air. The living wood's crap made a sound that drowned out the initiates' startled and shocked gasps. The sages lifted their arms, preventing the knights from rushing in to try and stop the cruel battle. Bertruda shouted, this time from genuine pain spilling blood from her mouth. The shock lasted for but a fraction of a second and she curled into a ball, striking at Janine's arm with her improvised dagger and forcing the warlord to let her go. Bertruda landed on both feet, jumping five steps away and reassembling her spear while Janine picked up the Tala Teller. Each breath teared at her lungs. The blood was pouring out from the wounds, turning her fur wet. She hated to admit it, but Bertruda was sturdy. Even now, she only lowered herself on one paw, breathing frantically and struggling to stop the blood flow from her mouth, using each second of Janine's hesitation to recuperate her own strength. Even on the best of days, Janine would be hard-pressed to win. Right now, she has no idea how to end this fight without killing the Sword Saint. Worse still, she saw pure hatred in Bertruda's eyes. Her age was playing tricks on her. No doubt the woman had never been so pressed in her entire life. She won't hold back. She already tried to kill Janine once in their combat. As the elder of the two, it now became Janine's duty to end the fight in such a way that would preserve both their lives for the state. So, what can I work with? Bertruda's nose has been shattered, messing up her breathing. This will ensure that the sword saint cannot endure the prolonged fight. Next, her ankle has already gotten swollen, dislocated, no doubt, but still, it should stop her annoying graceful strode around. Next, the damage left by the slam and the wound on her shoulder. Not enough. Not enough to win solidly and clearly. Janine's exposed lung has been threatening to rupture at any moment now. The wound left by Bertruda on her arm kept on bleeding. Somehow, she can't attribute this skillful strike to mere luck. Bertruda's dagger landed clearly on her basilic vein, and then she twisted it, increasing the damage area even further. Even cornered like an insectoid, the Sword Saint had prepared a strike that would ensure her potential victory later. As should I give up, the mere idea of this has caused Janine almost physical pain. She could win, she knew it. Everything is possible in combat, but she knew enough of Bertruda's style to weather her down, carefully opening the woman for one final cut of her axe. And who will win from it? Who but the state's enemies would win from me cutting away another important servant of a state. How many people would still be alive today if I had just kept my restraint and kept terrific all? A hit across the face has sent her backward. Janine had never even seen her attacker at first. She only felt how the skin on the right side of her snout was about to get torn. The impact from the unexpected attack has sent her rolling against the ground, stopping right at first legs, coughing and gasping. Her snout in the dirt, she looked up. Ravager. The Blessed Mother stood between her and Bertruda, the ground around her paws bulging down and the light of her eyes shining far brighter than the dim sunlight. At once the rows of wolfkins fell on one knee, and the sages pressed the initiates' heads deep to the ground in a gesture of submission before prostrating themselves too. Even first lowered himself to one knee before raising his head high and offering her neck to the Blessed Mother. Janine understood their nervousness. Ravager only ever came to the order to challenge the twins for another sparring contest. 
Ever since their demise, Ravager avoided their camps and fortresses, only ever visiting them just once to allow first to compose a painting of her and the twins. One last memento to the lost progenitors. All of you stand. I warned you. Ravager came upon Janine, slapping the warlord down with the same ease. A wolf hag would slap an unruly cub. No challenges between warlords and sword saints. A paw came on Janine's back, and she felt the ground beneath her bulging, along with her bones cracking. We can't lose the fuck. We can't lose allies or ourselves. Blessed mother, Bertruda wanted to fall on one knee again, but the amber suns that turned to look at her made her keep standing. There was no need for your intervention. I had the situation under control and was about to... How oblivious can a person be? Are you truly blind, Bertruda? Or is this a result of a concussion? Camellia snapped, dropping her icy facade. First put a paw on her shoulder, silencing the fellow sword saint. Silence. 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 Ravager roared the third word, and all sounds died in the camp. The white-furred wolfkins became statues, breathing slowly so as not to incur the wrath of nature. Ravager grabbed Janine by the back of her head and lifted her up, butting foreheads with her lightly and basking the warlord in the amber light. Do you think me mad? No, Janine responded immediately, grimacing from the pressure that threatened to pop her head. You have a reason to punish me, although I know not what wrong have I done. Blessed Mother. Warlords face each other all the time. You, you speak true. Ravager chuckled, lessening the hold. But you are half wrong. I am mad. And I do have a reason. If a sword saint makes a boast and fails to uphold it, she is a sword saint no longer. Tell me what did Bertruda tell you before the bout. She claimed to see me on the ground and hear my bones snapping. Janine bit her lower lips, feeling Ravager's finger loudly crack a hole in the back of her skull. Done. Anything else? Ravager's words demanded an answer, almost suffocating Janine's will. She wanted to lie. The Blessed Mother hated submission from warlords. Often she and Alpha would snap at the others, provoking their sisters to stand up for themselves and trust in their decisions above blind faith in the Blessed Mother. Dragena regularly called the newly promoted sisters patiently explaining to them the value of utilizing tactics and putting their tempers in check by challenging a rival pack to a war game. Janine never had to suffer humiliation from either Alpha or Dragona, but Martishina's cheeky tongue had cost her a total defeat at Dragona's paws, although this did little to hold the idiot down. But at the same time, Janine refused to accept pity from anyone. She wronged, knowingly or unknowingly, and she'll endure the punishment for it. Grow by toughing out the hardships. Such was the way of the wolf tribe. Where others would break, they will prevail. An honor lost is merely an honor waiting to be reclaimed, and the road toward it is littered with opportunities and challenges to grow ever stronger. I was supposed to bow to my betters. Janine smiled wildly and bowed. Betters was the key word. Once to Ravager, next to first and finally to Camellia earning herself a smirk and a bow from the latter. You won. I am Bullslayer no more, she threw Bartruda storming past her. She ignored the sage's offering to treat her wounds, and the sudden change in the face of her opponent when first said something into the sword saint's ear. All she could think of was her shame, not at Ravager or her defeat. Not even losing her honorable name, something she had earned for so long, did not bother her. Ravager was right, and fame comes and goes. Uh, Janine hated herself. A warlord has responsibilities. One of such things is to smooth things over between packs, preserving lives from being wasted in vain. Never again. Janine swore to herself, deciding to get better. Chapter 6 Mundane Problems The Reclaimer's military camp has slowly begun preparing to leave this mausoleum to human misery before them. The Order took guard of the rear. Their knights were busy escorting hundreds of trucks and caravans of people heading south to a better life in lands bordering the core lands, while the borders of the Reclamation Army were teeming with insectoids, slavers, cannibals, and raiders, all looking for a moment of weakness to strike and collect a rich harvest from the population. It was undeniably a far safer place than this region. Alpha's pack took charge over the west. Their mostly untouched forces spread into the desolated regions, 
gathering the civilians from the remote villages and announcing the demise of the local tyrant. Dragonaz and Nigrite's packs ventured to the east, both to collect the locals and to persuade a few settlements that had rebelled against the Techno Queen in the past to follow to the south. Should their leaders refuse, they will be called and the settlements will join the exodus. Nonetheless, Ravager was done playing nice with the region. The Blessed Mother has made her will clear. Kids, teens, infants. The entire young population is to be saved, even against their will. The capital will be left empty and desolated. Its furnaces were stopped, and its factories and generator stations were safely shut down. Although the pollution won't disappear this easily, at least the region won't suffer anymore. Like busy insectoid drones, the Wolfkins were carrying cargo crate after cargo crate from the city, not stopping at just unrefined resources, but also dragging the half-finished robots and drones along with satellite dishes, portable generators, and highly advanced terminals. The medics almost threw up a party upon news of a discovered bunker with medical supplies capable of sustaining a small population of a few cities. The guard captain, who had shown this stash explained that at one point, the Techno Queen had plans to sell medicine to neighbors to buy their favors, but soon abandoned this idea. Prosthetics, antibiotics, antidotes, immune restoring medicaments, artificial organs, and even injections to help with radiation sickness. This stash had everything to rejuvenate the shortened stocks of the Third Army. The sole reason why the medics didn't throw a party to celebrate this finding was the fact that each and every one of these brave souls worked for around 16 to 19 hours per day, saving lives wherever they could. Janin stepped into a small tent encampment meant to serve as an operation area for the lightly wounded. The warlord saw the scout from her pack in one of the tents. The doctors operating on her had already installed a new artificial liver and were now busy patching up her face. Marco stepped out of another tent, his terminal in paw frowning in worry upon seeing his mother. It's okay. Janine shrugged. How was your nose? Eh, stopped bleeding a while ago. Marco sniffed the air to show that he was fine. Sorry, got to run. Wolf Haganisa expects a full report in an hour about the Ken ready to get back in the field. A sure thing, she barely made a single step forward before a man in a brown hazmat suit, a doctor, stepped before her, putting one hand on her belly. Like all doctors here, the male wore a safety suit with green crosses painted over it. Through the transparent visor, Janine saw a sallow face with deeply sunken, tired eyes. What do you want, sir? For Janine learned, once and for all, never to insult or show disrespect to someone who takes care of your body. Last time she tried it, the woman first patched up her pierced heart and then gave Janine something to help with the mood as she put it up. Marishina had laughed her ass off, rolling across the ground, holding her sides like a cub, while she was listening to the less than dignified sounds of Janine's bowels, being forcibly emptied and the scout's embarrassed groans, and that torture had lasted for hours. The wolf tribe had a straining relationship with the medics. The dinosaurs were clear, obey and listen to them in everything, and never dare harm a medic or a civilian. A wolfkin would rather die then disobey the order of the Supreme Ruler. This was drilled into them by the Blessed Mother who despised any medical personnel with pure, undulatory hatred. The last medic who had stepped up to treat Ravager's wounds had nearly lost her life and went gray from terror. This schizophrenic relationship had brought both confusion and deaths into the ranks when mortally wounded Wolfkins would refuse an offer of treatment. You are injured. The man's voice was barely a whisper. He blinked three times before bracing against fatigue and nodding at her bleeding arm. After this, this paper cut has already been closed. After me, Dean saw Carissa Janine clenched her fangs but obeyed, allowing the doctor to lead her into one of the tents. Like all warlords, after a battle, she preferred to prowl at the edges of the medical tents, never coming face to face with any of their personnel. Of course, they did it for several reasons, but the primary one was to preserve the strength of the medical personnel and their supplies. The reclamation army was far from an enlightened country like the ones of the past, but their medical corps, formed and drilled by Grand Command Outsider and Commander Devourer, were second to none when it came to pointless morals. The freshly formed medical institutions not only taught the new generation about the medics, 
but also instilled in their students' love and care for all people in need. Uh, Janine almost found it admirable and certainly respected them for their dedication, but these people were a pain in the ass to get around. Inside the tent, the medic sat Janine on a large stretcher that almost cracked beneath her weight. Beside her, there were six wolfkins here, five wounded, four of them sleeping because of the sedatives. Janine smirked seeing how a nurse started washing away blood from the wounded wolfkin's thigh, only to discover a freshly formed scar beneath. The tired-looking doctor cursed upon seeing the crack on the back of her head. He snapped, calling two nurses to help him before Janine's brain could leak out. Frankly, she wasn't sure why they cared. In her youth as a wolf hag, Terrific once cracked her temple for the crime of arguing against torturing prisoners. Janine leaked pinkish fluid for days, leading to the left side of her body going numb for a few hours during the night, but she bounced off it just fine. After becoming a full-fledged warlord, her vitality only increased. The last wounded wolfkin was from her own pack, a scout by the name of Elzada. A good and loyal soldier, her fur had the coloration of the darkest void indicating a great future. Sadly for her, in the fight, the bull's energy beam had sliced off her leg all the way to the knee, and a metal insect had cut open her right side all the way to the lung, destroying it in the process. Anissa sat near the wounded woman, holding her by the paw. My... Elzada gasped, struggling to get an affair to speak. My decision is final. I re she screamed, thrashing on her stretcher when Anissa turned Elzada's index finger into a pancake with not a hint of mercy. The medics rushed to them, one of nurses even called security guards, only for Anissa to wave them away. Anine kept her silence. Anissa's job was to sort out the lower ranks and ensure their survival and future thriving, by any means necessary. You want her to live or what? Anissa smiled into the face of a hesitated nurse. Thought so. Let me work my magic, so Elzada, about that new limb and lung, I really think you should take them. I will not be despoil. Elzada's words turned into a squeal of pain as Anissa. First cracked her wrist and then the elbow, twisting the arm at an unnatural angle. Pain is nothing. Nothing. How right you are. Anissa snout close to the wolfkin's ear, whispering softly, See, you have a beautiful son, Elsie girl. It would be a shame if someone squashed him now that you are not around anymore, right? You, the wounded woman, licked her lips, looking madly at the wolf hag. You wouldn't dare. Oh, I am not speaking about myself. Anissa moved aside, releasing her claws to lovingly admire them. But you know how our people are. On the other paw, your stubborn refusal has. Angered me, to tell the truth. I might just take it out on that friend of yours. Bite her snout off or something? Not really decided yet. Bitch. The scout tried to stand up, only to fall helplessly back on the stretcher. Fine. Graph metal on me and prolong my misery. Sever my connection to the spirits forevermore. Just don't hurt them. I found a will to live. Incha, you make the pack proud. The smile has disappeared from the wolf hag, and Anissa has lowered herself on one knee, grasping her paws together, worry not about the spirit's wrath. Many people err on their life path, but the spirit's love for us is eternal. They give us life, and they give us the duty to save the lives of those who can't protect themselves. Everything else is irrelevant. Should you find yourself devoid of flesh, should microchips replace the synapses of your brain, should your heart be replaced with a blood pumper, your duty will sustain you. Save people. Stay true to your comrades, dominate, and strive to be better. Do all this and you will never walk alone, for you all will meet once more on the other side. We made back to our perfect form. Sleep now, Elzada, and know that the Spirit's grace is with you. And one day I'll kick your ass in this. Elzada smirked and cursed upon receiving a playful smack on the head. I fucking hate all of you stubborn freaks. We got permission. The nurse shouted, dragging the stretcher with the wounded out of the tent. Prepare the operation room in the crawler before she bleeds out and get the doctor. Nicely done, Janine said, clenching her arm to see if the bandages around her wound were restrictive or not. The medical personnel all around them hurried to leave with the wounded, leaving just a few MP soldiers to watch over the wounded. Janine snapped her fingers, commanding them to get out of the tent, leaving herself along with her daughter and the sleeping patients. All in a day's work, mom. 
Anissa bowed. Janine stood up in a burst of movement, appearing before Anissa faster than the woman could see her. The mighty paw grabbed the woman by the throat, lifting the choking wolf hag to the tent ceiling. With pride in her heart, Janine saw how her daughter had released her claws, leaving bloody gashes on her arm. It took all the wolfkin's restraint not to kick at the recently bandaged wound. Speaking of duty, Janine's claw moved to the eye patch, moving it up and showing an empty eye socket. Anissa, I put up with your antics for a long time. Spirit of loss, be my witness. I coddled you for far too long. And today, our family has suffered a blow because of my incompetence. She saw her daughter's remaining eye widen. Yes, mine. I'm in charge. Everything that happens with my pack is my fault, Anissa. Ignacy's injury is my fault, not yours. It was my mistake, which I will now rectify. You have the skills, knowledge, and speed. Only your field of vision has caused the incident. And works. I know not if you keep this wound as a memory of your loss to that girl. Not a girl. Anissa whispered, looking down in shame. It was an insectoid. Janine has let go of her daughter's neck and sat back on the stretcher, trying to compute what she just heard. Not a girl. But why lie? She patted the stretcher near herself, inviting Anissa to sit. For a while, Janine had no idea what... She always assumed that her family would always tell her the truth about everything and nothing short of it. How else could she protect them if someone was dominating them in the pits or packs? What? She asked, simply trying to sound gentle. The girl had a reason to lie. There could be no doubt of it. I lost my eye during field training. Anissa sat nearby, biting her lower lip. It was a stupid mistake, honest. I've killed dozens of drones before, but that day I was, you know, riled up about. To be honest, I don't even remember what it was. And that blasted drone had sprung from a crack between the stones and next thing I its claw was in my eye. I refused an augment because, well, you know, I believed myself pathetic for losing an eye to this. And when I thought about the disappointment on your face, I lied, she finished weakly. Are you telling me that I broke the legs of the girls in your pack for nothing? Janine exploded. Family mattered to the Wolfkins. The strong must rule, but the strong must also be smart. Otherwise, they are not strong, only brutish. Thus, when some girls dominated others, their family members could show up to protect their blood kin. This sometimes led to a whole feud between extensive families. Although such cases were rare, mothers almost always spent time in faraway wars, and fathers were too weak to stop a rampaging teen. Still, this caused motherless cubs to grow up, carefully weighting their opinions and forming entire alliances before dominating others safely. Janine knew much of this. Her own mother abandoned her for the crime of being misshapen. So upon learning what happened to her daughter, she took her forcibly to the hospital. Then she visited the pits, noting the most ferocious, cleverest, and cruelest of the future leaders, and introduced them to humility, horrifying the rest with the sound of the snapping bones. No one dared challenge her for this. Wait, it was you. You are the reason our pack got calm enough for everyone to live long enough to mature. Anissa burst into laughter, seeing her mother's face, and for a second, Janine had a desire to throttle the stupid girl. Anissa, this isn't a joking matter, Janine tried to explain. Abyss, take it. I intervened in a natural selection for naught. Warlords are meant to be better than this. I must find these girls and apologize. Elzada is one of them. So if you want, feel free to come to her after the operation. She'll probably be seething in bile for a while, though. Praise be the spirits, I can undo some of the harm to their honor. Janine sighed in relief. She wasn't angry because of the lie. Why should she be? As a warlord, it is one of her duties to lead the tribe during a war. If her own daughter can misdirect her, it means Janine has a long way to go. I just, I just couldn't behave after what had happened to... They both fell silent, remembering the fate of the lost family member. Finally, Janine sighed, standing up. It was good to talk like a family. But your eye is your weakness, Anissa, and weakness must be removed or turned into strength. Get a new eye, it's an old Yes, ma'am. Anissa straightened up for a moment and then took herself by the chin. Chuck ought to have access to some advanced models. Chief Quartermaster Chuck. Janine corrected her daughter with a growl. 
officers of the regular army were very picky about mentioning their ranks and discipline, going so far as to give flogging to any Wolfkin who dared to break a carefully built up system of subordination. Although, and to be fair, the last Wolfkin sentenced to being flogged mistook this punishment for a mystical massage available in special salons in the Corlands. Janine and a few other warlords had a chuckle. Witnessing how confused guards had stopped in their tracks after the woman asked them to hit lower. Ever since then, Captain Kristobo Bowashnikov, de facto leader of the Third Army and the one responsible for reigning in Ravager's most bloodthirsty urges with the use of artillery when needed, has made the official declaration that any further punishments to the Wolfkins will be dealt with by the soldiers in power armor. Janine almost wanted to take him up on this bet. Power armor or not, a normie is just a normie in the end? Yes, he and I are going to have dinner today and... Janine has leaped from the stretcher, grabbing her daughter by the shoulders and making her look her in the eyes. Anissa, he is chief quartermaster, is Chuck is a centipede. He is strong, yes, and in other circumstances I would have approved of your choice. But I am not sure it is even possible for you two to mate, much less to have cubs. Mom, we are just having fun, that's all. Her daughter raised her palms before herself, struggling to fight back a smile. He's not my soulmate. If you're worried about it, it's just when his coils close around you and his mandibles play a chittering song behind your ear and his legs run down your spine. Ah, it's truly a one-of-a-kind feeling. Any of us can die at any moment, might as well live in a moment, right? Sure thing. Just don't do anything overly weird, okay? And keep on with your studies, no matter what, your future must not be denied to you. You will become a shaman like your sister, and this is final. Janine made a step to the exit before stopping. Gather the pack. I have a speech to give after a talk with Ignacy. Abyss, how am I going to convince him to take a new arm? I don't think you need to worry about it. Anissa smiled, following her and calling the MP back. She found her sons in another tent, the one meant for the lower ranks. They shared the place with a few members of the worker team, who looked with surprise at the angrily arguing Wolfkins. Bogdan was out of his armor standing in a green sleeveless shirt and simple pants. Ignacy lay on the bed, covered with a blanket all the way to his waist. The stump of his arm was tightly bandaged, and the area around it was shaved of all fur, showing his tanned skin beneath. Warlord. Bogdan stood at attention, and even Ignacy tried to jump out of his bed. At ease, both of you. It's just Janine for now. She waved her paw, feeling thankful that none asked why she looked like a mummy, all wrapped up in bandages with blood smeared all over her coat. Putting her axe on the floor, Janine gave Bogdan a hug and squatted before Ignacy's bed, still towering above him. Ignacy, I know that it might go against your beliefs. She clenched her paws, trying to find the right words to calm him down. Janine will not hurt her sons. She refused to. All of them were good boys. It was not their fault for being born weak. In spite of the stigma against metal, Becoming a crippled is not the way to live. Upon noticing a strange look in his eyes, she carefully took him by the good shoulder. We will support you no matter what. Crippled or not, your family will never abandon you, but please try and... I already agreed to the augment. Ignacy said casually, and Janine's world cracked with relief. She stood up trying to look presentable and regain some of her distant dignity. If impatient one had been here, she would have rightfully reprimanded the warlord, potentially ordering some flesh punishment. Family, no matter how much you love them, always takes a backseat when it comes to matters of the tribe. To avoid favoritism and weed out any possible seed of corruption, warlords were expected to cut off their families and treat them like anyone else. After all, no one forced a female to become a warlord. If she was not willing to obey some rules, she should have never taken this rank in the first place. In practice, however, most warlords kept close connections with their families, often setting higher standards for their offspring. Shamans knew about it, but let this injustice slide. Believing it to be one of many changes that the future has brought to the tribe, adapt and keep living or struggle in vain and perish. Janine's heart raced with happiness. Her son won't be a crippled. He won't become someone whose sole purpose in life is to survive on the dregs and is meant to be sacrificed in times of need. 
The relief had washed over her, banishing her hatred for herself and anger at Ravager for robbing her of a well-deserved victory. Her son is going to be fine. Check this out. Ignacy struggled a bit with a portable terminal before finally allowing his brother to help him. An image of a steel limb came on display, causing Janine's eyes to narrow. Beards are her witnesses. She wasn't the brightest lass when it came to machinery. But even she has noticed a strange tube within the limb schematics and a large container for a flammable material. It took some pleading, but the technicians agreed to test my own design. Well, not really my own. I blatantly copied and adapted it from one of the books we got from that bunker a while ago, but that's beside the point. The idea was to install a generator powerful enough to emit plasma out of my palm, but the logistic officer had shut down this idea because it would be too expensive. Bogdan rolled his eyes, pressing a button on the terminal and showing Janine the initial design. Janine only whistled, noticing the cost and output of the damn thing. Once fully charged, it could eat its way through an entire mountain if needed. My thoughts, exactly. Ain't no way the state gives this experimental tech to grunts like us. And thank the spirits for it. Ignacy would have blown himself or others while trying to whip That's wise, her son snapped, returning the image. I calculated everything, from recoil to an emergency shutdown in case of... Know what? It doesn't really matter anymore. Anyway, the downgraded model is fully capable of melting a tank's armor upon prolonged exposure. Just imagine me jumping on a tank and melting its hatch. Um, fool? Bogdan stretched the word. You take care of tanks by jumping on them and tearing away the hatch. Then you drop grenades down as a welcome gift to the crew and jump onto the next one to repeat the process. Listen to the voice of reason, Ignacy. Janine took the terminal in her paws and started reading about gripping strength, reaction, and the alloy from which the arm would be made. Upon seeing that it was comparable with the power armor, the warlord relaxed. I am proud of you. No, really, to come up with the idea of how to adapt an existing design to our bodies is impressive. Son, she ruffled his hair, asking worriedly, Is there any way to add claws to this arm? Girls might start to ignore a clawless male. If it will cost too much, just tell me. Maybe I can find some tokens. It is fine, Agnesy said, looking triumphantly at the image. Fire caster is perfect as it is for flame caster. Bogdan corrected him. What sort of name is Fyra anyway? I heard it from a game. Mom, I mean, Warlord Janine. This is my first major project. Ignacy beamed, despite the pain in his shoulder. Can you imagine? I actually made something of worth. I am not useless. Just make sure not to end up like your brother. Janine bit her tongue. No need to spoil the moment for the boy. What happened to her firstborn was Eugenia's and Skulltaker's fault. Not a flaw in his knowledge of technology. But still, to this day, she remembered the strained squeals of her precious boy, the way his veins bulged beneath his skin shortly before rupturing, and the sheer pain and despair in his beautiful amber eyes caused by his implants going awry and cooking her boy from within. She hated the fake saint for it, along with her precious little country of lies. It or not. The Reclamation Army had a long history of rivalry with this mythical country. The Turna, the bastards who survived the extinction undamaged, proclaiming unity and friendships to the desolated wastes around them. In an attempt to gain some goodwill, Eterna invited the brightest youths from all around the world to attend their universe. Zero was one of such people, acting in spite of Ravager's advice. And lo and behold, Eterna's government had changed while her sister was there, and they backstabbed her and the other youths, kicking all who looked different from normies into the deadly wastes all without alerting their countries. No guides, no supplies, and the attack of a sand reaper, a most dangerous predator around the lands, have left hundreds of students dead and far more injured. And once the students turned back, pleading to the guards for help, the Eternians left them to, if not for Ravager, all of them would have been dead. Following this, Eterna suffered a minor revolution and tried to make amends, willing to pay enormous sums of money and offering free health care to all victims of their cruelty. Some agreed, but Zero always warned the tribe about ever again trusting Eterna. Then, a few years later, the entire world got exposed to the horror that was the Apocalypse class, 
and the two sides came to blow once more. Amidst the painful birth of the new world, some people gained powers, unnatural abilities capable of a host of various things, ranging from being able to predict a disaster to being able to turn into steel or summon fire from hands. These powers were as numerous as they varied in strength. Eterna, the Oath Takers, and the Reclaimers, the three strongest nations in the world, had agreed on making a ranking of these powers to track the whereabouts of the most potentially dangerous individuals. And among them all, the strongest is the Apocalypse class. These individuals are fully capable of destroying the entire world, sometimes by pure accident. The Reclaimers first experienced this horror when a wave of nightmares spread across the world, torturing people and animals alike and causing numerous tribes to bring cruel sacrifices to their gods. And not only that, but these nightmares had also caused Sand Reapers to go on a rampage, wiping out thousands. All of this was caused by an unlucky mutant who was locked alone on a mountain's peak and had no idea of the full extent of his power. Janine and her son were part of the pack sent to capture him. Led by the young Ravager, they came into blows with Eugenia and her own team and a few mercenary groups that aimed to capture the new breed as well. And amidst it all, Skulltaker and Eugenia had ended Janine's son, later leaving along with the mutant with Ravager's permission. Janine swore to exact the blood price from Eugenia for this, but in their next encounter, the false saint easily disarmed her, refusing to kill any member of the wolf tribe trying to make excuses, and offering amends when the captured Janine roared her grievances into that angelic face. Ravager was the only member of the wolf tribe who could match this bitch in battle, an enemy of the entire tribe, a most cursed and unreachable prey for Janine. You are great, Ignacy. She hesitated before leaving a kiss on his forehead. A cold look came back on her snout once Janine straightened herself. A quick snap of her fingers left a bruise on Ignacy's forehead right next to her kiss. When she spoke, her voice resembled a snake's hiss and never dare call yourself useless ever again, fool. You risked your life to save lives today. Stayed true to the traditions and our values. Stood loyally with your comrades. Have a family that cares for you. Is this not enough to satiate your sense of It is, warlord. Her son bowed his head. I am sorry for my words. You are a good boy, Ignacy. So what if you have different tastes in life? I can live with it and so can you. Fuck anyone who thinks otherwise. Janine wanted to say more, to admit that she loves her children, but the looks of the other patients made her swallow her feelings. Uh, for morale's sake, she must become a larger-than-life figure like Alpha, Dragina, and the late Terrific. Bogun, a trial of failure is about to start. Will you attend? With your permission, I would rather stay with my brother, mother. Bogdan bowed gracefully. The operation to install his new arm is about to begin and I would like to cheer him up upon his awakening, and to tease me up. No doubt, Ignacy mumbled with a smile. Of course that too, oh brave soldier, Bogdan finished seriously, causing his brother to groan from embarrassment. Of course, Ignacy, you have ten days leave to recuperate. Bogdan one day leave to help your brother adjust. Janine told them, storming out to meet the judgment of her pack. Chapter 7 She came outside of the military camp, locating her pack with a smell rather than finding any arranged place. They stood before her, hundreds of wolfkins under her command, assembled and waiting for her word. Janine walked into their midst, not demanding any discipline for once. A burning shame fired anew in her chest, fumed with anger at her own ineptitude to bring about the glory that her pack so richly deserved. When I brought Terrific low, I swore to become a worthy warlord. When I saw your performance in battle under my leadership, my heart sang in joy, propelling me to greater heights. When I was given an honorary name by Alpha herself, I thought I had finally become the woman that I always wanted to be. Bullslayer, she dubbed me. Janine said loudly, lifting her weapon to the skies, hearing the cheerful howls. Looking around, she started listing her crimes, not trying to weasel out of the responsibility. I was challenged by Bertruda of the Ice Fang Order, and I lost the battle, losing my hard-earned honorable name in the process. She let the weapon fall, spreading her arms to accept the pack's judgment. My shame is our shame. My weakness is our weakness. Won't someone rid the pack of this disgrace? Don't you feel rage and anger boiling down in your very veins at the sign of the weakness that I brought upon you all? 
come at me and tear me apart for the crime of losing honor. None came at first. She tasted the hesitation of her soldiers, mixed with confusion as to why she should be the target of their wrath. Fur on the back of their necks rose, and a growl of anger left hundreds of throats, as all their being demanded a righteous, the honorary name has been taken away from their warlord. The order claimed a win over them. Janine felt the hatred born in their hearts. Retribution. The first to act was impatient one, who charged at Janine from behind while aiming her claws at the wound ravager had left on Janine's head. The warlord met her attack with an elbow, sending the shaman into the ring of her warriors, where she stood up bowing her head in acceptance of Janine's superiority. Speak. Janine smiled, whirling around to smack aside Anissa, sending her like a cannon, tear me asunder and reclaim the lost honor. Bathe me in blood to make me repent for bringing shame to Terrific's name. Pop my eyes and rip out my lying tongue that promised a victory. Color the ground with the blood of a liar. Rip my weakness asunder. Take away my ribs one by one so we all could feel a sucker through my agony. They came at her, a wave of black furred bodies swarming Janine from all sides. The warlord never moved from the place, sending her own soldiers back with large swings never once bringing her paws or claws on them, using only her forearms to send them back. The shame was hers, and thus only she should suffer. A warlord was someone who rose to the very top of her pack through force. Should she fall against the blasted cousins? She is to prove her right to leadership anew through strength alone. The traditions demanded it. A slight against a warlord is a slight against all. And if a warlord allows it, she must pay the price. Janine endured gashes and slashes carefully shielding her wounded spots as she tore away the wolfkins who gnawed at her neck. Still, she resisted the urge to use the full power of her blows, only pushing back rather than hurting. When you are in charge, everything is your fault, and blood is the least price one can pay for her mistakes. It has ended just as suddenly as it began, almost the entire pack lowering their knees and releasing a howl of pain, and sorrow meant to show that they share the misery with their warlord and accept her just like before. Shame and longing were present in this howl. Shame about the defeat. Longing about yesterday, the day when they could still walk among their kin as equals. But among all these sounds, something else was breaking through. A support. A warlord was responsible for her pack, but a pack was also responsible for a warlord. They all failed each other. This is how it is. Janine roared to them, taking in their desperation and transforming it into words. We are weak. Honorless, the Whiteford threw us onto dust and walked all over us. And this is only my fault, not theirs. Not yours, but honor lost is merely honor waiting to be regained. An honorable name means nothing. If it is not backed up with deeds through your dedication, we will reclaim our lost honor. On my life, I swear to earn another honorable name and give it to the pack in terrific's memory. On my body and soul, I swear to become a leader worthy of your sacrifices and dedication. The pack members leaped to their feet, fired up by their leader's words and eager to work even harder to go above and beyond their duties and prove to their cousins that they are the best state servants out there. Misery turned into ambition. There will be no honorable duels or retribution against our cousins. Janine warned them, raising her axe in silent threat. Oh no, kind of mine. We won't walk an easy road. We will not steal what was rightfully taken. The easy way is not for the wolf tribe. We prove by our actions that we deserve new glory, a new honor. Save the ones who can't protect themselves. Devour those who prey on the meek and shy. Guard the state and usher in a new and better age for all of humanity. For the blessed mother and dynasty, for the state and our tribe. The pack word back. Dismissed. Anyone who will be seen attacking an ice boy will have her or his skin taken by me. The disappointment of her soldiers was almost palpable. Doubtless, some planned a few ritual matches today. Janine smiled at them, warmly addressing them as a comrade rather than a leader. Duty is eternal, and thus we have innumerable chances to regain what was lost. Have a rest, my kin. The night was hard, yet the weight of our responsibilities only makes us stronger still. Leaving the field, Janine saw Bertrude Amontop and Camilla Wintersong waiting for her at the main entrance to the camp. 
Seeing that Janine's pack had ended their ritual, the two moved to them. A row of soldiers stood in their path, catching on to the mood of their warlord, as Janine herself retreated, returning to the camp through another entrance. The Ice Fang Order had cost her enough, for she wished she had nothing to do with them anymore, aside from working with them in the battles to come. R.K. Uh, Lady Bertruda insists on meeting with you, Marco announced, stepping into Janine's tent. Janine put aside the terminal, releasing a slow breath. Her wounds had long since healed, but the damn medics cornered her upon her return to the camp and forced the high command to give her a full five-day leave to recover. Er, as if she was a cub? And now she had soldiers from MP stationed at her tent, escorting her everywhere, including to feasting or taking a leak. Janine was infuriated. She checked up on Marty to cheer her up and ended up giving her a little talk that ended up being way more awkward because of these MP bastards. She wanted to allow Alpha to punish her for the failure that she had brought to the tribe, and she wanted to confess her fears to Lacerated One, but with her nannies around, it was impossible. Instead, here she was, stuck in her own tent. She tore off the bandages from her body, only for the MPs to report it to the medics, who came again and bandaged her head, recommending that Janine stop acting like a child. Oh, how she wanted to tear their guts out for this insolence. But no, she reined her in, remembering that every citizen serves the state in their own, even often misguided. Well, she can fuck right off or stay and wait until a new dawn for all I care. Janine said calmly, making a note where she stopped reading the reports about faulty gear. Uh, Chuck wasn't lying. The pack was on its last legs in terms of gear. Alpha's pack, Predig's pack, and Dragon's pack, as the most pristine and esteemed of all packs, have been receiving the resupplies ahead of others, and even they have started. Alas, there wasn't much she could do here. What she could do was visit every wounded member of her pack and write letters to the families of the dead, one final courtesy to remember their sacrifices. After apologizing for the mistake that she had committed years ago, Janine prepared training plans with Anissa's and Impatient One's help, contemplating the lack of resources to stage proper war games. Her pack performed admirably, but unless new duties were piled on them, the Wolfkins, be they male or female, liked to mess around. In a sense, Chalk's wish came true. The army had stopped camping in front of the capital for two days straight, allowing for the safe evacuation and treatment of wounded. Till Ingo has personally arrived in his strange floating ship, taking in the horribly maimed victims and the data cores. A few Eternians showed up, people from some news agency, like Parasites. They started crawling around the city and interviewing soldiers. Ravager herself was nowhere to be seen, disappearing in the darkness after her talk with First. Although some said that Ravager was occasionally seen at the top of the communicator tower, sleeping on the ruined throne. Thanks, Marco. Janine took the reports off his paws and read them briefly. Ignacy's operation was a success. The new limb works exactly like it should. Elzada pushed through her wound. As expected of her soldiers, food supplies were dwindling. Janine frowned and quickly assigned one of her packs to hunting duty. Plenty of insectoids in the nearby mountains. No need to rob the locals. Wait. She stopped her son before he could sneak out. Sit with me. Janine reached out in her sack with things finding a chocolate bar that she bought from Chuck and threw it to Marco to lighten up the mood. Chocolate was somewhat of a new rediscovery from the old world. It never really disappeared in Eterna, but both the Reclaimers and Oath Takers had their own share of problems before restoring ancient treats. But by the spirits? The happy look on Marco's snout as he closed his fangs on the chocolate bar was well worth it. Ravager is right. The old world may have destroyed itself, but its wonders must be rediscovered and the remains of its culture and history must be preserved for them to build a foundation for a better tomorrow. No longer did the reclaimers have to ration food, keeping half of their population living off of nutrient paste or mushrooms. According to the news, entire farmlands were created, filled with thousands upon thousands of Cusacks, providing the state with milk and meat. Black Earth was created, providing an abundance of bread and vegetables to the people. And if the news were to be believed, this was only the beginning. With more and more jobs opening up each day, the state has truly started to transform into something magnificent. How are things between you and your sisters? Everything is okay, no one is hurting you. Janine inquired, unsure how to ask him properly. 
better than okay, Marco replied, chomping on the treat. Impatient, one showed me how to make a noose to haul crates. Bogdan taught me how to clean armor with sand. Anissa taught me how to assemble a shard gun. And no girl has kicked me in the past few days. The army is amazing, mom. Way better than the pit. If only. Janine smiled sadly, remembering friends and comrades lost to war. No, Marco, an army usually means a war at some point. And wars are nothing but mindless pain, hate, rage, and death. Why are we fighting then? Can we live in our villages? His ears perked up. To liberate those who can't save themselves. Janine said, leaning back in her chair. I remember my first mission well. It was a simple mop-up operation. A group of slavers took over a settlement near our border. We sneaked to its edge, seeing how a group of people demanded freedom for their children. A shot in the knee was their answer, and then the leader of the slavers gave the command to string the wounded man for everyone to see what happens to those who incur her wrath. We struck at this very moment, Janine closed her eyes, remembering the first time she felt and overcame pure rage. We lost a brother and a sister on this night, and by the end of it, I tore the pleading slaver in two, feasting on her remains. The liberated settlement was well outside our borders. Had we not attacked, our kin would still be alive, Marco. But the settlers would suffer. He nodded, understanding what she meant. It's more than this. She released a claw, making a circle in the air. One of these safe settlers also later founded the largest medical clinic in the entire reclamation army at the time. The medics, who are responsible for saving our lives, studied in this very clinic. And had we left the slavers alone, they would have come to our lands eventually. So you see, what goes around comes around. Our sacrifices are not in vain. Got it. The cub nodded eagerly. Kill the bad people. Save the good ones. Wrong again. Janine laughed, reaching across the table to grab Marco under his armpits and sit him on her legs, just like back when he was a cub. Marco, the world is not black and white. Children who grew up under Malform's rule are they bad. Marco nodded seriously. They eat people, living people. They kill the helpless. And yet, Chak, whom your sister is probably fucking right now. Janine wanted to say and only smiled, understanding just how much this bothers her. She had always considered herself to be pretty open-minded, yet here she was, grumbling to herself like a shaman. Emin tells from their ranks, and the chocolate you ate came from a shop. His handling of logistics has provided us with working power armor, saving the lives of our kin. Marco, you need to understand why we, despite our wild nature, obey the military laws and accept prisoners. Children who grew up in the dark never saw light. Are we really that much better than them to sentence them to extinction just because they had the unfortunate fate of being born to some real mad scum? No, I'll kill anyone who steps up to me. True. But... At the same time, you never know how much a little mercy can fix in the long run. So keep the good people safe, strike down evil wherever you can, and show mercy when possible. When, not when possible. When the laws require it, when it does not go against the mission, and when it is reasonable, Janine corrected him, allowing an amber flame to burst anew in her eyes. What is the point of showing mercy to a slaver, a serial killer, or an equally mad bitch? Trial execution. Such a waste of everyone's time. Correct, Warlord. We are monsters and nothing more. Mercy is not ours to give, but we may as well try. For a monster conquers all in its path, its own nature included. A pleasant voice spoke behind her, and Janine froze for a second, stupefied at the fact that someone had sneaked upon her in her very tent. She saw long, elongated fingers moving forth from the corners of her field of vision, threatening to encompass her like spider legs. For a moment, Janine had the thought that Terrific was actually alive and that the woman had come to carry on her vengeance and bring down Janine for being an unworthy heir. Why else would her vision appear recently, messing up Janine's focus? But when a tent became lit with unnatural light, Janine breathed a sigh of relief. She turned around, covering Marco with her arms and looking into Ravager's face. Blessed Mother, she and Marco said in unison, admitting her superiority. Janine had put one paw over Marco's mouth to keep him safe from this terror and asked, Why you first told me something interesting, Janine? Ravager leaned closer, sniffing them, 
her eyes almost bigger than Marco's entire body. And she still grew. Everyone saw it after killing the Techno Queen Ravager. She had become a tiny bit. What her peak even was. Janine had trouble imagining. You held back against the sword saint. Willingly. My anger toward you was misplaced. And for this I wish to offer recompense. Do you think me weak? Janine growled. Jumping off the chair and hiding Marco behind herself. Blessed mother or not, I will not stand this humiliation. I am Janine. The one who became a warlord through her own rage and strengths. I have no need for power from you. I will never, ever become a skinwalker. For she expected to be struck down this instant. In her dreams, Janine has fantasized about how a gigantic claw is coming from one of the blessed mother's fingers and cleaving her from head to waist leaving two halves of her body struggling to keep a life before succumbing to the cold embrace of death, and then Ravager's jaws would come down, eating her remains. The Blessed Mother laughed, shattering the illusion. It was not a mad laugh, and neither was this a mockery. Ravager sounded like a lady from high society who just heard a wondrous joke from her cavalier. No, this path is not for you, warlord. I remember you now, Janine Ravager's eyes, locked at her, thrice. You made the right choice in my presence. Once when you held back an urge to strike at the angel, the second time you stopped my madness and saved lives, and finally you showed enough wisdom to go easy on our future, Ravager breathed out a cloud of steam into Janine's face and moved her snout against Janine's head, leaving a smelly scent mark. Welcome to the inner circle, warlord. Divider will come in the morning and we are to meet him. Are you free now? I still need to examine my son's knowledge? Janine replied stubbornly, cursing that the commander had ruined a moment to speak with Marco heart to heart. Do so then. We have time aplenty. Ravager pushed herself to the side of the tent, nearly filling it with her body. Janine had quite a number of things in her tent, including a leather jacket left by Terrific now serving as a relic to remind her of her former warlord. A chest filled with glasses, a souvenir presented to her by the National Museum, for rescuing precious artifacts from the raiders, Janine had no real use for them and was afraid of breaking the nice-looking things. So she never drank from them, only occasionally taking them out to polish, training her fingers to be gentle with things. Aside from that, there was a harness with her armor, a weapon rack, her other trophies, and her personal belongings. Ravager, in theory, should have smashed them all with her bulk, yet somehow, almost unnaturally, the woman fit in the tent taking just enough space without ruining everything or sending Janine and Marco flying. Her amber eyes kept looking at the mother and her cub as Janine started asking Marco's question about the tribe's history, teaching him what she knew about the foundation of the state, outside of the pits. The job of educating her son had fallen to her, and Janine will be damned if she allows Ravager to stop her from doing her duty. Ravager only looked, never saying a thing. Her heartbeat sounded like a drum beating slowly but steadily, causing Janine to wonder how the Blessed Mother could sneak up on anyone with this bombastic sound in her chest. The breath coming from her mouth resembled the heat from a furnace, reminding Janine of the pleasant desert around their village. You have a question. Ravager snapped, catching Marco's glance. Ask away already. The smell of your curiosity and fear is infuriating, boy. Youth should not hold back curiosity. Remember it once and for all. Sorry, Marco tried to bow, but a tap of a gigantic finger made the tent tremble, prompting the MP to step inside. Ravager ignored them, looking at the cub and demanding an answer. Your fur, Marco, has finally found the courage to... Is it true that it can bisect an arm? Ravager blinked, and all aggression was washed away from her eyes. What came to her eyes instead looked like cheeky fun. Ravager extended her arm toward Marco. Touch it, cub, she commanded, and Marco obeyed, first pressing one finger, and then his full palm. Soft. Like silk, he whispered in surprise, and Ravager laughed, filling Janine's heart with relief. Sharp fur, divine air. Blessed mother. Ravager shook her head, putting it back on her paws. Seriously, who spread these rumors about me? No, cub. I am neither divine nor a mother and certainly not a hedgehog. I am Ravager, a monster, and nothing more. Then let me talk with my son in peace. Janine barked, waving the MP away. 
She put aside the terminal, ending the lesson. She remembered the look on Marty's face when she had to kill her daughter. Janine remembered her own beautiful girls and boys, holding their stillborn bodies in her paws or coming to pits just to find them dead. Death in battle, death from malfunction, death from rivalry, death during a domination, death from old age, death from calling, death, death, death. She got fed up with deaths. Marco, are your knees still hurting? Janine asked her son. No. Well, they bother me a little, but I am on my legs all day. Marco jumped off the chair doing a few squats to show her that he was okay. But she saw. A minor tremble when his knees bent. Just a minor flaw, but it was all because she couldn't bear him in peace, like a proper mother. Marco Janine forced herself to sound kind and warm, unwilling to scare her son. How would you like to become an exile? Mom, warlord? Marco stumbled, fiddling with his beret in his paws. Have I done something bad? If so, I fix it. Please don't throw me out. I'll... I will never throw you out, Marco. You are now and forever, my son. I love you. She wanted to say it, but stopped herself. No sign of weakness in front of family. She is a mountain, existing to protect the tribe from raging winds, and a mountain is no emotional weakness. I wasn't a perfect mother. I hadn't given you enough vitality. I could not give you sisters to keep you safe in the pit. But you took me out there. You saved me, Mom. She stopped Marco's outburst with a raised paw. But I can give you a life worth living. Janine continued as if nothing had happened. Marco, Dad, and I had been saving some tokens. I'm not exactly poor. You know, I can ask for help and buy you a house in the Corelands. You can go into an actual school and live a normal, peaceful life. A life that was promised to us by the dynast. She saw a hesitation in his eyes and quickly continued. And you won't be alone in our day and age. The net has been expanded greatly. Each time you want, you could contact us anytime. Well, aside from times when we are in battle, and leave you fight for my safety alone. He asked bluntly, Marco, you'll die here. Your brothers will die. Your sisters will die. A day will come and I myself will die in some ditch, forgotten and alone. Janine tried to reason with him, to scare him. There is no noble demise in battle. All the songs, all the legends being told by the shamans, they're about the dead kin who never had peace in their lives. And death is almost always ugly and painful on the battlefield or instant if you're lucky. In the core land, you can start a family and become happy. Actually happy. Just imagine seeing your own kids around and having no fear of seeing them dead before you. But this will mean leaving you here alone, Marco said sadly. He shook his head and looked at her with a newfound determination in his amber eyes. No, mother, I am a wolfkin. It is our duty to serve as shields for the meek. I may be weak and frail, but I will never leave you and my kin here all alone. Right choice, Cubby, Ravager, chuckled, flashing her eyes. Monsters belong with monsters. Would it kill you to shut up? An urge to grab her axe and bury it between these enormous eyes followed a flash of hatred for the Blessed Mother. She restrained her emotions, standing up and putting on the military coat. Ravager was not at fault here. It was Janine who failed to persuade her little boy to choose a happier path in life. Should you ever change your mind, Marco, the offer is always here for as long as I live. For now, go and have a nap. Lead on, bless a mother, and I will follow. Chapter 8. Grounded. Ravager led Janine to the south of the military camp, stopping right after the outer minefield. A few patrol parties and recon teams noticed them with surprise, inquiring about their purpose here. But Ravager only sat still, looking to the south. Here Janine was forced to explain their reason for being here. The two of them ended up waiting for hours in total silence, standing still like statues on the windy plains. If this was Ravager's petty revenge for making her wait, or if this is how she usually goes on about her things, Janine could not say. After four hours of waiting, other warlords from the first generation joined them. Welcome to the inner circle, Dragona, clad in full power armor, gave a simple nod to Janine. You owe me a coat, Alpha growled, looking ridiculous in her cargo pants and a white shirt that quickly turned black in the acrid winds. Alpha sniffed Janine over and left a scent mark. Took you long enough. I'll aim to be better. Janine shook Alpha's wrist, making sure not to touch her incredibly sharp claws, capable of shredding armor and bodies with the merest touch. 
And uh, can I pay you for the coat? No, give me a new one. Zero jumped to her necks encased in her highly advanced pitch black power armor with an elongated helmet that had neither lenses nor an opening for a mouth. Janine saw her face once when she and Alpha had invited her over to tell the truth behind the origins of the wolf tribe. And there Janine understood why Zero never took off her helmet. She and Ravager were one and the same, two sisters in blood grown in the same vats, indistinguishable in looks. Only their size and characters were different. Just like with Ravager, no scar ever lingered on Zero's body. When Dominator punched a hole through her, the Warlord regenerated her lost organs in under a week. So close was their likeness that some soldiers started worshipping Zero as a blessed mother, leading Zero to forever hide her face behind a helmet in public to make everyone treat her as her own person. Congratulation. Zero warmly said, grabbing Janine by her paw and taking her into a spin like a young and expressive girl. Where Ravager was all about doom and gloom, Zero has always been friendly with everyone and looked into the future with hope, only ever darkening in mood should someone mention Eterna. Her power armor was a masterpiece of technology. Every joint worked soundlessly, and its alloy provided enough protection to withstand the fiercest explosions and fastest projectiles. Zero would always be in the back of the field of battle, hiding behind her black cloak and firing her rifle at the enemy's leaders. I always knew Big Sis would start admitting new gens closer to her eventually. Sucks it's not my girl, Ygrite chuckled, drawing closer. A wolfkin, easily as tall as a warlord, waltzed in behind her, looking at Janine inquisitively. Welcome to the circle. Heard that, Kaliza? Janine outsped you? Adorable. The wolfkin replied casually. You are not a warlord, Janine said icily, hugging Ygrite. Kaleasa smelled like a wolf hag, but she was huge. Easily a warlord material. Address your leader with respect befitting her status before I beat it into you. You can try. Kalisa rolled her eyes, catching Ygrite's look, and lowered herself to one knee. Warlord. Uh, so this is why you constantly drag the girl around. Janine chose to ignore the implied disrespect. Small wonder Igret has been so stressed lately. The girl was, what, 16 or 17 years old? And is already prime material. Rapid growth without proper experience, backed by countless easy wins. Too valuable for the tribe to be broken, maimed, or killed. Too volatile to be left alone. Yes, had Janine been in Igrita's shoes, she would have chained the idiot child to herself until she got tempered enough to survive. Come to think of it, Terrific has allowed Janine to get away with tons of weird shit back in the past. Janine openly challenged the warlord several times, refusing to accept her cruelty against the civilians, and lived to tell the tale. All because Terrific had seen a talent in Janine and nurtured it in the beast of her cruel character. She even gave her a pep talk once when the young scout fell down. Keep your protege on a leash, he grites, before someone cuts her down to size, snapped Ashbringer, coming closer. She said nothing to Janine, simply grabbing her in a bear hug. Janine returned the favor, matching her muscles against Ashbringer's, with a grunt of admiration, Ashbringer let go of Janine. Blessed be, sister. Last rated one said simply going to stand by Ravager's side. Always knew you had it in you. Prade gave Janine a pat. Saw your girls recently. Onyxia whispered in Janine's ears, catching the warlord by surprise. Out of all warlords, Onyxia looked the most unique, beating even Alpha to the punch. Her body looked like a dark shape, always shimmering in the sunlight and sometimes becoming translucent to the eye, tall as zero. Her fur, her skin, even her palate. Everything was shrouded in darkness, leaving just two amber irises gleaming dimply in the pools of darkness. Evil tongues whispered that the woman existed in several worlds at once. Hence, Janine always dismissed these rumors. Dracona hadn't had any cubs yet, but no one ever whispered behind her back about it. When Onyxia spoke, everyone heard two voices. One that sounded unpleasant to everyone's ears, like a knife slicing against unbreakable bones, and another that was a normal whisper following the initial words. How do they stack up against my Angie, huh? The wolfkin behind the shape of darkness bowed, dropping to one knee and bearing her neck to Janine. With a pristine white mane of hair coming from her head all the way to her waist and bulging muscles barely hidden by a greenish overall, Angie looked stunningly beautiful to the eye. 
they'd lose. Janine grinned, patting the respectful wolf hag. You grew up quite a nice replacement, Onyxia. Many healthy cubs to you, girl. Thank you, warlord. Angie replied in a serene tone. Thank you, warlord. Bootlicker, Kalawaisa mockingly grumbled. In the next moment, she gasped in pain, holding her sides as Janine's elbow got planted straight into her solar plexus, sending the woman back a few steps. Kaleza had to release her claws to arrest her movement, letting out a low growl of infuriation. You are wide open and too slow for your temper, girly. Don't drop your guard around those you wish to insult. Lest you'll gain a whole swath of new scars, Janine advised Kaloisa, not really feeling anger. It happened sometimes. When a sister grew in strength too quickly, her judgment would often get clouded. No biggie. Egrite will turn this rough gem into a diamond, eventually. Slow? Wide open? A fire burned in Kaladis's strikingly deep amber eyes. She has let go of her sides, making an accidental-looking crisscross strike with both forearms forward that drove Janine a step back with sheer might behind her. clenched her fists, breathing hard, and looked at Janine with a mix of excitement and eagerness. Why won't you show me how it's done, Granny? Sorry, I agree. Janine thought, bulging her muscles. This wasn't a challenge, not really. There was no hatred, rage, or anything similar behind Kaloisa's eyes. Her scent also betrayed just a desire for a brawl, rather than a dominance. The youngster wanted to test her fangs. Yet Janine has noticed the hungry look in Ashbringer's eyes. If she steps down, Ashbringer will step forward and maul the fool. Stay calm, wolf hag. The voices whispered behind the woman, and she froze, feeling a paw on her shoulder and a black claw on her neck. Onyxia's smile grew wider, showing pitch black fangs in her mouth as she leaned against the wolf hag's body, putting her snout on Kaliza's shoulder. There is no shame in being pointed out for a mistake. You easily lose track of your surroundings, own your mistake, and let's not look like fools before our comrades, shall we? The claw pushed, piercing the skin, and Kaliza shook from an unnatural cold entering her neck. I obey, warlord. Kaleza barred her neck, and Janine took the invitation, asserting her dominance by biting the woman and pushing Kaleza to her knees. Out of respect for Egrit, Janine refrained from leaving any scars on her successor, only showing might rather than drawing blood. At attention. Alpha barked, and everyone immediately stopped bickering. The ground beneath their feet trembled, followed by the noise of falling avalanches from nearby mountains. Soon after, Hundreds of engines chimed in, and through the thick poisonous clouds whirling across the plains, the wolfkin saw lights coming from projectors. The first to break from the clouds were the light vehicles carrying the recon team, followed by rows of heavy tanks and troop carriers. Rows of soldiers wearing power armor marched behind, like on parade, holding their rifles to their chests. Where the third army had three primary colors. Black for the wolf tribe, white for the order, and finally browned for their troops, the second army proudly wore the silver color in honor of their mighty commander. Their tanks and vehicles were in pristine condition, unmarked by bullet holes and free of repair scars. Their armor and weapons came directly from the foundries of the core lands instead of being produced in the newly conquered lands. Most of the soldiers serving in the third army were children of the former raiders and barbarians, people of all sizes, quite often changed by the remains of the glow at the state's outskirts. Her soldiers from the second army were volunteers and recruits from the core lands, brave men and women leaving the safety of civilization to bring peace and order to those lacking it. Their discipline and steady approach put even the third army to shame, but there was no arrogance behind their movement, just calm assurance that the allies have come and now everything will be all right. Brought what they lacked in experience, they made up for in dedication. Three crawlers came into sight, Three massive behemoths carrying the rabbit emblem of the second army, followed by rows of trucks carrying fresh supplies, food and medicine to support the army's advance. Drones, a recent addition to the military forces, flew above the armed forces, mapping the area and alerting incoming troops about any potential hazards. Some of the drones carried small caliber energy weapons beneath their round forms, ready to add their fury to any struggle that might befall their allies. Ravager spread her arms, standing on two feet. Immediately, 
The sword saints came from within the camp, standing to the left of the Blessed Mother, while Juni and the others stood to her right, leaving Angie and Kaloisa behind. Jernine caught Bertruda's look, but ignored it, only giving a single amiable nod to enforce an image of unity. Fuck the ice, boys. Never again will Janine allow herself to be tangled in any mess involving them. Kristobo Bolashnikov, a tall and broad man wearing a brown captain's uniform and a rebreather in his mouth to withstand the harsh air of the surrounding lands, joined them. A small entourage of officers and bodyguards flanked the man as he stopped next to Ravager, saluting the incoming forces. Put on the helmet, Kristobo, before you burn your lungs, Ravager hissed. It's fine, Commander, the highly tanned man responded, shaking when the tip of Ravager's claws left a bloody mark on the back of his neck. Janine barely saw the Blessed Mother's movement. To the eyes of the normies, she must have never moved an inch, still standing with her arms widely spread in greetings. You have cubs back home, idiot. Ravager smirked, noticing the captain's widened eyes. With a trembling hand, the man took out the rebreather. Congratulations. You are now a new breed. No poison can harm you. Ignore the voice. It'll disappear in a couple of months. Ravager herself was strong enough for many soldiers to revere her as someone mystical and divine. Seeing her collapsing down a mountain filled people's hearts with nothing short of pure awe. But there was one thing that Janine had always been afraid of when it came to Ravager, power grafting. At the touch of her claw, Ravager could give a person power once per day. Sometimes she could control this process and give it the exact power she wanted, but most often than not, it was a lottery, and sometimes, very rarely, it could trigger an involuntary change into a skinwalker. Greetings, comrades. Ravager roared to the incoming soldiers. The corners of her mouth twitched, trying to form a strained, warm smile. The recon vehicles stopped, and soldiers roared back greetings, sounding genuinely happy. We thank you for your loyal support. Now with you here, the Third Army is finally able to march on anew. Greetings to you too, Commander Ravager. A pleasant voice boomed across the plains, and finally Devourer showed himself from within the clouds. A giant slithered forward, whose body could stretch all the way to the sky, longer than a crawler, his immense weight leaving new tracks in the stone ground as Devourer slithered toward Ravager circling around his forces. Once he was a man, born after the extinction to a normal family, According to the official history, as a child, Devourer became exposed to the glow and his skin came off his body, revealing scales beneath. He was one of the first new breeds to join the state, right after Outsider and Ravager. Back then, he was just a, a rival to Alpha, having a similar build, a mouth filled with fangs and tough claws on his fingers. His fierce nature and indiscriminate eating habits had earned him the name Devourer. Atop his bike, Devourer led his forces to victory like some barbarian, and then Devourer changed. His arms merged with his body, his legs joined together into a single tail, and he himself grew in stature, and grew, and keep growing, becoming larger than most vehicles in the state. His jaws could stretch to an unimaginable size, swallowing Sand Reaper's whole. The sound of rattles at the end of his tail sounded like an artillery barrage, instilling fear in the enemy before his massive body came crushing down, opening wide holes in any and all enemy's positions. His scales became tougher, his eyes could spy satellites in orbit, and the weave of his coils could put an entire brigade to sleep. And above all of this, Devorer has become a match for Ravager. The two of them sparred with each other, leaving behind ruined mountains and newly created canyons with variable success. The sheer stubbornness of the commander of the second army had earned him the respect of the wolf tribe. Brave men and women of the third, I greet you all, Devor said, raising before them but positioning his enormous body in such a way to prevent his shadow from falling on troops. Through your sacrifice, an entire city has been saved. Bravo Ravager. Glory to the third. For glory to the third. His army roared. Devorah let the thundering shout subside and extended the tip of his tail to Ravager, allowing her paw to grasp it for a shake. His snake eyes found Janine, and a warm smile came to his lips. Ah, oh, Janine, it's been years since I last saw you. You have become a warlord? Well earned, I said. It warms my heart to see you in good health, Commander Devourer. 
The tip of his tail stopped her when she attempted to bow. I will have none of this on this joyous day, warlord. Just call me devourer. How are the kids? All is well, I trust. Just fine, thank you. Janine forced a smile, hoping that devourer would finally look away. She felt herself drowning in his eyes. Her very soul was about to leave her body and be snatched away by these gigantic pools. Janine worked with Devourer once to take down an irrecoverable apocalypse class. Against all rules and commands, Devourer came upon the girl they had been ordered to kill and talked with her, trying to convince the kid to step down. Upon hearing that she wasn't needed by anyone, Devourer only nodded, and his tail came down, preventing the apocalypse. Superb, simply superb. Zero Alpha. First, Camellia. His eyes moved to look at the others. My dear friends, I have missed you so much. We will speak at length later, but for now I must steal Ravager away for a time. We have some matters to discuss. But don't think I am leaving you dry, my friends. I brought enough refreshments for all. Today we celebrate our reunion. Noticing the captain's movement, the commander shifted his head, lowering himself down. And of course everything mine is yours too. Resupplies, medications, and personnel. We will help however we can. Please give orders to my troops as if they were yours, Captain Cristobo. I thank you for the courtesy, your lordship. The captain fell on one knee, only to be prompted to stand by the tip of the tail. For a human capable of leveling mountains, Devourer could be surprisingly gentle when he wanted to. Janine with me, Ravager growled, leaving toward the mountains on the west. The warlord followed, surprised at the sudden call. Previously, Cristobo or Alpha would accompany Ravager during negotiations between the commanders. For what possible reason could the Blessed Mother need her? Ravager and Devour travel leisurely across the land, forcing Janine to run to keep up with their simple movements. A hill, a sticking out stone, or a steel pipe? Anything that ended up in front of Devourer had become a paved road, being bulged down and compressed by his incomprehensible bulk. Ravager followed suit, punching a hole in anything in her path, rather than simply jumping over it. Devourer soon shifted his body, coiling to the side of Ravager, and leaving her exposed to his troops. The commander picked up the game, standing on two legs and walking with her paws behind her back. A show of solidarity for the lower rank. The illusion has been shattered after they traveled ten kilometers. Ravager leaned upon the mountain, and Devourer hissed, casting his shadow onto her, dancing with his upper body. It took a moment for Janine to understand that the commander was shaking with rage. Are you trying to upstage me? He thundered, the pleasantries and warmth gone from his voice, leaving barely hidden hatred. His voice echoed from the mountain range, resonating with his movements. I simply followed the dinosaur's order, Devourer. Ravager released her claws, licking something off of them. A nod of her head made Janine step aside. The bitch was a threat, now there is no bitch. Aside from one I see before my very eyes, he struck. Janine had seen city walls fall, some crushed by her own axe. She had seen entire mountain ranges bathed in flame and collapsing under the weight of an intense artillery barrage. What she did not see was a mountain disappearing from her field of vision, and Devourer did just that. His lower half moved so fast that her eyes simply failed to record the movement. Only her eardrums pulsated with pain because of the sound wave created when the tail connected with Ravager's chin, causing the mountain behind her to shake and Ravager herself to spit out blood on the ground. Verdinus gave us the order to take the city together. His voice silenced the fallen avalanche, and a single move of his tail beat aside the stones that were about to bury Janine, leaving Ravager to fend for herself. You are to wait for my arrival, for your fault for being so slow, weakling. A splash of blood has landed between Devara's eyes. He froze giant eyelids, closing the massive pool serving him as eyes. Harding the rattling sound of Devourer's tail and seeing the fur raising on the back of Ravager's neck, Janine lunged forward, landing between the commanders and throwing herself on the knees. Blessed Mother, Commander Devourer, cease this aggression. Our armies stand near, extending a hand to each other. It won't do for either of you to shatter our sisterhood out of pure childishness. I'm dead, Nine decided, feeling their aggression focused on her. May as well go all out. Yes. For what reasons do any of you act like a cub denied her first treat? 
Commander Devourer, your genius has seen the creation of some of the greatest cities in the state. Why should you bother about being denied taking down one minor shack, unworthy to be called even a settlement? Commander Ravager, I understand your dedication to keeping our allies safe, but Commander Devourer has a point. If the Dynas gave the order for us to work together, we should have been working together. She felt their looks. Two godlike beings angry at the ant busting in their business. Janine could almost feel Ravager's lips spreading out, showing deadly fangs ready to be buried into her skin for the crime of taking a lead. Devourer's silent disapproval was just as palpable, but she didn't care. Soldiers have to see their leaders acting as one, never attacking each other in the open. What was allowed for warlords and lower ranks wasn't allowed for the Blessed Mother or Devourer, and by the spirit, she will make them see the reason or perish trying. Anin, Ravager said, putting one paw on the head, calming herself. Our duty demands the utmost sacrifice from us all. Oh, be silent for a moment, Nat, Devourer hissed, taking a deep breath that felt like a hurricane. He closed his eyes, looking calmly at Janine. On principle, I do agree with you, Warlord. However, there is a bigger issue at play here. Do you see these things? Devourer's head came down, stopping before Ravager. He turned his head to the left and right, looking with unblinking eyes at the commander. Or do you know what they are called? Eyes. Anyone with eyes can see that you are reflexing, lashing out on everything and everyone in your path in a misguided hope to get destroyed, I believe. How dare you, Ravager's muscles bulged, forcing the skin on her arms legs and neck to expand like balloons. Stay silent, I said. The teacher ain't finished yet. Sure, I would have wanted nothing more than to see your wreck get its comeuppance, but alas, the men and women who are so foolishly given under your command deserve none of this shit. Look at the state of your forces, open your eyes, and look- Ravager. Power armor is in disrepair. You warlords wear some rags. Medicine is in short supply, wounded and dying everywhere and soldiers are forced to forage like some marauders? Where are your supply lines? Look around and see what you are causing for the people under your command. Insolent child, devourer inhaled the acrid air and rose in the air. I have no idea what the fuck has happened in your life to make you like this, and frankly, I do not care. The past had come and gone. Only now and the future matter. But if you want to act like a petulant child in need of a punishment, fine. I'll treat you like one. I had a little talk with Dynas, and you are now grounded, bitch. You may speak. What do you mean by this, Devera? Ravager asked carefully. Why the second army, the entire army, mind you, is to locate in Hustad. It is time for you to see what you have been helping build up. A hint of genuine warmth came into Devorer's tone, replaced by a mocking tune nearly as fast as the third army is to help the regional defense forces keep peace resupply, and refill their numbers. And you are to rest. No killing allies, no prowling into the other regions to hunt or fight. Just stay, sleep, or finally start acting like an adult and try to educate yourself to become a person worth looking up to. You can even call me. I am a good listener and won't judge truly. You have no right doing this to me, Devar. You owe me for Haustad and the other cities. I had supported you. I helped, however... Ravager stepped forward looking madly at the gigantic serpentine body before her, and Janine saw pure fear in the eyes of the Blessed Mother. The fear is not caused by devour, but rather by something entirely else. And for this, I am infinitely grateful to you, Ravager. Yet my debt to you does not absolve me of allowing you to grind your army into nothing to satisfy your pathetic desire to be hurt. Sort yourself out and leave the war to the professionals. Professionals? Ha. Huh. Kujak shit. Had you been here, the entire city would have gone the way of the old world. You need me, Ravager pleaded, pressing both paws to her chest. I... this is all I am good for. First learn something else. Devourer said, mercilessly, You don't get it. You haven't seen what people do in these regions. You have no idea how they operate and what they can do to your soldiers. People are the same everywhere. Just because fools here take pride in their brutality does not make them anything special. Civilization has always trumped barbarians in the end. Devere cut her off, smirking smugly. Take Crimson Plague, for example, and his fire cult. They have been burning hundreds each month, 
raiding and pillaging everything in sight. So I have burned Crimson Plague and made his forces bend their knees on the way here, all without a single shot. But Ravager sucked her claws like a cub, drooling uncontrollably on the ground. Crimson Plague is immune to flame. Her flame is not the only thing that can set your body alight, my friend. Poison will do just that. Specifically, a very carefully delivered poison into his food by my agents. This led to him feeling a searing pain in his entire body, rolling on and screaming for mercy. Since he denied it to others, it too was denied to him, and he perished ignobly by slicing off his throat after reaching a climax of suffering. The commander let out a laugh, focusing once more on Ravager. I am Devourer, the one who will become a Grand Commander of the Reclamation Army, the one who was born to command our forces and bring the will of the Dynas to all corners of the planet. No one is my equal, not outsider, and certainly not you. I will save humanity and bring it under the Dynas rule. Tales of my glory will ring forevermore. Now go and sit on the sidelines and watch how the true professionals prosecute the reconquest swiftly and efficiently. Devourer turned aside, stopping at the last moment to look at the Blessed Mother. And never again dare to steal my thunder, Ravager. Oh, and Janine, sorry for the pompous speech. I kind of looked a bit too full of myself. Say, you want to serve under someone competent by chance. My loyalty is to the Blessed Mother and to the tribe, Commander Janine responded. The Blessed Mother delivered us from demise and to her, and the state we owe our very existence. Act this thinks. Oh well, let's go back, everyone. Drinks are on me, the one who falls. Challenge accepted, devourer. Ravager said. How are you? Janine asked, coming to Martishkina. She wanted to ask, you know, are you okay? But that question felt hollow even for her. Marty wasn't okay. It was as clear as day the warlord had ordered her pack to board the crawler, forcing herself to joke and brag. Her laugh sounded strained even to Janine's ears, who followed after Marty Shkina the moment their pack had found some peace. I have no idea. Marty Shkina stood before the guardrails at the top of the main crawler's spire, looking at the moving ground beneath. She raised her trembling paws. I feel cold and void. Pain too. Your daughter, Janine, stated, coming to stand next to her. Marty lied to her earlier, claiming that everything was fine. The crawler was preparing to move and now took a circle around the city. So vast was the machine that making a simple turn in place needed a far greater berth than the small place could have provided without risking the soldiers of the second army. Laughter and cheering filled the air. Following the advance of the second army came great vets with nutrient paste, hermetically sealed. Devourer rarely lived up to his name in the current day and age, and preferred a regular cuisine, bringing his own food from the core lands. And along with building-sized armored vats came sealed bottles with strong alcohol. Champions of both armies took to the challenge, and now the ground has been littered with drunken bodies, leaving just two fighters to keep on fighting, surrounded by the awe of soldiers from both sides. Ravager and Devourer were gulping down bottle after bottle, threatening to empty the stock of the second army, the Blessed Mother's belly had bulged forth, creating the undignified image of a fat barrel of flesh. Still she persisted, somehow managing not to burst while keeping up with a vastly more gigantic opponent, her body digesting the alcohol almost as fast as it was coming. I can't stop thinking about the last battle, about my cubs, Johnny. Martishkina forced the words out of herself. I promised my soulmate to look after the cubs, and they all... I outlived them all. You kept your promise. Janine put her elbows on the rails. I have seen your granddaughters back in the village. Have I? A flash of anger ran through the amber eyes. Have I really, Janie? A moment doesn't pass without me thinking about all those times I failed her as a mother. I knew of the possibility of my taint in her blood, yet I admitted, I fucking admitted my beautiful princess into the pack. I could have kicked her out and sent her far away to live safely as a hermit away from danger, away from war, away from... From making her own decisions, Janine reached out to grab Marty by the shoulder, turning the woman toward herself. You can't live your life for her, Marty. I... She felt something in her throat and bit it down, allowing words to flow quickly and passionately. There isn't a day that I haven't thought of my cubs and where I went wrong with them. Each morning I am afraid of never seeing them again. 
This is why I tried to push some of them away to safety. You too. Marty smiled. I've saved some tokens, offering her a place at university and an apartment in the Corelands. Janine finished for her, and the two women let out a grieving laugh, embracing each other in a hug. Like in their childhood, Janine found her snout on Marty's shoulder and Marty Shkina's snout on her own. It's a most fucked up feeling, Marty, to know how to save yet having to let go, she whispered. But we can't enslave our cubs. We can't just force them to act as we want their entire lives. All we can do is guide and support them, whatever the situation, and always be in their lives when they need us. And you did that. You have never abandoned your family. You watched over your cubs at every step of the way, and they have lived their lives as they saw fit. It's time to let them go and live up. It's hard, Janie. Marty replied in a strangled voice, and Janine felt something wet on her chin. It will never get easier. Not to my knowledge. Janine felt water in her eyes as images of her dead sons and daughters flooded in, threatening to overwhelm her. So we have to live and walk our own road, getting new scars and healing, learning how to be happy once more, Marty. One day we'll see our families again, but for now, we have to live for the ones who remain, Marty. Our strength can save thousands, and our pain is not special. They kept hugging and grieving together, while the contest kept going, filling the air with laughter at Chapter 9, sniffing, snarling, and arguing. Why are you lot here? Janine asked bluntly. She stood in the crawler's storage compartment, filled with empty crates. The smells of oils and the remains of energy cells gave her a general idea of what this place was used for back when the army had enough resources to fill it up. The captain has ordered the army to take the barest minimum from their allies, unwilling to deprive the second of the precious supplies, and Ravager has supported him in spite of Devourer's arguing. Their journey back home was uneventful, packs were grumbling, confined in small quarters, Fights and domination sparked at the slightest provocation, leading to the military police being pissed even more than usual. Tranquilized darts and electric shots were flying left and right. Wolf hags were coming along the corridors, beating down any disturbance of peace, and the warlords drew lots, trying to win in a lottery for today's patrol. Janine ignored it. Much to her pack's disappointment, she felt the eagerness to leave the steel coffin in their eyes, and shared their desire to hunt small game and bathe all, all her worries in the insectoid hemolymph. But they were coming into civilized lands now, and they had to look the part. With brutal efficiency, the warlord started enforcing her plan. Each morning, she would call her entire pack, checking up on ill or wounded members. After that, she allowed her wolf hags and scouts to carry on with the training courses. And right after that, Janine sat down with her entire pack and made them read about the core land's history, inviting the crawler's officer to lead the studies. She added new rules, defecation outside the restroom, 15 lashes. Insulting the crew, 30 lashes. Failure to answer the quiz at the end of each study, a single lash. Wolfkins were hardy creatures, but even they learned to be afraid of lashes after Janine took it upon herself to deliver the punishment. A hit of the chained whip in her arm easily pierced the skin, leaving lacerated wounds behind, ensuring that no lower rank could enjoy this pain. After three days of strict enforcing of new rules, Janine has earned herself a seething hatred from the medics, who had to treat the wounded, a begrudging respect from the Alpha Pack, who were famous for their iron discipline and a lot of scarred bodies who are now huffing and scrubbing on the lectures, taking notes in a fear of receiving a bad grade. Upon seeing that Warlord Alpha had copied Janine's methods, a spark of pride shot across her pack, and for the past two days, Janine hadn't had any need to use her whip much to the medic's delight. Thankfully, the ice boys have stayed in their quarters, only coming out to partake during feeding times, when both warlords and sword saints could enforce Ravager's order of not engaging in combat amongst each other. With free time on her paws, Janine had called Marco for a personal lecture only to find the compartment they had chosen for themselves cramped. Ignacy bogged an impatient one, and Anissa, both of whom had finally healed enough to sit comfortably after all the lashes they got for the poor grades, showed up. Elzada, the only scout who performed excellently with her studies, had come with them, bringing a notepad with herself. The scout with the metal leg and artificial lung seated herself next to Ignacy, 
almost pushing him off the crate with a casual movement of her hip. And most annoyingly, Kalawisa and Angie showed up, with Kalawisa angrily sitting behind everyone and Angie coming along with Marco. I'm still on leave. Ignacy responded, putting his slightly oversized metal arm on his knee and using a screwdriver to tinker with his limb. His new arm still had the metal color, but her son had plans to color it black, eventually. Bogdan admitted to Janine that Ignacy had already disassembled and reassembled his new arm at least once, always shifting something in it. Might as well learn something new. Then Ignacy had promised to look at my leg. Elzada purred, hitting Ignacy's side with her hip once more. On her request, a set of steel claws were added to the new, inelegant but sturdy toes of her artificial leg. She grinned and flashed her natural claws in front of his nose. The claws that were installed on my leg come out a bit, slowly. Maybe we should check them in my den. Why wait? Janine wanted to slap herself across the snout, seeing how her oblivious boy had dropped on one knee and taken a flashlight in his paw before examining Elzada's knee. He whistled, took some instruments from his jacket, and started working on the metal leg. Kaloisa and Anissa showed no such mercy. One let out a mocking laugh, kicking Elzada in the back, and the other giggled like a girl, helping the scout sit upright. His son still had a handsome appearance, even with a metal arm. Ignacy's fur was always combed free of any parasites, and in his experiments with water and how it affected his prosthetic hand, his fur looked pristine, smelling of cheap shampoo. Barely any scars covered his hide, hinting at his sensible nature and ability to survive without trouble in the tribe. It's no wonder that the girl has fallen for him. Elzada herself looked none the worse for wear. Her shattered arm rested in a sling, requiring her to ask for Anissa's help to dress herself for a while. The skin in place where the metal limb connected with the flesh was clean off of all fur, but a few new hairs of darkness have already started growing up anew. A tight bandage was wrapped around her body, hidden by the jacket, hiding the ugly wound marking the place where a new lung was installed into her body. When Janine came to apologize to her for breaking her legs, the scout looked more embarrassed than angry. The moment the medics allowed her to walk around, the scout rushed to impatient one, confessing her sin and begging for forgiveness for joining the Union of Flesh. Impatient one gave the scout some penance but refused to share details with Janine, only promising that this was nothing that could affect the scout's combat abilities. Huh. The wolfkin mumbled, tinkering with the sharp-looking claws on the metal foot. It looks like they were restrained on purpose. Look here, once I remove this and this. I literally have no idea what else to do. Elzado whispered to Anissa, rolling her eyes, and the other woman grimaced sympathetically. Ignacy likes pawn cakes? Bogdan advised, leaning against the crate behind him and earning himself a confused look from his brother. I am here for moral support, warlord. There is no need for any payment. Oh, but I like cooking. Dad always told me I have a knack to... I refuse to fail my studies again. Studies or no, I am a shaman, and on my honor, I will meet any challenge head-on and win. Impatient one cut them off mid-sentence, slamming her paws against the crate. Well, Ygrite gave me an order to stop beating the crap out of my family and get myself useful. I tried the kitchen and infirmary, but no one had any need for me, so... Kaliza started explaining, leaning back on her crate. The girl was big. Janine was willing to admit that. Aside from Janine, Kalaisa and Angie were the only wolfkins here who were solidly taller than three and a half meters, standing half a head taller than either Anissa or Impatient. Both had muscles that looked like ropes, but where Angie sat relaxed, smiling and gesturing about something with Marco, Kalaisa looked nervous and on edge all the time. Angie's gorgeous white mane of hair was tied up into countless braids, while Kalaisa allowed her short and messy hair to lie loose. Where Angie preferred to wear a pristine button-down white shirt and elegant green pants, Kalaisa wore torn cargo pants and a dirty-looking sleeveless shirt. Can't imagine why. Bogdan laughed, shrinking down at the sound of claws snapping behind his back. What was that, Flea? Speak up. I can't hear you. Going mute on me all of a sudden. Stay that way before I pull out your tongue. Kalaisa smiled wickedly, looking back at Janine. As I was saying, once I saw this little pipsqueak in the company of two wolf hags, I followed after in curiosity. Just say the truth. 
you don't have any friends and want to socialize. Anissa yawned, ignoring Kalesa's angry hiss. Anissa and Angie are here because of me. Marco scratched the back of his head. Seeing Janine's raised brow, he quickly started explaining. Angie showed me how to sew. Then I sort of got lost in this maze and she led me here. It's Wolfhag Angie, Marco, and you shouldn't have bothered Wolfkins from other packs. Anissa said worriedly, moving closer to her brother. Oh, it's quite a right knee, yeah. Angie pressed a paw to her mouth containing the laughter and patted Marco with another. We are off duty anyway. Marco, it's been a genuine pleasure to teach you. Warlord Janine, your boy is truly a pleasant little gentleman. Should I be worried? Janine returned the smile. Wolfkins were fond of toying with cubs, and Marco was still young, but she felt freaky for a moment, and she was too pleasant for her ranks. All other wolf hags, Anissa aside, treated Marco with cold indifference, seeing no reason in him being this close to the warlord. Warring yourself before the males. Is there a limit to your false modesty, Angie? Kalaisa snapped her jaws, letting out a mocking laugh. Don't worry, Kalaisa. I do not have any aspirations of taking your place. Still holding her paw against her mouth, Angie smiled. Yeah, as if you could, um... Wait, what? Kaliza jumped to her feet, raising her fur on the back of her head. Hearing Bogdan chuckle, Kalisa whirred in place, aiming to land a kick at the back of his head. Anissa acted ahead of her, grabbing her brother and rolling to the side with him, while impatient one stopped the kick, groaning from the force behind the blow. Janine kept her cool, breathing through her nostrils and fighting against a barely contained rage. This wasn't her place to step in. Not right now, not until claws started flashing. Her reckless behavior has brought shame to her pack. There is no need to involve Igridit's pack in the mix. I can keep the situation under control. Her paw found a crate nearby, running across the steel lid with her fingers. If you dare to try to touch our soldiers ever again, I will murder you in your sleep, Kalaisa. Impatient one snapped. A peculiar offer, but I'm not swinging that way, shaman. Kalaisa tore her leg free, jumping on the crate and beckoning the shaman with a finger. Feel like stepping up to me. I feel like walking all over you, and I said icily. The wolf hag stopped, seeing everyone turning to her. Anji came forward, shielding Marco, an impatient one, with her body and cracking her knuckles in a silent threat. Ignacy pushed the complaining Elzada toward Bogdan and pointed his metallic arm at Kaloise. The steel fingers of his hand bent back, taking their places in recesses along the mechanical frame. His palm came apart, showing a dancing flame within. What's this? Kalaisa sang sweetly, smiling all the way to the ears. A little pest has forgotten his place in the pack and tries to play a hero. Shall I play the part of a monster and tear off your lighter to beat you up with it? Jan saw her body twitching, her pupils dilating in response to the release of adrenaline within her body, her paws closing and opening, and her fingers releasing the tips of her claws. Pissed, or pissed off beyond any reasonable measure, she was angry enough to maim a soldier for a situation that she herself started. Janine inhaled the air, tasting Kalaya's scent and catching in it an urge for domination. It surprised her. Wolf hags were not gentle leaders, but they were also not fools who started fights over nothing. There wasn't an honor here. Any other wolf hag would have turned the situation around, playing it as a joke and gaining camaraderie with another pack. What is wrong with her? Teach her try, and me. Ignis, he stuttered, trying to look calm, nervously sniffing the air. Never before had Janine felt as much pride for her son as she felt right now. Ignacy was hurt recently. No doubt his flesh and nerves were still healing, causing him, at the very least, a moderate itch in the area around his horrid wound. And yet here he was, standing his ground against an immensely more powerful opponent, afraid but unwilling to abandon his friends. Kaleza sniffed the air, first nervously, then with more infuriation. For a male to stand up, against a female. For someone like Kalaisa, it has to be inconceivable. Blessed with every possible gift since birth, not unlike Janine, she felt infuriated at the mere thought of meeting opposition from those she deemed less. In a few years, she might grow and pipe down a bit, but right now this annoyed teen, dangerous for her kin. Janine knew why Bogdan, Anissa, and impatient one stood by Agnesi, 
but she was surprised to see Angie refusing to back down. Angie wasn't of the pack, and like Kalaisa, she too had every reason to be infuriated at the males who dared to stay up against the righteous domination. Yet, here she stood, releasing a scent of comfort and assurance toward Janine's pack. She's going to jump. Janine saw the fear in Kalaisa's eyes and guessed the reason for it. Never had the girl had a pack turn on her. She was strong enough to break free, even should they attack her first. But now, upon sensing fear, there was only one path for someone as immature as she. Kalisa has to prove herself. She thinks that she has to quench her fear in the blood of her opposition. Janine knew this feeling and acted first, fully intent on not allowing Kalisa the satisfaction of saving her pride. Fear, like all emotions, has its uses, after all. The screeching sound of metal made everyone freeze in place. Almost lazily, Janine had torn away a crate's lid and cast it like a projectile at Kaloisa's. At the last moment, the arrogant woman noticed the incoming projectile and ducked, ending up with the top of her hair being bisected when the piece of metal got buried into the wall. Etch, I wanted to have a haircut anyway, thanks, Granny. Kaloisa gulped nervously, tearing her hair free from the metal. Janine heard thankful notes in her voice, for once not filled with venom. She wasn't too crazy after all, but she also had no idea how to defuse the situation without causing a bloody brawl with members of two packs and starting a blood feud between the packs. And now since a warlord stepped in, she felt relaxed submitting to the superior and weaseling out of a problem. Young, too young to become a wolf hag. She can't even control her urges, much less be fit to lead a pack and egret. In her typical fashion, did jack and shit to direct Kali's on the right path. Johnny understood the call to cause pain and suffering at the slightest offense. The shamans had beat this into her, forcing the young cub to crash with the others back in the pits. But she learned, through the blood of a person dear to her, that a wolf can had to control this desire, mastering it and wielding rage like a weapon rather than letting it wield you. And she refused to see anyone here make the same mistake as she did. Try it again, and I'll make you shorter on the head, Janine promised Kaloisa. The wolf hag snarled, turning to leave, and Janine stomped on the ground. Sit. You came here to learn, so sit and learn. Everyone, sit. She added a growl to the last word, and everyone returned to their places, with Anji seating Marco on her knees, not exposing his back to Kaloisa. Kaloisa herself hesitated for a moment, and Janine locked eyes with her. She half wanted to dominate the woman, to break an arm or leg, and to leave really deep bite marks upon this insufferable neck. And Kalaisa saw it. She saw the hate and rage born in Janine's eyes, and her nose sensed the drool coming from the warlord's lips. Clenching her paws, Kalaisa slammed her butt on the crate, folding her arms and looking stubbornly at Janine. Anissa sat right next to the idiot behind Ignacy, and impatient one flanked Kalaisa from the other side. I get the general picture. Janine decided against dominating Kalisa. Perhaps a more cautious approach would be better to fix her behavior. Be silent, everyone. I had plans to educate only Marco, but I may as well extend the same courtesy to all of you. Janine coughed, taking up a small terminal in her paw and turning it on, calling her notes about how stead. It felt nice to spend a night without worrying about being attacked or needing to walk around a perimeter and check up on the guards. Instead, she had warm tea and a dry meal for dinner, reading up on a city that the Blessed Mother and the Wolf Tribe have helped to build. Our destination is Haustad, a city in the core lands, Janine snorted, seeing confusion in Bogdan's and Kaloisa's eyes. How could you, Marco, would you do us the honors and explain the terms? Chapter 10. Ashbringer's Wrath. Yes, teacher. Anji lifted the happy Marco, allowing him to stand on her shoulder while looking at the other Wolfkins. The Reclamation Army comprises three major regions. Inner lands, where the capital of the glorious dynast is located. Janine wanted to groan, seeing impatient one taking notes. How? How is she not knowing this? Once this place was a gigantic armory, containing an impressive arsenal from the old world. When the dynast found it, he made it his capital, bringing the weak and downtrodden from all around to the safety of its mighty bastions. At first, clouds of smoke covered the place while the settlers worked non-stop, building the foundation of our glorious state. 
But after a few decades, and with the help of Eterna, we have discovered how to improve our industry in such a way as to not ravage the surroundings. Today, the inner lands are a sanctuary, a place of flowers and trees, with gentle rains pouring from the skies and blue rivers lazily carrying civilians' boats. Water. Yak. Anissa shook her body, voicing everyone's opinion on the annoying wet substance. Even Kaliza nodded in solidarity. The wolf tribe could swim in quicksand and endure toxic fumes and radiation, but on some almost instinctual level, they despised wetting their fur. Only Angie looked unbothered by the revelation. Janine tapped on a crate, returning everyone's attention. There's also an arena. Marco spoke quickly, afraid to lose the audience. A place where the Dynast Champions outsider, Blessed Mother, and Devour match each other in the trial of strength. Next come the core lands. These are the lands where most of the population lives, lands cleared of all dangers, and where greenery has returned to the land. And ah, uh, the place is really cool, Janine helped him. Where a normal person could get a sunstroke in our villages, there is little to no danger of such a thing in the core lands. I recommend warm clothes, everyone. Yes, I already... I mean, Marco took a breath. His Excellency de Vera rules the core lands. Then there are the outer lands. This term is used to describe recently conquered regions and places where terraforming back to habitable conditions is yet to be started. So, like, we are in the outer lands, right? Kaleza asked. If Devourer rules the core lands, does it mean that the Blessed Mother rules these lands? Oh. Look, everyone, she is learning. Angie beamed, showing a tongue to the growling Kaloisa. Now, don't wrinkle your snout, dear. When you're not being an asshole, you look adorable. Bootlicker Kaleza cursed. Core Angie retorted. You're correct, Sister Kaleza. Marco nodded, trying to look calm in the wake of two women's aggression. We are in the Outer Lands. However, the Blessed Mother declined the right to rule this region, instead giving it to the provincial government, a gathering of mayors from the largest settlements around here. They vote on the various policies in the region, such as tax decreases and relocation of populations from dangerous areas. Wait a second. Elzada stopped throwing looks at Ignacy and scratched behind his ear. Does it mean that only normies get to say what will change in the region? What about us? Yeah, no fair. Ictasy nodded. We stand outside of the normal government structure and live by our own rules. Impatient one stated, looking at them, our rights to call our elderly, mercy kill our infirm cubs, and use physical violence against each other. Normies may not take part in any of this. They're trying to nurse any of their cubs to health and can potentially live long enough for their hearts to stop on their own. Barbarians. It is cruel to let a broken cub live and suffer in this world. Angie shook her head in disbelief. Yes, just let the poor soul be reborn and live happily in a healthy body. Bogged in support. I am not sure. In our day and age, prosthetics can do miracles, Ignacy said, showing his metal arm. Just look at it. Yes, yes, we are very impressed with your new limb, brother. Anissa hugged him, leaving a kiss on his forehead. But some of us help mothers during a birth. Trust me, when should you see a little body gasping and fighting for air, yet unable to live simply because tiny, underdeveloped lungs are incapable of dealing with oxygen? You will do what is right, she whispered, falling silent. Thank you, Marco. I will take it from here. Janine nodded to her son, sitting herself on a crate. Now about Housestead, Housestead City, or simply Housestead, as the locals first called it, was founded 90 years ago by His Excellency Devourer. Back then, the place was a hub for slavers and flesh traders who were growing people in cages to trade with the malformed and the blood court for resources and favors. After a month of preparation and with the help of the rebels led by the Oakster family, in a single night, Devourer put an end to it, staging riots all over the place and ending the lives of the ones running this city. After this, he started the long and grueling process of remaking Housestead into a She stopped for a second, looking at the Wolfkins before her. Times were harsh back then. The state needed armor and weapons, and it needed them right now. Devourer's rule hardly looked any different from that of a common tyrant across the wastes. It was an improvement, mind you, but a very minuscule one. Smog has filled the streets, produced by countless factories. 
A lack of safety measures saw dozens of children being sacrificed to the machine cogs, squashed or sliced by the moving gears. People were losing fingers. Illnesses ran rampant. Janine closed her eyes, remembering that time. The time that she wasn't proud of, but one that has happened nonetheless. A sea of pale faces toiling for a loaf of bread, producing weapons to force even more people into this hell. A few religious services provided but a moderate sucker, and the wailings of mothers who lost their children were filling the streets. It all changed after an event known as a coup. Janine smiled, seeing the perked up ears. No, none betrayed the dynast, not in spirit. The Blessed Mother came to Devourer, who was already big then, and admitted her fears about the state becoming just as foolish as the empires of old, and he agreed. Together, they persuaded Outsider to join them, and then convinced the dynast to stop the unending expansion, forging peace with the Oathtakers and Eterna. With new technologies arriving via trade with Eterna, Hustad became a thriving hub of prosperity, and vast fields around the city were turned into enormous farmlands capable of supporting the state with an abundance of meat and vegetables. Tilingo has founded the headquarters of his company here, and now they are working on how to mass-produce cheap and affordable prosthetics for all. Still smiling, the warlords stood up. The age of warlords and tyrants is officially over in the Reclamation Army. Sure, some tribes like ours are allowed to live by their own traditions, which gives us a right to end the lives of their kin, but even we would be hanged if we dared to harm a normie. More and more tribes are giving up their traditions or changing them, like the Orais did, in turning to accept the state's law. The time of revitalization has come back at last, and we can see the fruits of our labors. According to the recent population census, the number of people living in Housestead is currently 563,800. Their reaction fully fulfilled all her expectations about the shock they felt at the moment. I'm... I mean, how could it be, Warlord? Bogdan licked his lips. Half a million people. Impatient One's words were barely audible. This is, how are they managing the education? How are they feeding them? You are joking, right, Granny? Janine allowed Kaleasa's familiarity to slip this time. The girl had an actual curiosity burning in her amber eyes, one that had nothing to do with unhinged aggression. There is no way this many people could live in one place. It's like a hive, a hive made of people. Anissa exclaimed, fidgeting with her nose and looking blindly before herself. She blinked twice and looked sharply at Janine. How spread out is that place? Housestead is the seventh largest city in our nation. This information caused the Wolfkins to look at each other nervously. Janine felt their uncertainty. The information that she had learned from the news had shocked her far better than any artillery barrage could. Yeah, she technically visited Haustad twice, once back when the three armies hadn't yet existed. Not the original city itself. No, but the modern Haustad was a ginormous place, and Janine was involved in fighting in a quarter that now serves as the city's northwest district. Ravager lent Terrific and her pack to the twins during a mission to remove some slavers, and they swiftly cut through the opposition, freeing people from the meat cages. The twins were the ones who were leading the joining forces of both Wolfkins, and it was the twins who prevented Janine from delivering the ultimate punishment to the captured guards. The warlord remembered that place of horror. A meat market, as they called it. Only instead of animals, the bastards served humans here. Hands and legs hanged on hook chains in the stalls, flesh ready to be sold to the cannibals. Slaves? No, she corrected herself. People were standing still in cages so tight that they could barely breathe. A smell of blood and shit was rising all over the place, mixed with the horror that the slavers felt at the twins' casual passing. They tried everything from robots to gunfire to energy beams. Two titanic white forms easily weaved around all incoming shots. A hit of a gigantic claymore was sending bullet after bullet back at the shooters, while arrows the size of a wolfkin were spearing the opposition, not once harming the slaves. Janine had no idea how the twins could be so serene, how they could kill only the opposition while sparing the ones who surrendered. She herself tore off a skin from the slaver's torso upon seeing humans on his stall. Overfed to the point of becoming balloons, their eyes gateways to sheer lands of madness. 
Janine showed no mercy on this day, exceeding in cruelty even her warlord, leaving pools of blood in her wake and drowning herself in the bleeding, pleading screams of the slavers. Only the twins made her stop the massacre. The male himself hugged her, calming her beating heart with his words and telling Janine that she was better than this. It felt weird speaking with the twins and feeling their paws on your body, where Ravager instilled some sense of divine reverence and promised retribution with her mere presence. Her words, no matter how unhinged, carried a weight of innate charisma, yet she felt like a rising star in the making. The twins, in comparison, felt like someone complete, as someone who has reached enlightenment and now wants to help you reach the same heights. Instead of reverence, they brought a promise of calmness and stability, and Terrific once said that she was freaked out by them because of this, because of what their existence implied. In her moment of weakness, Terrific admitted to Janine that she was worried that she too might change because of the twins. It was a small wonder that Ravager first thought the twins were her parents during their first meeting. Uh, Janine had the same thought too, and she knew that they were not blood-related at all. In hindsight, the twins could not bother. Most prisoners were set ablaze by the dynast, the liberated slaves formed a new core of the population, and Housed had started healing the scars dealt by unhinged cruelty. The next time Janine visited an area near Haustad, it was to put an end to the attempted rebellion, leading to Devour and Ravager teaming up to convince the dynast about the need to build a better future. Janine saved a recording of Devourer's speech to the dynast, hiding it on an old tape among her belongings. It was a silly thing, but Devourer's words touched something in her soul. What is the point of replacing one tyrant with another? You told us that we are fighting to build a better future for all. It is time to own this promise and stop building rather than conquering. We owe better to our people. The people voted for building wide rather than tall. Janine fought back the memories of the past days. Has this spreads for many kilometers with only a few sky pillars, sorry, skyscrapers in the city. Several rivers spread the city into districts with giant bridges connecting them. Ustad is a massive, sprawling trading hub with thousands of immigrants coming past it, hoping to find a job in the core lands. And with countless caravans arriving from all over the shit, Anissa cursed. It will make it a pain in the ass to defend Bogdan voiced everyone's fears. Do not worry yourself with it. Janine nodded to him. The last time anyone dared to attack the city was over 60 years ago. The provincial army, the standing defensive force of the core lands is no joke. What about criminals, thugs, and slaves? How dangerous is it for cubs of the Ice Fang Order and the youngest members of our packs to walk around the streets at all hours of the day and night? Angie asked, patting Marco on the head automatically. None that I know of. Janine raised her paw, stopping the following questions. Halstead is a big place. Undoubtedly, some thugs do exist, but the police are doing a fine job of putting them down. The Assassin Guild has been disbanded, yet many of its former members joined the Investigation Bureau and were involved in rooting out the remaining slavers after the reclamation. It is reasonably safe for our kin to walk in both day and night, but may the spirits help you if I will need to drag you out of any problems with the police. Janine picked up a piece of broken metal from the ground and showed it to the wolfkins before crumbling it into a ball. Her voice changed to one of cold anger. Understand this, we are not on vacation. We will not live in the core lands. We came to resupply and regroup. Simple as that, some fooling around will be permitted, but try to stretch the boundaries of allowed in your hide is mine. Calming herself, Janine kept telling them about the Oakster family and how they revolutionized farming in the area about universities, and about the traditions and habits of the locals. She spoke with them for hours before finally turning off the terminal and ordering the Wolfkins to leave and eat their fill, with Anissa leaving for her operation to replace the missing eye. Janine came to a door and waited for her pupils to leave. The moment Kalesa passed by, Janine grabbed the fool by the wrist, showering her against a nearby wall. You have a talent, Janine told her, closing the door after everyone. To turn everyone against yourself in such a brief span of time is truly something. The hell do you care, Gran? Kaliza fell silent, feeling Janine's claw on her neck. This time the warlord felt no need to hold back her speed, giving the woman a taste of the annoyance that she caused in her. 
I'm struggling not to cut you open from neck to belly, Janine admitted honestly. Kalawaisa, you are alone. Janine removed her claw. Surely you saw it. Males might be beneath females, but your behavior has turned potential friends into foes. What is my deal? Kalawaisa laughed hysterically. Well, I guess it all started when my bitch of a mother and my scumbag of a father both died up on me and left me in the care of my newborn siblings. Kalesa spat into Janine's face, leaning against the wall. Yes, you overgrown bitch, I am a motherless cur. The shamans always gave me shit, pointing out how blessed I am with my power and making me train and dominate all the time, never giving me an iota of free time in the pits. And aside from that, I had to maintain my tent, trying to keep my brother and sister from being eaten by insectoids. Even when my arms or legs were shattered, I still had to look for food and milk, feeding my useless mowing siblings, who were always hungry, all without a single bitch so much as to come and check upon me. Much less help. No shaman, no warrior, no male, no one ever helped. Work, train, suffer. Feed your sister and brother. Work, suffer. Fuck it all. Kalalisa breathed hardly, kicking a nearby crate. Janine ignored the object as it flew past her, crashing against the wall. Had this behavior happened before the pack, she would have had no choice but to break Kaloisa for the disrespect. But alone, she had a lot more leeway in how to deal with this troubling youth. And then, after all the praise the shamans were giving me for my cruelty in the pets, I was given to Warlord the Great, the weakest warlord of them all. And you know why? Because my useless brother and sister of poor stock in the family counts as a pack, as the shaman said. Kaloisa slammed her fists against the wall, leaving two prints of her knuckles on it. What was the point of all the training that left my arms and legs shattered? What was the point of enduring the cracked spine if they were going to just toss me like a bone to someone as weak as I greet? I was just a cub. Damn it. How could I raise them to be better? I went to sleep hungry just to feed them. I deserved to be in the Alpha's pack. I bled for it. I suffered for it. I earned it, and they all robbed me of it. My dream. Because of them all, I am in the gutter. She stopped, painted hard, and ran a paw over her snout. Basically, I would let no one else be happy because I'm not happy. Fuck unity, fuck pack, and fuck family. Spite and wailing are far more pleasant to my ear. My shitty family ruined my future. Now is my turn. Let's see if they can tough it out. I said, but will this make you happy? A. Hey, whiny brat. Janine smiled, stepping back. Kalaisa was fast. She faked a shocked look in her eyes, allowing her shoulder to sink as if from being struck. Only Janine saw through this. She saw the movement of muscles beneath her skin, and when the strike with the right paw came, Janine was ahead of it, taking the incoming fist onto her paw and stopping the strike dead. Her wound had long since healed, and now Janine felt as great as she ever felt. She held the struggling woman's paw for a few seconds before releasing Kaloisa without breaking her fingers for her insolence. You should try to fight for fun, Janine offered her, spreading her arms. Come at me however you want. I'll treat you like a sister during training and we'll get to know each other better. She saw something in the girl's eyes and continued. We all have our own demons from the past. It sucks, but you can't change it. You can only move out of it and grow up, standing on your own two feet rather than allowing your frustrations to puppet you like a doll. I, too, am a motherless cub. I do not promise to be gentle or kind, but if you just let me, I can help you become a person you will be proud of. A happy person. Isn't that what you want? To live up a little? Or so, Kalaisa frowned. You don't sound as if you want to dominate me. Should I? The last time I put you down was to save you from Ashbringer's wrath. There is no beef between you and I, Kalaisa. All I see before me is a lost cub in need of guidance. Is that so? Kalaisa furiously scratched behind her ear and retreated to the door, making slow steps and never once breaking eye contact with Janine. Maybe I was wrong. He is off the hook. As for your offer, warlord, maybe I will someday, but only when I can grind you into a powder. Saying that, she slipped out of the door leaving Janine in moderate confusion as to who Kaliza meant. As she was leaving the compartment, her nose caught a familiar scent. Ashbringer was here, and she left a calling mark. Um, following the smell, 
Janine opened a door leading to a small balcony platform surveying dining compartment number four. The crawler, for all intents and purposes, was a moving town with countless corridors serving as streets, even after several days locked within this steel coffin. Janine still occasionally left scent marks in its narrow hallways and corridors, mapping the surroundings far better than any terminal could. And right now she felt the scent of Eigreit's packs. This left Janine wondering why Ashbringer called her here of all places. The packs took some compartments as dens for themselves with scouts and wolf hags napping happily in the airways and warlords having whole rooms for themselves. Out of respect, packs prefer not to infringe upon each other's territory, feeling too stressed as it is. Ashbringer looked down at the rows of wolfkins chomping on the food. Just like Janine, Ashbringer was also a misshapen wolfkin. Her fur lay smooth instead of sticking out slightly, with ash rubbed into every strand that felt unnaturally silky to touch. Her head was slightly elongated forward, leaving the woman with smaller but longer jaws and giving her a weird impression. According to the rumors, one of the challengers who sought to take the rank from the warlord had called Ashbringer a ferret in her face. The entire pack held their breath, afraid to see what Ashbringer would do to the woman for such an insult. Yet as she lay broken and beaten, Ashbringer only laughed, flinging the woman's body on her shoulder and carrying her to the medics. Some say they even became friends later. Below Egerty's pack, a swarm of unruly wolfkins charged into the dining compartment, snarling at each other as they sought to grab the food trays from the tables and tried to plead for bigger portions from the cooks. Regret may have been the weakest warlord, the one who lost her title two times already, yet her pack was numerous. Always on the front lines, many of her soldiers had prosthetic arms or legs, some in a state of disrepair, some letting out a spark, but all covered with bright letters that marked well wishes from the members of their pack. Out of all warlords, Igreita's law was that of survival. It does not matter what you do. If you still live at the end of a fight, you have to survive. Igreit was censored by Lacerated one numerous time for ignoring the wishes of her pack about an honorable death, but she still persisted in her heresy, otherwise staying as loyal as possible. Covered in scars and recently healed wounds, the Wolfkins howled happily upon learning that today's meal was mashed potatoes and actual steaks out of Cusack's meat instead of nutrient paste, as usual in the last few days. Saw you speaking with that Kalarisa cub. Ashbringer turned to her. Stay wary of the bitch, she ain't right in her head. And who is? Janine asked confused why a warlord would spy in a wolf hag. Seems like no worse than you were. What was that boy's name again? Irrelevant, Ashbringer snapped, looking aside. I was absolved of all sin by the blessed mother herself. None of us is without sin, sister slayer Janine. So shut your trap and listen to me. You see these wolfkins, her brother and sister? Janine saw a shambling mess of a wolfkin covered in scars from head to toe. It wasn't unusual for a male to be badly injured, especially if a girl took a dislike to him and used him like a chew toy. But a long scar around the male's waist, dozens of ugly healed up wounds on his arms, and the tips of his once sharp, long ears were cut off. His legs were swollen from bruises, and some of his fur has started to come off from the stress. The male looked around like a cornered animal, with a girl bearing a lesser number of scars, standing next to him holding him by the shoulder. Upon seeing Kalawisa come through the crowd like a torpedo, the boy started shaking with his entire body, threatening to drop his food on the floor. She did it, Ashbringer stated flatly. I asked around. People told me they were pretty close. Until one day, Kalaiza snapped and started tormenting them out of the blue. And when another girl tried to dominate one of them, she skinned her face and would have eaten her alive if not for Igreit. Freak. Why maim if you are going for the kill? Everyone is not without sin. Like you said, Janine frowned seeing how Kalaiza showered her sister out of the way with a shoulder and threw her brother away with enough force to send him crashing against a table. The wolf hag sat dining laughing mockingly, and ordering her brother to eat from the floor. Your greet just needs to beat some sense into her. You are just as soft as our sister. Kalaisa is a motherless cur and must be treated like one. Ashbringer shook her head. I know that Anji is keeping an eye on your youngest. For our sake, I hope she can keep Kalaisa from creating a body. Otherwise, I'll add another one. 
Janine froze in anger, understanding just who that bitch meant by off the hook. It was no miracle that she followed Marco into the room, daring to bare fangs at my family. Janine breathed out, restraining her desire to leap at Kaleisa and wrenching her head clear off for daring, just for daring to think about harming Marco. The shamans and her soldiers might grumble at her for killing someone for a male's sake, and Alpha might see her as weak, but she could live with it. What she could not live with was seeing her boy. And how different is this boy, she asked herself. They all, Kalaisa included, are kin in one way or another. Seeing the trembling boy trying to crawl away from Kalaisa, seeing his sister trying to help him has filled Janine's heart with rage. Marco had her, Angie, even Ashbringer. Whom does this boy have to support him? Who allowed you to eat at a table, eh? Kalaisa stood above her brother, kicking him in the side. He mumbled something, and Kalaisa's smile widened. I can't hear your whining. Look at me. The boy froze, and the wolf hag kicked him again, this time with her claws. He rolled across the floor, whining and leaving a blood trail in his wake as he tried to curl into a ball. The female wolfkin tried to stand up between the two, and Kalaisa grabbed her sister by the throat, sending her flying away with a casual flick of her. I said, look at me. Janine did some pure evil things in the past, this much she admitted to herself. Like all females, she dominated males in pits, often breaking their fingers or leaving them starving. This part of her life she could never change. Neither Janine could change the traditions. She could only mitigate them somewhat by providing slightly better conditions for the males in her pack, preventing their deaths at the female's claws at the very least. Sure, some of her warriors grumbled, but none dared to challenge her. And truth be told, for years she was no better than Kaloisa. Just because Janine was weaker doesn't change the fact that males in her pack were covered in thick scar tissue for years, bearing the scars of her wrath for underperforming in the field. She could not change the damage already done, but she could do something now too. Seeing the wolfkin look up and wet himself at the sight of Kaloisa's face drove Janine into a cold rage. No more. She jumped from the platform, sending tremors across the room and making Kaleza eye her warily. Janine stepped into the sea of wolfkins, sighing slightly. Her pack wasn't strong in numbers. Starting a blood feud was out of the question, but a lesson was in Kalaisa, you and me. Before Janine could speak, a voice spoke from the balcony. Ashbringer jumped off the platform, landing far more gracefully than Janine ever could. Her soft touch with the metal floor has failed to cause any tremor. The warlord never bent her knees, simply rocketing her neck as she walked toward Kaliza. To the wolf hag's honor, she never faltered. She stepped toward Ashbringer, lowering herself on all fours and allowing her fingers to bite into the metal. Muscles bulged upon her body, stretching the fur to the point of seeing the pale skin beneath. And with a single, ear-piercing howl, Kaliza propelled herself forward, leaving four holes in the metal floor. Faster than a bullet, the wolf hag appeared before Ashbringer. Her paws are about to come together to form a thrust aimed at the midsection of the warlord's neck. Ashbringer made a quick step forward and bowed, slamming her head with all her might against Kaloisa's forehead. Janine smirked, seeing splashes of blood covering the walls as the wolf hag got planted face down, her legs thrown up, and her own jaw shattering the metal floor with enough force to crack it. The fallen body caused a tremor, which caused tables, cooks, food trays, and even some wolfkins to lose their footing. The warlord straightened herself and touched her forehead. Pieces of ash mixed with crimson blood danced around her. With a snap of her fingers, Ashbringer threw Kalisa's blood off her forehead and waited until the glasses in the room stopped ringing. I look at you and don't see a sister or a comrade, Kalisa, Ashbringer finally said in a melodic voice to the groaning wolf hag. Your reckless dominating behavior might cost your comrades their lives in a battle. The wolf hag's skull became swollen. Pieces of exoskeleton, a subdermal armor that grew beneath the skin of the strongest wolfkins, pierced the skin coming out along with a trickle of blood and showing a gleaming piece of skull beneath. Blood was flowing from both nostrils of the downed woman. In the lives of those whom they could have saved, Janine added, coming forward. She put a paw on Ashburner's shoulder ready to drag her away if the woman tried to kill the downed opponent, male or female. Each soldier in our pack is a potential shield for a civilian, 
and you deny them this by ruining your soldiers. Ashbringer stomped on Kaleisa, bulging the groaning woman further into the floor. Kaleisa screamed from pain, but the warlord kept on going, pushing her foot down harder and harder until Kaleisa's left shoulder blade cracked under immense strain and the woman let out a whine of pain, along with a fresh surge of blood from her mouth. You spat on our duty, Kalaisa, all for the sake of your petty enjoyment, Janine mercilessly continued, pointing at the Agreed's pack who stood aside silently. Usually, members of the packs had enough sense to stay away from the duels between a warlord and a challenger, but even so, at least some pack members were supposed to try and preserve lives. Egret's pack simply glared at Kalaisa, uncaring. And look around. You cared for none, and none comes to your aid in return. So, what knew? No one helped before either, Kalaisa gasped. You are still young, sister. Ashringer has lifted Kalaisa by her head, ignoring the woman's hastened breathing caused by sparks of pain from the broken edges of her skull shifting because of pressure. For now you are a liability, you are unworthy of your rank. Change it. The lesson is over. If you make me repeat this lesson, it will be your last time potential be damned. Ashbringer threw Kaleisa on the ground and turned around, leaving without saying a word. Janine decided to stay behind, looking at the thrashing woman who tried to stand up. What? Kaleisa licked her lips, standing up on her wobbly legs. What am I doing wrong? Strength is revered, and I always lived by this. You are brutish, not strong, Kaleisa. Janine said, there is more than one type of strength needed to be a wolf hag. You are strong physically, but you do not inspire loyalty, and your mind is fixated on self-pitying, preventing you from shining. Rather than indulging in your impulses, control them, hone your bloodthirst, and turn it inward, using its energy to make your pack better, stronger, faster, and more united than ever before. A single soldier is but a puzzle piece on the battlefield, a cog in a machine, if you will. Work with others to exceed, rather than putting them down. I don't get it. Kalaisa sniffed the blood, struggling to focus on Janine. Come to me later, and I will teach you what I can. For now, heal and apologize for your behavior. Janine walked toward the broken wolfkin, ignoring the sister who tried to stand in front of him. Seeing Janine, the boy simply closed his eyes and bared his neck. Maybe she should have gone to impatient one. The boy was broken. It was plain as day. Letting him live could be considered cruelty. Kalaisa's treatment would kill him one day. A quick death and a fresh start in a new body or a new life in the great beyond might be just what he needs. But Janine refused to make this choice, giving the tormented boy a moment of calm by giving an order to the pack to treat his wounds and drag Kalaisa to the medics.